Hey everybody, how are you guys doing today? I'm so glad to come back here and for some reason today I feel this energy and I just want to talk about change, man. I posted something earlier today and this is what I said. If you forget about everything, just remember this one thing that sometime you might not get to see the change you want unless you change. Insanity is doing the same thing while expecting a different result. You cannot see a different result if you keep doing the same thing. I was kind of like thinking about Africa and the things that we always talk about and we're struggling with. And you guys know that it's it's a lot of them. We can talk about leadership, about corruption, economic dependence, tribalism. We can talk about all those issues. There's so many things that we're struggling with. And maybe you might be tired hearing all these issues all the time, but you know, we have to talk about them. We have to address them, you know what I'm saying? Because there are a lot of people who do not know what Africa is going through. Who wants to cover the issues that Africa is facing. And as a Swahili Nation One Africa, our job is to address them, brutally be honest with ourselves in order to solve the problem. You cannot solve the issue if you don't know the source and what the problem is. The change that we expect to happen in our country, in our government, societies and communities and our companies, whatever the change that you want, even in your life when you go to personal level, whatever the change you want to see, you have to know that you have to change. This is something that we act towards. If you want to see something change, then you have to change. Because sometimes that the thing that you wanted to change is not an issue, but the issue is how you see it. And if you don't change your perspective, then you're, you're going to keep seeing it negative way. Right? That's how you will see it. So sometimes in order to change the situation and the negativity around you is by you becoming positive. If you become positive, you will see it positive. Even if there's a negative things, but you will always, your mind will always direct you, will always elaborate things, will always lead you back to the positiveness, you know what I'm saying? Because that's where you are at the moment. And the change that we want to see in Africa, it can only happen if we do change. So instead of sitting down here and talking about change, I will go out and actually be the change that Africa needs. Hashtag proud African, right? It's very easy for people to complain, to give up, right? Because you don't have to put on effort. It's very easy to lose hope. It's very easy to do that, you know what I'm saying? Because you don't want to care. If you care much, you're going to get hurt. You don't want to love because if you love much, you might be betrayed, you know what I'm saying? So it's better to be on the other side of negativity. It's very easy to be in the side of negativity than positivity because if you want to be in the side of positiveness, then you have to put on effort. And a lot of people these days, they don't want to pull it. You know, so that's why they end up giving up. But this is a message for you that you are the only one who can change situation. You can change it. I don't want to put God in this because I believe that God has already given us ability and mind to think, to elaborate and to do things. He already given us that. We already have permission. As long as you're alive, that means you still have a job to do, right? The day I die, that means I'm done. I'm done. I'm finished. Right? My mission is done. But as long as I'm alive, it's because I still have something to do. So you already have that permission. But how do you how do you go out and and and, and work on that? How do you use the opportunity? Because life is an opportunity that God has given you and me. How do you take advantage of that opportunity to actually bring about change? How do you do that? And that's the question that I want you guys to think about today. And if you can, let me know in the comment section. And when I'm talking about change, I'm talking about there's a lot of things you don't like it, right? Well, you can change it. As long as you see the problem, you have a solution. Things that you don't like it, I mean, you cannot love anything, everything, you cannot like everything, but there are things that can be changed. And if there's something you don't like, you cannot keep complaining because it's insane, right? Doing the same thing and expecting different results is insanity. So you need to change. And how can you bring about change, right? To whatever situation that you see. So you can take perspective of your country, right? Things that you're struggling with. I love this one quote I saw on Twitter the other day and I just had to repeat it because it was really well written. And she wrote this on her bio. She wrote, love for your country doesn't mean love for the president or for the leader. Ask yourself how you can contribute to your country. And it reminds me what, you know, love for your people or for Africa, it doesn't mean that you have to love leader or whatever that disappoints you because a lot of time we've been hiding under the shadow of you know what this government is not doing anything you know what there's so much corruption no matter what we do we're not going to be able to change well love for your country doesn't mean that you have to love that leader who is screwing things up every single day 
you know, ask yourself, how can you contribute? And it, it's kind of like I'm coming from that point of view that how can you take advantage of the opportunity, the life you have to bring about change? Because as long as you're alive, as long as you see there's the issues, that means you have a solution. And you just need to figure out how can you figure out the solution. And our job here in Southern Nation One Africa it's actually to stir up the fire, right? So you might say that you guys are talking too much of this and that, but our job is to remind, is to remind each other, is to um, uh, to remind that, you know what, we can actually bring about change. You know, we might not bring the solution sometimes because we don't have solution to every issue that is going on, right? But you guys, you have it because you guys are going through, we are going through. And when we come together as one Africa, think about it, talk about it. I'm telling you, there's high chance and I'm confident 100% that we're going to bring about you. And that's why I want to reach university students, want to reach to all the students who will actually bring change to the next generation as soon as possible. So let me know guys in the comment section, what you're thinking, what's your idea, what's your thoughts. And I think this will be an amazing time for you guys to motivate me as well and to inspire me. So I'll be checking on your comments and maybe we'll come up with something. I appreciate guys, I love you. Be the change Africa needs, proud of you. I love you. Yo, what's up, everybody? It's good to see everybody here today joining us for the amazing show. Man, it's good to see everybody right here. Guys, I'm just intruding, actually. This is not my show. This is um, His Excellence Ezra show, and he's going to be here in a, in a, in a second. But, um, you know, I'm really glad to be here uh, and to see what's going to happen here today. Man, there's a lot of things that will happen here today, I believe, and His Excellence will let you guys know everything that is going to be going down here today. But one thing you can do right now, before we start, uh, is that you can copy this link and share with somebody. It's very important that this conversation, uh, not only one person or not only two people, but as many people as we can. We invite as many people as we can so that we may have this discussion. We're going to have, uh, I believe we're going to have different people. We've been talking about this show throughout the week that we're going to be having uh, uh, people from Eritrea, uh, Somalia, Ethiopia, and Djibouti. And to just have this conversation because it's really, really, really important uh, to have this conversation uh, about the Horn uh, relations. And I believe later on you guys will have an opportunity to come and to actually experience uh, everything that is going on. So, guys, I appreciate you guys for stopping by here. Um, you know, as I said, I'm just going to uh, bring in His Excellence Ezra uh, because this is his show, guys. It's, it's Friday. It's Ezra show. It's not mine, but um, make sure that you invite as many people as you can. We have uh, amazing guests will be here today to share with us. And yeah, it's going to be a really nice conversation. Um, I believe His Excellence Ezra, you are ready. So do me a favor, guys. Copy this link and share with somebody. It's very important for you to do that because I don't want you guys to miss this conversation today. All right. You guys have no idea what is coming, but, you know, some amazing stuff that coming here today. And the best thing you can do is copy this link and share with somebody. It's very, 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 very important. Oh yeah. <laughs> and let me know, let us know in the comment section, guys, where are you guys watching from? Okay. <laughs> the, man of, the man of the hour is right here. <laughs> yeah, His Excellency. <laughs> Good to be here. <laughs> Welcome to our viewers, and uh, I'm really happy to be here tonight, and uh, it's really great uh, seeing everybody. Uh, it's been a good week. It's been a productive week. Um, yeah, I must say uh, tonight is a, you know, it's a milestone. It's a big show. Um, you know, tonight mm -hmm. is, it's not just one country. It's like, it's like the horn, you know, um, the horn, mm -hmm. um, 
if I may just say something yeah. on the horn, the horn represents strength. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, as we talk about the horn, <laughs> another thing about the horn mm -hmm. uh, is that uh, it also represents a kingdom or power. So oh, yeah. tonight it's a big show um, talking about the horn of Africa and um, the developing stories in that part of our continent. Um, it will really be great mm -hmm. to be here. And I think everybody must just share the link, share with your friends, share with your um uh, colleagues, share, family, share, share, whoever, share, just share, share, share family, share, just share, keep, share, keep sharing, share, you know? Share, 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 share. Yeah, everything is a share, you know? Be, 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 before, before they, yeah. you know, they can do anything, they must just like and go share. Exactly. Be, before, before yeah. any comment, yeah. comment, uh, before any comment, please just go and like, like and share the stream, like please. And share. That's yeah, what then you we can do. go to the comments, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. You just like and share. That's the only thing you gotta do. Just like mm -hmm. and share. It's simple as exactly. that. Please do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> and we wait, we wait, we wait. Um, oh, okay, okay. I can see that a lot of people are also still coming in. Uh, welcome, family. If you've just mm -hmm. joined us, please, before you do anything, before you comment where you're connecting from, please like the, the, the page, uh, like the stream, and then share the link with family, friends, share on your social media platforms, and uh, let's get uh, the show rolling. Before anything, please share, like, turn on the notification, because we are going live every night, every night, 9 p.m. East African time, so you don't want to miss any show. So, But tonight is a big, big show. Uh, it's a Friday. We know some of you are relaxed, and uh, I'm also relaxed. I was just uh, prepping my coffee, hence uh, you your coffee I couldn't right just there? say, <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> I, I hope you got your water you because I'm really excited for your I'm really excited for your show tonight because I know the guests you're gonna have. Uh, you know, one of them is already here on the background right now. I know you're gonna have uh, an excellent show, and, and and that's why we just we just need as many people to come and to join. Uh, you know, this show because you guys are gonna enjoy it. Me personally, and I, I'm already enjoying it because man, in that group, in that group that we do have the home relations. Man, there's just so many, so much knowledge, man. So I've, I just, I just, I was just reading, and then I got really, really excited. We'll be having our summer here tonight. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be <laughs> Come on, somebody. a bumper show. It's gonna be crazy. It's gonna, oh man, I, I can't wait for those thought-provoking uh, uh, comments and uh, mm -hmm. insight from Wasami as always, and uh, Pai. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people who are still coming in as well. Oh, I can't wait for to hear from them. Yeah. Excellent. Exactly. I cannot wait to hear from Walsame, all the way from Somalia, our brother Pai, who has always been very interesting about that region, uh, our brother from Caribbean right there. Uh, you know, hopefully Senu, Senu will be here as well from, you know, Eritrea, right? And then uh, we have another brother, Solomon. I hope he will be here from Djibout as well. You know, I've been, I've been in touch with him. So it's going to be a crazy day. And you guys who are watching there, man, I'm telling you, I know this show might break the record. Because we have somebody just recently have done the live stream for how long? For how long was it? This guy, I it need to see. It was 12, 12 hours, hours right? 12 <laughs> hours. It was 12 hours for the first time, guys. 12 hours. 12 hours. <laughs> That's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny that... This show, this guy, I know him for 20 hours. Uh, you know, it's funny, uh, His Excellency. Uh, you're talking about 12 hours. This yeah. week, in fact, there was record-breaking shows, two shows. Um, it was Tenzin's show uh, uh, on Tuesday, mm -hmm. and we thought that was over. Hey, mm -hmm. man, Wednesday, it's on as another uh, record-breaking show with uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the prof as well. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so prof. We really <laughs> prof Ezra is the one that break the record. Exactly. 12 hours, guys. <laughs> prof, prof Ezra on Wednesday. Man, I was, hey. I was just really surprised. Was like, this is cool. I think that 20, 24 hours, our, our dream to do for 24 hours, I think it's, it's going to come to pass very soon. 12 hours, it's day. It's getting closer and closer. Eh? It's getting closer and closer, uh, His Excellency. <laughs> closer and closer. Indeed, indeed. Wow. Uh, His Excellency, um, for those who just joined us, family, please uh, subscribe, uh, like, 
uh, and share the stream. Um, we're just getting everybody started. And then you can go to the comment section. Please, uh, family, tell us where you're connecting from, um, your messages, what you want us to cover tonight when we're speaking about the, the Horn of uh, Africa, the, the, the that part of our continent. We'll be discussing different um, uh, developing stories, the elections in Somalia, so many things that are happening there in the Horn of Africa, Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia. So please, wherever you're joining from, please uh, comment. Um, anything that you want to know, drop those questions there on the comment section so that some of the panels that will be coming in here will be able to uh, uh, answer those questions and give us more insight into those uh, questions. So please, family, drop those questions in the meantime. <laughs> Indeed, indeed, indeed. I think, man, this is crazy. We already have our three our three great guests. They're already here, guys, waiting. Like, they're right here waiting. And then our brother from Djibouti, he's actually also going to come very soon. He's just finishing up his work. He's going to be here in in, 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 in a few minutes. He'll be here. So, yes, it's, it's going to be amazing. You know, he already has a link, so he'll just come and join right away. By the way, we have Big E here as well. Big E is right there. I see, I see you, Biggie One Africa. <laughs> That's I like that name, by the way, Biggie One Africa. I like that name. <laughs> I like that name. I think uh, you know. I think everybody should write that. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> <laughs> so that they know that uh, this is one African guy. Call me Mika One Africa. Eh? <laughs> That's wow. my son name right here. <laughs> Come on, look at this excitement in the room. I love this. I see Chrissy. Yeah. I see Marathon. I see Abu Yag. TG Ethiopia, Robel Habtam, he says, you guys are amazing. I appreciate your input. I'm from Ethiopia. I appreciate you. NASA King, Sunny Side Up, Macrobia. Oh, that's a good name right there. Mo Solomon. Oh, my brother. That's the guy that will be here from Djibouti. Mo Solomon oh. will be right here. Djibouti Prince. What's up, my brother? Um, Masale. Everybody here. SVH, Sam. Uh, watching the house. Man, like everybody's right here, man. This this is amazing, and we'll keep this moving forward, guys. For in the meantime, just share this link, share this link, because very soon, uh, His Excellency Ezra he will have uh, the guest here, and it's gonna be just crazy. It's a crazy day. Exactly. Wow, I can't wait as well, His Excellency. I'm excited. I'm, you know, I've got butterflies already. You know, I'm <laughs> and uh, wow, and uh, I, I see. Uh, uh, Wow, okay. Wow. I see our guests are already here. Um, we're just going to give them maybe you a minute or two. They'll be with us. And family, if you just join us, please subscribe. And do not forget, we've got two channels that we're currently running uh, the stream on. One Africa on YouTube and Swahili Nation on YouTube. And also on our Facebook page, there's the Swahili Nation. Go and watch there. If you love Facebook, go and, and, and join us on the Facebook uh, page um, and subscribe or like that page. And be part of the family. So we are live on three platforms, Facebook and YouTube at the moment. So can't wait. Please, family, go and subscribe. The Swahili Nation channel there is in your screen. And One Africa, especially One Africa, because uh, His Excellency, you have a lot of people who, mm. who are already uh, part of the Swahili Nation family. And now we want them to be part of this uh, 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 family because this is our sister uh, channel as well, One Africa. They need to also subscribe to that channel. Please, family, subscribe to mm -hmm. this channel. Let's get this channel growing and, uh, uh, and and get the growth and get more viewers on this, on the channel. Um, so please, whenever we go live, we also go live on this channel. So whenever you want to join, join us on One Africa or Swahili Nation, one of those two channels, please. But before anything, subscribe to this channel as well. Before you like and do other things, go and subscribe to this if you're already a Swahili Nation subscriber. Yeah, because <laughs> this is what we're trying to do. Like later in the future, all these live streams, We'll be doing them in one Africa channel. That's why I want to develop this this channel to just do live stream of one Africa, and then so Hill Nation Network it will be somewhere that will have a lot of stuff. They will have all the documentaries, your vlogs, some 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 different stuff. Everything like news, everything will be right there. But one Africa, we want it to develop it to be like to develop it to be like something like Zoom, you know what I'm saying, or something like you know, space or something like what, a clubhouse, like to be something like that, specifically for all these live streams. So keep subscribing, you know, keep sharing and it's going to be amazing. Man, man, you have a lot of guests here. I mean, I'm envying you. 
Come on, Ezra. I see you. I see you, my brother. <laughs> I see you, my brother. You're scaring me. Eh? Hey, no, man. You're scaring me, my brother. <laughs> I, I, I think the family have been hungry there. You know, um, there's been a, a, a lot of hunger when it comes to uh, um, the, the topics that are the developments there in the Horn of Africa. And remember, His Excellency, you had a long show um, when you were covering that part of uh, Somalia, the elections, all the, 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 uh, the, the stuff that was happening there. So a lot of people want more updates. They want to know what's happening, what's the way forward. Uh, for Somalia, for example, then, but we'll yeah. not be talking about Somalia only. Yeah. Um, Eritrea is there, Djibouti yeah. is there, Ethiopia is there. So please, family, join us. Mm. And we're going to have a, a lot of conversation regarding uh, that part of our continent and di those different countries tonight. So it's not only one country. It's it's the, the horn today. We, we specifically targeting the horn and we want to hear what's the developing stories. Um, it's strategic position as well. Uh, His Excellency, yeah. as you know, um, a lot of trade. One of the, the biggest routes for trade in the world passes through the Red Sea, which is mm. part of our uh, the Horn of Africa. So mm. most of our trade, the shipping trade, passes through the Red mm. Sea, which which is, um, I mean, passing through the, the, yeah. the seas of Eritrea, uh, Djibouti, Somalia, going to mm. Asia, going to mm. other parts of the world, even us here. I mean, for example, um, if something is, is being transferred maybe from, uh, let's say, um, Israel, going to uh, Tanzania, it's, it's going to probably pass through the mm. whole of Africa. So mm. it is a, a, a very strategic place, um, uh, the Horn of Africa. So we need to really touch base on this part of our continent. Indeed, indeed. Indeed, my brother. By the way, Ethiopia, because, um, you know, we, we, if, if you don't, you know, we don't have somebody from Ethiopia here, so we'll have the gear from Ethiopia. And Senuti, we're waiting for her. Hopefully she'll come and join representing Eritrea. So that's very important to have everybody. We have Djibouti here. We have Somalia here. And we're going to have, uh, you know, Eritrea and Ethiopia as well. So this is beautiful. My brother? Yeah, um, I can't wait as well. Uh, I think. Um, oh. oh, what's happening here? Yeah. Um, can you... Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I thought I had muted myself there <laughs> for a sec. Um, but yeah, I mean, oh, all these places, all these countries will be represented by one person. So it will really be nice to see those people and anybody from any part of the continent in, in the diaspora. You're more than welcome. Support, come and join, come and learn as well. It's, this is not just about uh, because we talk about this country, we don't talk about, no, we talk about every country. But this is the day now we want to just mm -hmm. focus more on the horn for today because there's a lot of developing development uh, developing stories there and a lot of things that are happening in that part of the co our continent so we want to cover that part and mm -hmm. we want to learn more about that part of the, the continent so it's time to also learn about mm -hmm. uh, uh, this other uh, part of the, our continent and it's also about building bridges to learn about one another and uh, learning our different cultures mm -hmm. our different ways of doing things so that's about it as well. One part of it, why we we covering this uh, this topic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hi, brother. Why, why you know why don't you open now uh, so that you know we may bring um, you know our guests, but actually they're not our guests. They are um, uh, family, <laughs> a family <laughs> member, and then dive in into the topic. I would love to just say hi to them, you know, before I let them start taking over right here. Because I know they yeah. have a lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm just going to quickly, before I let them in, and before you, you, you touch base on them, you can just do a small prayer, just to add to the prayers already. I know a lot have been uh, laid down. But uh, I'm just going to open with prayer for, for tonight, for tonight's show. And um, then we're going to get down to the business of today. Oh, yeah. Thank you, our Father. Thank you for this night. Thank you that our, as brothers and sisters, we can come and meet, we can interact, we can come and learn tonight. We ask, Father God, for your peace, for your wisdom, for your joy, for your wisdom, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. I think I'm, I'm going to start. Uh, let's just let them in, uh, His Excellency. Uh, let, let's, let's do this. Let's do this. Ah, oh. wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Let's do together at the same time. Let's do together okay. at the same time. So you you do you do while Sammy, I'll go to 
I'll go to to Biggie. All right. Okay. <laughs> One, two, three, three. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, we have two more. We have two more. I'll go to you. Two more. You you two five. Okay, I'll you go to five. Okay, I'll go for Okay, go for Muslim. I'll I'll right, do right, I'll do five. Then. <laughs> okay, you take five. Okay, okay. You you gotta count. You gotta count. Let's go. Okay, let, let we come down to 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 zero to one then. Okay, uh, from three. Take okay. it from okay. the top. Uh, three, two, three, one. two, one, one, one. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's up, Jim? <laughs> greetings, greetings. <laughs> oh, yeah, what's up, man? What's up, Jim? It's good to see you guys. Great, great energy. Great fun today. Looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We need that energy. We need that energy. You know, uh, our brother from, from uh, St. Kitts, uh, Rich, always says energy, energy, mm -hmm. energy. We need... You know, <laughs> mm, 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 mm. so we have to put my, that energy. I've, I've got to say, I've already mentioned to Michael privately that video. Um, great message, honestly. It's um, I hope that video trends, man. It needs to that message needs to go through. You know, be the change mm. you know, that you want to see in Africa. So I just want to say that. Yeah. I concur on that one. <laughs> oh my God, I see so much excitement and the energy is there. Uh, I pass my blessing. My blessing, loving for all that's participating and those that is going to participate later. I've been, I, I, it's, this is exciting because uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things going on on that horn, and I'm still making injera, but at the same time, I just want I just don't want to miss this boat to uh, to make sure about be the change, and I want to participate a little bit on that part on that front. Uh, yeah, greetings to the panelists. Um, thank you for having me. It's my second time here, and yeah, hopefully it's going to be an enjoyable discussion. Indeed, thank indeed, you. Solomon. Thank you Welcome, guys. All looking forward to this discussion. Thank you, thank you, uh, family. Um, you know what, uh, 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 His Excellency and uh, the team. Um, I think. Maybe to some people, they might have just joined us. Uh, if maybe each of you can just maybe um, uh, maybe um, introduce yourself to say, I'm this, maybe representing this company, or I'll, I'll be talking more about this country, uh, just to, to help the viewers out there to know, to differentiate who's who and stuff. I don't know if someone wants to uh, <laughs> start first. I can, yeah. I mean, I can start off if you guys want me to. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, my name is um, uh, Mo Mohammed. Um, I'm going to be representing uh, Djibouti today, but uh, I'm also Somali, so I know what's happening in Somalia too. Welcome, welcome, Mo Salomon. Good to hear. If I can go second, then uh, my name is Osama. I'm a regular at Swahili Nation. Was previously a watcher, and now hopefully, you know, I've been contributing towards the discussion. Always happy to join. Greeting to Ezra. And yeah, welcome to the panelists. Looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Awasami. I don't know if uh, uh, Pai wants to go next. Yeah, I can go next. Hi, um, I'm Pai. Uh, I'll be mostly representing uh, maybe Somaliland and Taiwan relations. I live about 15, 15 minutes away from the uh, representative office. And I'm from the Caribbean. Go welcome, ahead. welcome, Pai. And then uh, uh, Biggie, Biggie, you know, Biggie has a show and he's coming in tomorrow, 9 p.m. Diaspora talk, catch him, but uh, let him dis uh, uh, I mean, introduce himself. Welcome, Biggie. Uh, uh, my name is Biggie, as everybody knows me, but uh, it's from uh, it's a short little, If you notice, my big E is uh, the letters are big, except the E. I'm growing, I'm putting information together. I'm learning, and I uh, have my family that's, that's going to help me to do that. And one day, I'll be the president of uh, uh, the continent. <laughs> <laughs> powerful, powerful, Biggie. <laughs> wow, thank you. Thank you, uh, Biggie. Um, and, and, and you didn't say much about, uh, I know you're representing the whole continent, the whole Africa, 
Uh, but for tonight, I'm sure we'll be getting a lot of insight. Uh, I just say the country that you'll be more, well, mostly uh, representing. Basically, uh, my background is uh, Eritrean Ethiopian, so I, I take both sides. Both sides. Thank you, thank you, uh, Biggie, representing Eritrea and Ethiopia. Um, guys, uh, yo, it's been a lot. I don't know if where to start. I mean, um, should we start in Somalia? Sh where should we start? I mean... Uh, I think we should start in Somalia. <laughs> Somalia, because there's been a lot of developing stories there. Yeah. And um, I don't know if, uh, uh, um, Wasama, you want to maybe start with us and just give us some updates in terms of what's been happening there. And then yeah. uh, we'll go to the next topic and stuff. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, obviously, it's a bit of a hot, hot topic right now in Somalia, uh, especially since the outcome of the election that's taking place last Sunday. It's been a few days, uh, and it's been a, quite an eventful few days. Uh, a lot has happened. Um, you could even say at a speednik. Uh, um, so, President Formaggio was replaced with President Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, who was also previously a president before him. Uh, since then, we have seen a lot of development. Uh, the major one, if I can take off the list, is, as you, some of you guys might have heard, uh, America has approved of redeployment of American troops back in Somalia. This is a major news. Uh, the reason being is that President Trump, when he was president, he actually withdrew um, a lot of the U.S. personnel very abruptly. They left actually in a, you know, quite, a, um, you know, very haste. Uh, since then, they have been relocated in other regional um, countries, just like Djibouti and Kenya. Um, so effectively, uh, I remember reading a few articles and following American news kind of thing. And, you know, the State Department, which is sort of responsible for American foreign policies and rela international relations, they've, you know, basically sold this idea to Biden that, you know, America needs to have a presence in Somalia. Um, currently, America military uh, camp is in Djibouti. I, I, I assume uh, Brother Mo uh, from Djibouti will um, will talk about this in more detail. Uh, however, Djibouti is at the moment rather congested. There are a lot of different uh, countries who have their military presence there. I'm talking about countries such as French, uh, Japanese, Italian, uh, US, and also uh, China. So America has always felt a sense of you know um, you know there's too much I guess proximity within the Chinese uh, military situation. Uh, they've also had other complaints uh, of actually, um, because the air is being managed by the Djibouti Air Force. And I think uh, I've heard some stories of, um, they complain about, you know, how the air is being managed wasn't up to the standard of the Djibouti. Uh, and also they have not have been sharing anything with uh, China. So they've highlighted Somalia as a prime location. Um, strategically, Somalia is located in an extremely important uh, location. Um, you know, the, that sea leads to, in the north of Somalia, leads up to the, you know, the, uh, the Babur Mandap, which goes into a strait where there's a bottleneck that gets created. And, you know, that, you know, a lot of trade goes through there. Um, so, you know, America wanted to settle a base in Berbera. Berbera is a city that American actually have had long interest in it. Um, and, you know, actually back in May last year, America sent some representative, military representative to, to, to Berbera to sort of, you know, uh, scope up uh, the, the the area, which has recently been redeveloped, the UAE uh, via DP World, and you know, with the blessing of the uh, United Kingdom, who have a great interest in Somalia, especially the northern part. And one of the things America has highlighted is to say, actually, a Berbera um, uh, port, um, landing strip is actually much longer than Djibouti. I think uh, Berbera is from top of my head, I think something like four kilometers, which is longer than uh, Djibouti, which is about three kilometers. So they've highlighted quite a few sort of things that are in their favor. And I think, you know, in, in relation to that, they've had said, you know what, let's go back into Somalia again. So it's no coincidence that Africa Com, which is the United States Africa Command Center, have gone to north of Somalia, Berbera, and now this news come out that about 700 troops, I don't know the exact number to be fair, but there's a lot of uh, numbers that are going around that they were going to deploy in Somalia. And one of the reasons they're saying that they think Al-Shabaab is a bigger threat and needs to be eliminated. Uh, I've read, seen a report uh, from a Republican congressman who's watching uh, quite a lot of American news where he said um, effectively that, um, yeah, you know, Al-Shabaab is a bigger threat to the region on in Somalia. And for that reason, they want to go back to, you know, the, the question is, I mean, we, you know, the last time we've heard anything about Al-Shabaab doing anything in Kenya or anything out of Somalia is quite a long time ago, actually. Their, their, their power is diminishing. But America thinks that, you know, it's a bigger that they need to attest to. They've actually said, I'm sure there is a threat to Americans. 
common abroad. So either way, um, so that's what one of the big news. I'll go into more details about that. So I don't want to stop, stop, be stuck on this point. The other thing being, um, there's money that has been, um, illegally funneled through Somalia, which the previous administration, the Macho, have, um, confiscated at the airport. We're talking about $9.6 million, which is you know, close to a million. So what they've done is, um, you know, it wasn't declared. It was, it didn't go through the proper channel. It was money that was intended to be used for, you know, other nefarious reasons to destabilize the region. UAE quite effectively is a hostile nation towards Somalia. They want to manage us. They already confirmed and said multiple times that they, they want Somalia to be divided between the north and south. Uh, since then, that money has been sitting in the bank, confiscated, and one of the, you know, um, the, the, the prime minister that's now close ally to Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, I'm guessing he must have paid it, they've handed that money back to the UAE ambassador. So there's quite a few things that's happening. Uh, it is interesting, but I do also want to point out, um, as much as, you know, some people might not be happy with the outcome of which president has been elected, I really want to stress this point. It's still a moment pride for us Somalis to, you know, from what we've come from, to have this tr peaceful transition of power where, you know, no loss of life has happened, where, you know, the, the person that has lost is, you know, conceding the power to the new ones. And, you know, although I don't agree with the process, how these MPs have elected the, the president, which was the same case the previous four years and the year, years before that, but the actual, on the day, the way they've handled it, it was quite transparent, something that I haven't even seen in a lot of other countries where you could see there was three clear ballot boxes, which they've shown how empty it was. It's very transparent. People vote, put their votes in there, and then the results are printing out these papers and being read and being shown as evidence to people that have been sworn in to confirm what name is on that ballot and then confirm tallying it up, and there's three different rounds. So I think that itself, that process, is something that hopefully you know, that would be, uh, for a lot of Somalis, a you know, source of pride. Uh, the only thing we need to change is the political system. But other than that, I'm, I'm very happy and great that that has happened. And, and yeah, obviously, I am also concerned what this now means uh, in the geopolitical arena, especially with Ethiopia, because we all know the, U the Biden administrations are not very fan of um, um, the beer. Uh, you know, they've, they've been accused of being sort of allies to the TPLF. Uh, with now this recent uh, redeployment of the U.S. Uh, uh, military personnel, I don't know what that means for Ethiopia. Would Somalia be used as a launching pad to cause some sort of a, you know, pressure on Ethiopia? I hope not, but obviously that's something we could, you know, we need to consider and keep an eye on it. So in summary, uh, if I forgot anything, I do apologize. I will mention it later, but that's why I want to sort of conclude at the moment. Well. Um... Thank you, Wasam. I think uh, you've, you've touched base on a lot of things there. And uh, I know a lot of people will be dropping some questions. And if there's any questions, uh, anything that you want to comment on regarding uh, the developing stories in, in, in Somalia or any questions, please uh, drop uh, them on the comment section. And um, just still sticking on, on, on Somalia, um, I've got a question uh, from my side and uh, the panel as well. If you guys have uh, any question regarding what um, Wasam has just touched base on, please uh, uh, feel free to ask as well. Uh, but from my side, oh, yeah, uh, I've got, um, yeah, yeah, I've got something. I'm gonna ask the uh, um, basically semi question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, please, it's like please. a rhetorical. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, yeah. you can go ahead. So, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'll, I'll ask after you. Yeah. Um. Uh, what's some of Somali, right? If I may ask. I'm not in Kurdish Somali. No. Okay, you're not Somali then. Okay. Um. Yeah. So I am you, Somali. You know, I'm not in Somali right now. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I um, thought you asked me if I was in Somali or not, but I am Somali. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then me, me as well. So I was gonna say. Um. Again, if you're looking at this from a different, like, if you like, for example, for myself, I'm gonna take myself. Usually, when I assess things, I take myself out of the the usual way of thinking, and I think of it from a objective point of view. Uh, instead of subjective, because subjective is usually your own opinions and how you formulate ideas. So I usually take myself out of that box and look at it from how everybody else would see it. So this is how I see the Americans playing it down. First of all, uh, we know that the, the new president of uh, Somalia is also a Saudi and an American puppet, in a way, because we can see it. And we can see from his past actions as well as the uh, former president of Somalia. And we can see that, again, because... Within 24 hours of him being stationed as the uh, president, he called upon the Americans to, or uh, the American troops back to America um, after such a long time to take up action against Al Shabaab. 
Um, we can also see that the, the UK and the Americans also have a massive interest in what is now known as Somaliland. They have a massive interest in it because they've seen the competition that's going on in Djibouti with the Chinese and the Russian forces stopping the Americans doing what they want because now they're facing each other. So the Americans can't do what they want behind the scenes with the Russians and the, uh, the Chinese paying uh, special attention uh, in Djibouti. So now they're looking for a separate region where they have the total control. And I think Somaliland is a massive factor in that because Somaliland, as Djibouti, also controls many positions similar to Djibouti. He also controls the, the, Red, um, uh, the Red Sea. It controls the Gulf of Aden. It controls many different, uh, many different um, points of that Horn of Africa. It's a very strategic pace. And plus, it's also um, very, very close to the, the southern Somalis. So again, Americans are looking at it from a different perspective. They're thinking that if we give um, uh, Somaliland, basically, because they're going to think of it this way, right? They're not going to give Somaliland the recognition without getting something in return. So I feel like the end play is going to be, we're going to put a base in Somaliland, and we're going to give you the recognition in return. That's not going to be good for anybody. Even though um, recognition is uh, what Somaliland wants, if you put a base there, it could only end up bad because I don't see any good from that. Even, uh, <clears throat> see, because think about it this way, right? I'm, I'm watching it from my own perspective. Even though um, uh, half of my family is from what, what's now known as Somaliland, I'm, I'm looking at it from a perspective of Djibouti. I'm looking at it, what's happening in that. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm looking at it from what's happening in Djibouti. It's not a very good outcome with all of these military bases. They have all of these secret little um, buildings where no one can enter. They have these special places where no one can set foot in. Because literally... And yeah, basically, it's, uh, it's against the law for you to enter certain parts within that uh, or even get close to those regions. So only God knows what they're doing there. Um, so I'm looking at it from that perspective, even though I will, uh, even and what, what basically, um, you know, uh, pushes this agenda furthermore is because, again, if you look at what's happening in Djibouti, it gives access to two continents. In the south is well, uh, Somalia. In its east is the Arabian Peninsula and all the, the troubles that are going on with Yemen. In its west, it's Ethiopia, the TP-11 versus the Tigray war. And um, in, in its north, it's Eritrea. And you can see what's happening and how they're labeling Eritrea as the North, uh, the north Korea of Africa. So now, now you're looking at this. Basically, the, the Horn of Africa is slowly becoming, in my opinion, um, the playground of the Europeans. And this is what the Horn of Africa needs to get rid of. They need to make a treaty. They need to make some sort of pact to get all of these outside players out of the factor. So, yeah, I was going to ask what, something, what can be done to achieve this? Um, excellent point, brother. I agree with a lot that you said, and I, I share the same sentiment that Africa is going to become, uh, unfortunately, for us Somalis, uh, you know, a great uh, in a place that a lot of the Western powers have a great interest in. And actually, I've read a report the other day as well that said that the America were actually jealous of the level of influence that UK was exerting over the north of Somalia. And that's the reason they went into Berbera. Um, so, you know, I can only foresee a situation of de destabilization. Uh, a future of perpetual sort of chaos. Um, look, if America today comes out and says, look, we're going to defeat wholeheartedly Al-Shabaab, the terrorist group, or any other group that is there, I would actually support that. Because for me, the most important thing is the stability and security of the country. If security is improved and these groups have been removed, I genuinely believe Somalia will return back to how it was once, you know, it was prosperous development. And a lot of diaspora people will go back, which would mean a lot of sort of, you know, people that have gained certain experience and skills from abroad, they will take it back there. But we know they won't do that. You know, America has been in Somalia in some form or another for the last 20 years. Ever since George W. Bush declared and sent troops over there, have they eliminated Al-Shabaab? No, they haven't. They've actually highlighted and they've convinced certain Al-Shabaab founders to be part of uh, the, 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 the Somali political uh, discourse. There's a guy that the previous administration uh, I've mentioned in the last uh, stream as well, that um, he was one of the right-hand men of Al-Shabaab, uh, uh, former leader that was killed by America. And U.S. forced... Yeah, yeah. yeah Mustar Robo, uh, just for reference, for everyone's awareness. And, you know, uh, um, uh, actually, um, they put a pressure on President Formaggio to release him because, because that guy wants to participate and become the president of one of the regional uh, federal member states. So it shows you, you know, it's a clear... This ingenuity of uh, this ingenuous of not really helping Somalia, while also at the same time being involved in Somalia affairs. It's called the dual track system, right? They will deal with the federal uh, or what they consider the the, the governing uh, of the country at some level, and also deal with all these federal member states or these different territories separately as well. So, brother, I I I worry honestly. Uh, the only solution would be 
you know, to have had someone that could, you know, um, sort of resist this sort of pressure. For President March did that a great deal. He has faced incredible amount of resistance and pressure from not only the foreign powers, but also from within Somalia as well. As the Sheikh Mohammed, as you rightly pointed out, this is someone with the Western were very swift, you know, announcing how happy they were that he's gained. They've sent out, uh, you know, congratulation message to him. Uh, TPLF did this, uh, US, Europe, all of them have did it. And this is someone that, to us Somalis, he's not unknown, he's not unfamiliar. We know what he's done. The four years that he was in power, 30 different MPs have been killed. You know, um, he has uh, the, the, the level of corruption that has happened under him, which he himself has been accused of. It's quite amazing. Some of his advisors actually have a current case with the FBI open where they've been accused of uh, to, to steal national resources. Some of the banks that were held in uh, money where there were certain American banks, they went in to draw that money out. So, you know, uh, this is something that we're aware of. But going forward, I am genuinely worried, but I'm also trying to be optimistic. The only way we can move on is to try to encourage as much Somalis as we can, similar to similar movement I'm seeing in Djibouti, although they're being suppressed. A lot of the youth people that want to speak out, we want that kind of level of participation within the youth to come in and, you know, genuinely express because their future is at stake. And if they don't stand up and fight for it, you know, we're going to become effective a colony for these Western powers. So I don't have the answer for you, brother. All I can say is I just share your sentiment. Nicely, nicely said. Can I expand um, on that one? Oh, sorry, sorry, Mo. Go ahead. No, no worries. Um, I was gonna say, yeah, nicely said, uh, uh, brother. But uh, we can also see that how this is playing out. Um, as Somalis, we can see that the anger of the Europeans are coming out. Um, we can see that they warning over uh, what's now called Somaliland. They they really want it. They really want it because Djibouti is too much competition. There are so many different foreign powers in um in uh, Djibouti city that they want somewhere where the Americans and the, their allies control. So now they're coming after Somalia. They can't go after Eritrea because Eritrea is the North Africa. Remember that they labeled it as the North uh, Korea of Africa. Um, they can't go after Ethiopia because Ethiopia is in its own turmoil. And plus they already uh, labeled Ethiopia as um, a country to be liberated. And you know what outcome comes with that. Um, so now the end game is to go after Somalia. And they, they won't stop. I can see it. They won't stop because... Um, just recently, the American top uh, uh, military official for the Biden administri uh, administration came to Somaliland and they had a meeting there. Um, we can see what angle they're coming at. Um, yeah, I'm also sharing the sort of same sentiment. I'm worried too. Um, this is not a good outcome for anybody. Sorry, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but I'm just going to add one quick message, Ezra. I do apologize and pie. Um, no, the, 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 the visit that you just mentioned right now, uh, Mo. Uh, this was the uh, United States African Command. Um, they released a statement. I don't know if you've seen it, actually. Their statement was quite clear, actually. And I, I was actually surprised by that. In, in a way, you know, welcomed it. They said they believe only in one Somalia, that they consider this Somaliland part of federal member state. I don't know if you read that statement. And that was actually quite reassuring. So if they're going to come up with that level of sort of, you know, mentality, then at least it's something that we can work with. But we know that's not genuine. They, you know, at any point they yeah, can devise. Yeah, yeah. But then the worry you know, is the when they speak to this, yeah, exactly. When they speak to these guys separately, the ones that you know, Musa Bih or whoever, they're probably going to tell him something else. So they're going to use that kind of a you know, <laughs> two ways of sort of you know, um, undermine us and sort of handle us. So I just want to make that comment. Sorry, go, go ahead, guys. Mm -hmm. No, what yeah. I wanted to say was, is I don't believe that they'll make a Somaliland uh, country, I think they'll give them like unofficial recognition. Because even even in Taiwan, they, they during the UN uh, resolution of 1971, like after like 30, I think it was like 30, 40 years after the Chinese Civil War, um, they didn't make they didn't make Taiwan a country. They just uh, progressively gave them unofficial, unofficial. Uh, recognition, and they had over 50, they had over 50 years to give them recognition. And the same players that are in uh, the same players that are in Taiwan at the moment, they're in Somaliland. They're in 2023. They're gonna drill. Uh, oil and gas in northern Somalia. But they're not but they're not all, all they're doing is drilling oil and gas, but they're not giving them they're not giving town recognition, they're not giving Somaliland recognition. I think they're gonna just like hold it over the head, like progressively give them more recognition, but I don't think they'll try to make them a country. In my opinion. No, that's actually uh, that's an excellent point. A very excellent point, especially in the light of uh, you know Taiwan that you mentioned. You know, uh, we spoke up separately by on a private uh, sort of platform, 
But it's the same thing. The difference between the People's Republic of China and Republic of China, right? One was uh, one is sort of what is known as China right now, and the other one is uh, Taiwan. Uh, so you know, although Taiwan is still considered part of China, but they still sort of, as you can see, the world is treated as a separate country. So it's sort of given a like a unknown, vague, de facto status, while also at the same time not announcing it to say, oh, we're going to give you the full recognition. Um, so yeah, I, I feel that kind of status. It's something that actually the U UK at the moment are doing it. They've uh, you know they've already sort of putting out all these statements and sort of official uh, communique to indicate that, you know, sort of Somaliland is his own country, while also at the same time, you know, when, when the foreign minister is asked to say, oh, no, we believe in one Somalia. So that's something to keep an eye on. It. And I would encourage all Somalis and non Somalis to be very careful about those kind of people. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, because I've also read into that as well. Um, Somaliland's recently um, been in talks with Taiwan, and Taiwan's going to send some of its uh, engineers and some of the uh, basically the people to Somaliland to look for the natural resources that are abundant in uh, Somaliland. So yeah, I've, I've also seen that pie. Um, furthermore, as well, um, what, uh, the brother Watson made a good point as well. As you see, Taiwan and Somaliland are both a de facto state in terms of like the um, world view. Um, they're basically a semi-autonomous. So that that meaning that. That they have their own governance and they control their own uh, basically country or state, whatever you call it. They control themselves, and uh, but they're not recognized. So that's that's what it is. They um, they're not recognized, but they still you have to look at it from a different perspective and a different angle. Taiwan, uh, if you look at Taiwan, it's still even though it's not recognized technically, it's still recognized. When when people say that mm -hmm. oh, I'm from Taiwan, they're not going to associate you with China because of the yeah. Uh, yeah. the mass popularity that comes with Taiwan. And now Somaliland recently has been in the mouth of many people. Taiwan's uh, Somaliland, if, if it continues in the angle that it's going in, is going to reach that status soon. Because a lot more people have been talking about it. If you re research Google, if you uh, YouTube, a lot more people have been talking about it. It's basically becoming a topic right now. And um, you can also see where this is going to, because, um, again, Somaliland has been in contact with uh, many European countries. There's 17 countries that accept the Somaliland passport. I mean, it's starting to make its way to that Taiwan uh, level. And even though you're not recognized, even though officially Somaliland may not be recognized, it's still going to have the, uh, it's still going to have the independent slash the uh, people are not going to associate it with Somalia anymore because of the way that the structure is going. So we can all see where this angle is going. So again, I can see it both ways. I can see that um, Somaliland may become its own uh, independent, if not recognized, still its own uh, uh, its own country, or. I can also see it from an angle where Americans and the top European can also use Somaliland as an angle against the Somali government to give them what they want. Because otherwise, what can they do if they give them recognition? So I can see both angles coming. Well, that's that's exactly why two months ago, me and Warsana, we had a, a conversation. Uh, you can go back and watch if you want about Taiwan and Somaliland and Somalia, because like in in like in Taiwan, like if if like Somaliland, if their allies are basically the U.S., Great Britain, and Taiwan, and in Somalia, their allies are China and Russia, they're going to try to cause, like, some kind of, like, Cold War type of situation. So it, it could be really, that could be, a, like, a really dangerous situation. That's already dangerous, in my opinion, but go ahead. Because Isra, recently, Isra, recently... Can you bring recently, the uh, map of, uh, oh, of Africa, if you don't mind, so people can yes. see that? I'll do that just now. Uh, okay. While I'm, while I'm doing the map, uh, uh, the family, um, just just a question that I, I had uh, while I'm still trying to load the map um, uh, for uh, for Wasami and uh, Mo. Maybe if you, do you think uh, uh, President Hassan is uh, is the right president for for Somalia? Can he bring unity between Somaliland? Um, and oh, what once uh, Somaliland trying to break out, will he bring peace to Somalia as a country to become one stable country? Do you think he's the man for the job or is coming for the second time and it'll still be the same old uh, policies? Um, Mo, do you want me to go first or do you want to go first? I'll ask you, buddy. If you want to go first, I'll, 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 I'll listen. Go okay. Ahead, okay. Um, I, I don't have a lot of high hopes. I'll be quite frankly honest with you. Um, and the reason being is, it's not because the guy I wanted to win didn't win. It's simply for the fact that I know who Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud is. I have seen his um, administration for four and a half years. And he's someone that has, and not only that, actually, also for the last four and a half years, when President Formaggio was the president, 
he has actually engaged in quite toxic tribalistic uh, rhetorics uh, effectively standing on a platform of my tribe this my tribe didn't get that something that is very unbecoming of what a former president supposed to do and it's quite sad actually you know um so he's also engaged in high level corruption his closest allies have been accused and at the moment as i mentioned earlier a lot of uh, uh, corruption even by america has opened in terms of you know the level of resources they have stolen um straight after the the election results when he was announced he was going to become the president elect he went on a media platform of an organization that has engaged in quite you know i mean to say even a propaganda is an understatement itself i mean this group i mean this media group has you know been pumping out a lot of misinformation at times even like you know encouraging people to go and stand up and cause some sort of a you know violence just because you know they 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 don't like the the tribe that the previous president from Manchu was and he went on there to thank them for supporting him because they, he he went on there to give some sort of a political speech on there before so when i see someone like that that to me doesn't send a message as that he's going to be a unifier that sends a message to me that he's going to say listen i won and i thank this group of people that have been you know um running very toxic uh, tribalistic uh, rhetorics i i want to thank to them you know the, the the people that also have sent them uh, congratulation were groups someone like you know a, a think tank that called sahan uh, group that is based in kenya but the guy is from uh, uh, canada and, and and he has got he holds dual passport in the uk you know people like that have been absolutely euphoric how happy they were for hasan sheikh mahmud to come in i mean all you have to do is look at the people that have been happy when he got elected to kind of give you an idea who he surrounds himself with there's even pictures after the election that he you know he, he invited over like, a lot of, of his kinsmen basically again that shows me he is thinking tribal but the most damning of all is there's a video there's two videos actually I want to mention one of them was where a few months ago I think it must have been actually a month ago where he was speaking on a platform again to part of his presidential candidacy and he was asked the question to say look a lot of somali people are saying we want to move away from the tribalistic mindset especially in the governance of you know how the government needs to be you know uh, uh, how the country needs to be governed sorry and you know that we don't want that. a lot of people are saying let's go back to unity you know where no city or no region belongs to anyone in particular no clan and you know just move it to a union right of 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 nationalism rather than tribalism and he his answer was very damning and it will give you an idea where he stands he said actually he believed in the use of tribalism to govern the country he said we all practice some sort of a level of tribalism in our own homes so why are we against you know in applying it through the country in terms of how we govern and he also said certain regions belong to certain people in other words you're going to become foreigner into your own country because you happen to be in a region or a city now like for example if i'm not from hargeisa or if i go there i'm going to be viewed as homeless you know if i go to goro which what some people call it punland if i go there then they they're going to consider me as a, as a foreigner or 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 or, or anywhere else you know so so, so that he he wants that kind of a apply that kind of a governance to the country the second video i want to mention he was asked about you know during the uh, military anniversary the 12th of april he was asked you know what he thinks about the somali national army and the strength he has been growing over the last four years he said and i quote a lot of people are saying we need to uh, bring a strong country and a, a strong uh, military i am one of the people that is strongly against the idea i mean can you imagine a former president who's now a president saying he doesn't believe in a strong army i mean so it, it all makes sense now why he signed very quickly this deal with america to redeploy us army so effectively undermine the somali uh, uh, national army I'll, you know basically offshore it to the, to america or whoever because you pay also as a base in somalia two different bases actually and how would that going to solve anything that's going to create you know further issues and we know history when america comes into a region where they want to promise uh, you know rebuilding the security of practice look what they done to afghanistan there's a lot of people that had to leave uh, afghanistan very quickly because their life is on the threat because they worked with america they believe in america so much that when america would do back suddenly they knew they were going to be a target you know america trained uh, uh, denim which is a somali national army op- uh, uh, special operations uh, command it's meant to be about one is the plan was to be 1000 uh, man strong when america would do last year 
Can you imagine the, the personnel that were there? You know, suddenly they're going to become targets for, of Al Shabaab and others. Uh, so if you put only a basket of just one thing to say America and UK is going to help us, at some point they're going to abandon you. And then what you got left? You got nothing. You got no army left. And then what? We're going to see Al Shabaab coming back stronger. And then the cycle is going to start again. So I, in, in a very short term, I have not, no hope. I still have to be optimistic. But in terms of his personnel, he's not a unifier. We've seen what he's about. So therefore, I'm not very optimistic. So go ahead, brother Mo. Uh, um, yeah. So basically, in terms of uh, basically uniting the Somali people, would take a lot. It would uh, take a lot. And one of them, again, being the tribalistic side of things. There's a lot of tribalistic uh, problems within Somali uh, Somali community. Um, see, there's only one way to break the Somalis apart. It won't be. Um, religion, it won't be infighting. You, the only way to break the Somali people apart would be tri tribalistic uh, um, methods. And I think the Europeans understood that. Again, if we're looking at it from a different perspective, I'm going to speak for both sides. That's the only way because I've seen a couple of Somalilanders on the panel. So I'm going to speak for both sides. And uh, so this is what I would say. If the Somali people were to become one, because again, it would take a lot, I would say, again, the Somalilanders' uh, um, demands have to be met so with the Somalis as well because a lot of if we're looking through historical point of view an apology is owed to the Somali landers if we're going to be honest uh, an apology would be owed and also something given in return to i.e. some of the people that committed the mass genocide would have to be arrested would you say, wouldn't you say so or something brother I have to strongly push against that notion for the premise of the statement and can, if I, if you don't mind me with great deal of respect I don't uh, when you say an apology is owed who is the apology owed to I mean you have to understand the country went to war every single tribe has had tremendous loss I don't understand why we have to be apologetic to one single clan I don't, I really don't get it and by the way are we also going to extend the uh, courtesy from the other side as well the, the, the guy that some of the northerners have elected as one of their president, Musa Bihi, he himself was part of the militia, the SNM militia. And he himself has you been know, accused you know, of... You know the, you know the creation... Uh, you know the, re uh, the reason why the SNM was created? You yes, I'm aware right? I understand. So you are, yes. Can I, can, can I expand on that? Yeah, yeah go gonna, on, sorry. Uh, there's no worries. I was going gonna, gonna to also break it down into... Um, uh, I understand your view, uh, like your your view of uh, point. Basically, I understand the reasoning behind why you said what you said. But again, if we're gonna look at uh, if we're gonna look at it from a perspective of you know a viewpoint of uh, you know objective viewpoint, we're also gonna have to look at it from a loss of death. We're gonna have to look at it from a mass of death. We're gonna have to look at it from what happened to lead the, uh, what happened that led the Somali people into the position they are in. And I also agree. Later on, what happened and what SNM did later on was despicable, a hundred percent. But what started it was the maniac at the, the head of chair who literally initiated his army to push forward because of the people in the north were getting no funding from the uh, from the president at the time. And that's the reason why the military was created. Because no, nothing was getting built in the north while everything was getting built in the south. And that's when the militia began. And he saw that as a threat. That's why he moved his army up the north. Are we, uh, do we differ in this argument, brother? I want to hear your viewpoint. The argument is very valid that you said. Can I add some context to it? If you don't mind me saying, so the, the guy you refer to is the, is the is the former president, isn't it, Hamzi Adbar, right? Uh, yeah. He was essentially a dictator. You you will get no uh, dispute from my side. I would say the latter part of his uh, governance has led to the downfall of the uh, of the country, and I would pay so blame on him. Also, I would extend to say after 1977, the country started going downward. That's when the creation of all these different militias start popping up. So the creation of SNM was our people, my tribe, um, we're not getting um, political representation or development, so therefore I'm going to pick up arms and I'm going to fight the government. And they were not the only one. There were other type of militia that also came about and did a similar thing, right? But here's the thing. Do you go about, you know, in any international uh, laws, um, even religious law, if you look at it, there's ways you could use to... Um, uh, bring about change unless you think the only way you can bring about change is to pick up arms and kill fellow people what happened was when the when the army was sent to the north i've spoken to a lot of different people from the north themselves by the way i've, I've did a great deal of research on this and a lot of them admitted that 
the initial operation wasn't targeting the civilians. It was to target this uh, militia who was crossing over to the border of Ethiopia and then coming back in to attack. However, someone along the line, the command went wrong, and they start targeting innocent people. I've no, I've talked to people that said, look, initially I had no issues with the Somali army being in, in, the, in, in the city, Hargeisa, for example. But then one day I was walking about, and suddenly I'm being shelled. I'm being attacked, and my house being destroyed, and my family is being killed. That has happened. No one's in denial of that, brother. You understand? People, innocent people have lost lives. Some of them at the hands of people that were wearing Somali military uniform, uh, uniforms. There is no denying of that. And anyone that denies it lives in a fantasy. But here's my okay, issue, from, right? From speaker from that yeah, angle, uh, brother, wouldn't you say from speaker from that angle, as you described it, um, again, uh, you have to understand the reason for this whole militia to be gone was, again, you understand the, the reason, the sole reason, wasn't exactly the sole reason, but the main reason why the SNM rebel group began was because of the no funding going out to the north. That only 5% of the funding, out of the 90% that was going to the south, only uh, 95% anyway, going to the south, and only 5% went up to the north. So you can understand from a perspective of, you know, viewing this objectively that what was happening there was very injustice. So you can already see the prejudice that was going towards the north. And then what happened is, we know as a Somali that they don't do, <laughs> they don't do basically talking. They don't do um, sitting down on the table and discussing. They see the injustice, they want to pick up the arms and they want to go after this. So it's a way of basically showing, showing power. There's no, we don't, in a way, basically, we don't um, sit down and count our thumbs. No, we see injustice, we're going to have to go after it as Somalis. I speak for all Somalis when I say this. But So, again, that, that rebel group was specifically targeting the government, or the one, the one who targeted the government. And when the, the maniac saw what was happening, he sent basically, I think it was uh, around 75% of his army up the north. And that's when the, the stuff started happening. So in that perspective, you can understand the, the older generation that saw what was happening to them bred the hatred into the younger generation. So to kill this hatred, something needs to be done. Wouldn't you agree? Brother, I, I agree. Uh, the latter of your statement, something needs to be done. But what is that something? But again, I want to push one statement that you said. You said um, 95% of the funding was going to the south. No, it was going to the capital. You have to understand, it's not like only the north or some cities in the north were neglected and the rest of Somalia was prospering. Literally only the capital Mogadishu was built. There's a lot of other parts of Somalia that weren't even built. And a lot of other people face similar level of disfranchisement, uh, dis disfranchisement and level of neglect in their regions. And they, you know, some of them being uh, uh, losing their jobs just because they happen to be from different clan. That happened all over Somalia under the hands of the last administration of Mohammed Siad Barik. You will get no denying for me. I will accept that. But why is it that we only look at one tribe to say, oh, they have suffered injustice, while at the same time, ignoring the injustices that other tribes have uh, received? So that's what I'm saying to you. However, of course, of let course, me of course, put this right. to you. Like, yeah, go ahead. So, so I was just going to say, the part of healing is to admit something that has happened 30 years ago. I was not responsible for it. You were not responsible. And no one else, either north or south, was responsible for it. We have a country to do. But for you to say, look, this map that has been put up, that is the north of Somalia, of what currently they claim to be Somaliland. But as you can see, there are other tribes that live there. But the, there's one tribe family that normally says, we want to cut off. We are a separate country. And how could you allow one tribe to dictate and dominate an area that is that contains five different provinces to say that is theirs? I'm saying to you, brother, what has happened, a lot of bad things have happened. Every single family Somali you speak to, they will say to you they have lost people displacement, everything you can imagine. We need to move forward. The one that suffered very course, terrible course, fate. Terrible. Thank you, Jack. I understand. No, I understand but the, what happened to the Somali people is, is crazy. Like, a lot of people lost the family. But in terms of, like, uh, levels of oppression, you can only tell that they, the certain clan that we both know suffered the most. So I, I'm talking from that angle that they, they see as what happened to them was the worst. Which we can both yeah. agree on that because the countless lives that were lost. You, okay. uh, I want to ask you that question. Do you agree with the post that only they have suffered the most? Do you agree with that statement? No, no, everybody suffered, but they suffered the most. We can agree on that. I don't agree with that they suffered the most. I think a lot of Somalis have suffered the most. Uh, they, they, I mean, how can we quantify that? L that's another question I want to ask you. How do you know? Because Are you... Of death have have been been you? Sorry? Because their marginals of death have been counted to be well over 100k, <laughs> while the others have not gone nowhere near that. Okay, have you looked at the, 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 the methodology of those reports, what they've used in order to say that these numbers specifically were because government forces targeting this tribe? I mean, have you looked at it? Because when you dig up graves and then you just say, I mean, uh, that, that it belongs, how, how can you confirm that? 
I've seen some organizations that went there to claim that these mass graves belong to uh, part of the Somali National Army killing those people. But how would they know that? So many injustices and crimes have happened in the North. How on earth could they have known bones from 30 years ago? I'm just saying. Have lost I was going to say, yeah. We... You go on. I was going to say, yeah, they used multiple methods to count that. For example, i.e., missing families. That's already counted as a. Uh, um, as basically, it was not really counted towards the Taliban, but it was already there. As, like, for example, uh, if somebody was missing, if somebody's body was found, if somebody's, uh, uh, you know, because you could tell from when people were very dead, you could see their clothes on them. So that was already counted. And people remember what type of clothes that they were wearing. If you've seen some of the documentaries on YouTube or some of the, uh, the Somalis have good memory, so they can tell what that person was wearing. As some of them have been identified even today. Um, a lot of different methods were used to count up to that number. And I can, I can assume, because people say that they, it's around 200,000 which I think is incorrect, but if we're talking from a objective point of view, we can assume that it's over 100,000, which is correct, because they use multiple methods to say that it was 100, uh, over 100,000, and I can read the sources they use, but I don't agree it's 200,000. But in terms of like margin, like in terms of marginal uh, amounting of deaths that they suffered the most, we can all agree on that. Okay, for argument's sake, let's take the 100,000. I'm just saying, does the, is, is it just a marathon of who suffered the most? What about if the group of people that have suffered 80,000 no, killings not, or, or 70,000? So, so the point is, why are we treating one people's word so special and making them more victim than other people that have lost? I'm just saying we've all lost. We've lost a country. I mean, it's been more than 30 years. I mean, the, the argument is, and by the way, this is another thing I want to make. Okay, imagine they've suffered the most. Does that give them their right? To use that to say my tribe has suffered the most, so therefore I'm gonna not only I'm gonna take claim of my regions, but I'm gonna take claim of other people, other tribes that live there. That's another answer that I really want to hear. If you say to me they have suffered the most, let's say, because, let's say 100 million. Sorry, go on. Sorry to judge, but there's somebody else that's posing as me. I was on another panel yesterday, and this person was still posing as me. The most Solomon right now that attacked uh, uh, Swahili nation right now is not me. I never wrote that. So this person right here is not me. That's Come fine. On, Thanks for back. clarifying. No, that's fine. Um, and so just to go back to my point is, if you say, oh, they have suffered the most, let's say, you know, 200, 300,000 people have died. Okay. Does that give you the legitimacy for you to say this region now belongs to me? Bearing in mind, there are other people who don't agree with your notion, but you somehow saying, oh, the English, the British long time ago drew up these borders. So therefore, I'm going to take claiming while not even asking the other people. So that's another thing I want to say. But we have to move forward, brother. You know, like, you know, it's it's been more than 30 years. We have a lot of young people. I mean, if you look at um, a lot of the migration that's happening in Europe right now, that's crossing over to, you know, very dangerous territory in, onto the sea, either the UK or other parts, are actually youth from the north. Why? Because there's a lack of jobs there, lack of development. And they've been led a lie to say, oh, you're going to gain independence, while they haven't seen any any development for it. So we have to, I mean, I really feel sorry for a lot of youth people that have been losing their future because there are some old people who are still part of the situation that have had involvement in the destruction of the country and they're still lying to you. But we have to move forward, brother. I agree. So well, I have, 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 we, made, we made this into Mo and Osama discussion. <laughs> I sincerely apologize. Go ahead, guys. <laughs> if, if, if I may interrupt you guys there for a moment. Uh, I think, Wasami, there's something you wanted us to share uh, regarding the, the Somali uh, land, uh, the, that map. Um, I'm just going to quickly share it. And then um, you. You need to, I think there's something you wanted to share there or explain. Yeah. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier to you, um, is this is what is known as the north of Somalia or what they call it Somaliland. Um, so the, the region that's highlighted, that's where the one tribe lives, you know, where it says uh, Somaliland secession state. The other um, regions are other tribes that live there. Um, however, what they what some people claim is they say, look, all of this area belongs to me. So that's why my question to more earlier was like, imagine, you know, let's say that the Somali government has systematically or ethnically trying to, you know, uh, wipe out one clan. Imagine that statement is true. Why would you then go ahead and say all of it belongs to me, while other tribes are there that don't agree? Today, right now, if you go into north of Somalia, and I'm sure Mo will like uh, jump in this at some point, is if you just literally wear the color blue or you espouse or you know make the uh, comment to say that you believe in Somalia, you can run up into some trouble, imprisonment, you know, uh, disappearance, even beaten up by regular uh, public. We have seen it so many times happening in the last few years. So you claim there was a dictator that did bad things to you, while at the same time you are doing the same thing. It's literally, it sounds like all you wanted was just power to dominate over others. So I want to make, I want to show everyone that's, you know, watching us today, 
when they think somehow Somaliland are a group of people that all come together and they say we're gonna cut off from the rest of Somalia. If that happened today, honestly, I would say, oh, fine, because I believe in when people come together and make their own decisions, Somalis. And if that happens, I will support it. But that's, that hasn't happened. So we need to be very careful getting the definition and terminologies right. Somaliland is not uh, an area where all the tribes come together to say we're going to break away from Somalia. That hasn't happened. It's majority that, one clan. Go ahead, Mo. I was going to say, brother, uh, you mentioned an interesting point and with this map, basically. You understand with the whole uh, Khartoum state, um, they, al they already agreed to sign a deal with the uh, Somaliland uh, government basically to be part of Somaliland. The head members of Khartoum state and Mahir state basically signed a deal with Somaliland to be part of them. Odal is, um, Adwal is a, dis uh, is a disputed area. Me from me, be, me be from Djibouti and uh, I, I, can, I can basically speak on that part. It will take a long time for me to gain okay. that, but I can speak that, that that part is disputed because both tribes have a claim on it, if you know what I mean. The, I know. The, uh, yeah, the assassins and also the Isis, they have a they both have a claim on it, so they dispute it. So that, that one is out of the question because they both have a right to that. But in terms of the Khatuma and the Makhir state, they can say that uh, um, the people from uh, Khatuma and Makhir state signed a deal and a treaty with the Somaliland people. And it's not basically one-sided because people uh, that are from Khatuma state, half of them want, want to be part of Somaliland, while the other half want to be part of Somalia, while the third half want to be the only independent uh, um, uh, country. So it's a very disputed area. It's not just they have one mind to be part of Somalia. No, it's disputed. Some side with Somalia, some side with Somalia, some side in their own. It's a very, uh, uh, they're not people to make up their mind in one, one basically, one opinion. Thank you for pointing out, even parts of the session state themselves, some people that don't agree with be breaking away. But one thing I want to push back, when you say the, the Mahadir area with these different tribes and the Khartoum state, you have to, you know, when the agreements were being signed, or when when the people that secession is when they say we've signed agreement for all the tribes, do you know the condition it was signed in? This is after the SNM defeated the Somali National Army, have could taken control over all of Somalia. There was a military command center in north of Somalia, which they've taken in, inheriting a lot of the heavy, heavy weaponry that was stationed there, effectively giving them an ultimate superiority over all other tribes. So when you have someone that is so powerful over you and suddenly putting a paper in front of you, what option do you have? When they have also themselves then shown you example, Musabi himself going into Aldo, killing, going to certain cities like Dilla, go, killing people. So what option do you have when you sign it? So as an elder, you want to preserve life, so you're going to sign it. If you say no, you know what the outcome is. So I just want to add that in there for context. It's quite important that we remember it. But even the, the, the last point that you made was very good and I agree with it. There's a lot of, um, there's not single voice. There's a lot of disagreement. You, you're right. There's some people that would today say, I, I want to become a Somali and I want to be part of it. There's others that will say no. And there's others that say, I want to become my own country. Why, why are we even rejecting those? You know, why only stop a Somaliland? If not, give everyone their own country. Give every tribe their country. I, I was reading comments to say, you know, the issue of Somalia is tribe issue. You're right. You know, either we come back as a country. Look, my, my solution is too simple. Either we're going to come back as a country like we were. Or we're going to give every tribe their own country and let, let us just break away that way. That, that's, that's my only thing. But to me, it doesn't make sense why we're only going to give certain people the advantage to dominate certain area and then suppressing others. I find it very unfair. And I hope a lot of people agree with me, those that value fairness and equality. Oh, yeah. I was going uh, Mo, you broke up. Oh, no worries. Oh, yeah. I was going to also point out, again, um, you made a fair point about the, uh, the, the conditioning that the, the people signed back in the 90s with the SNM took over. But again, we were talking about, if we're gonna, I'm gonna push back on that. In 2017 or before 2017, I think it was, um, I forgot the year it was, but there was a specific year, I'll get it out after this. There was a specific year when, before the, the, the Khatama states uh, became part of Somaliland, they went to Somalia with their own uh, uh, meetings to become part of Somalia, but Somalia refused their offering. They went to Portland and Portland refused the offerings and their third option was to become part of Somaliland. So brother, in terms of that respect, they, they, they went to Somalia first, they went to Poland first, but they both refused their offers. They were both refused Khatama State, and then Khatama State had no option but to join Somaliland. So I don't see where that problem is, because again, they, they already offered the, them to the, um, the chance to become part of them, but them to refuse the deal, while Somaliland, on the other hand, accepted. What do you have to say to that? I, I agree with that. You're right. When they went to, 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 to the south, to the capital, the government that was there at that time, the reason they refused was because this 4.5 system has been put on us. 
which said effectively treat Somaliland as effectively its own sort of one federal member state. So therefore they said to them, you're not a federal member state. This is one of the things I'm pushing for. Why would, why would, don't we give these people political representation by combining them all in this massive uh, sort of area called Somaliland? I find it very unfair. We need to start announcing things like maybe SEC state, all these different tribes. So when they were refused, I understand why they were unhappy. And maybe they felt, again, you have to understand, when you're between heart and rock place, you don't have a lot of options. You have to go through one way, you know, reluctantly. But does that mean we have to allow them to say, oh, yeah, these people have made choice, so therefore we'll stick with it. We have to be very fair and accept the realities that were there. The tribal system should not work and should never be accepted. I agree. Um, I agree on that aspect. The last part you said, we said 100% that the tribal part should not be the, is basically the outcome in any decisions, 100%. Um, but what I can also say is, um, from a, uh, from, like, from a perspective of seeing uh, Khatam State in the situation that it's in today, it's not just the Somaliland government to blame, it's also the Somalis for refusing them, the Somali government Absolutely. for refusing the, Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. the offering in the first place. So, from again, they have met a lot of people from Khartoum State, and when they all said that, um, a lot of them said that basically, well, the, the ones that support Somalia anyway, and some of their reasonings were because again, we we went to Somalia, we offered them the the chance, uh, we basically offered them the chance for us to join them, and all, their government refused. We went to Portland, their government refused. So now they want to make this, uh, basically, this voice on Khartoum State that Khartoum State has been oppressed when they were the ones that basically put us in the situation. So how are they going to speak for us now? So of I course. can understand where they're coming from. So Somalia refused them. Why are they going to speak for them now? Is it just to throw shade at Somaliland? Or is it because they want them back now? There's a lot of confusion going on. The Somalis are... In the first place, a lot of Khartoum State people hold Somalia accountable for what happened to them. They, they're the ones that did the situation, put them in the situation. So in a way, Somalia can't, can't be basically speaking from a perspective of high morality. If you know what I mean. Absolutely not. They have, they have no grant to speak high morality. I'm sorry, such thing doesn't even exist. There's a lot of, you know, bad injustices happening all over Somalia. But, you know, you have to understand that the people that were in government that time, they refused this offer because, you know, some people, let's be honest, even in Mogadishu, they have no interest of restoring, you know, Somalia back. They want this sort of uh, organization and division, you know, different parts of Somalia to exist. So I understand their, why they're angered and I really sympathize for them. And I hope one day they will prevail and they will get the representation they deserve. Inshallah. And uh, uh, family, um, thank you, thank you, uh, guys. Uh, thank you, uh, Mo, and thank you, uh, Wasami. I'm just going to pause this idea right now because there's a lot uh, coming from Somalia. Uh, I know Biggie wanted to say something, uh, but I, before we go to Biggie, I just wanted uh, Mo to touch on um, something to do with uh, Djibouti, which has been a, a lot of concerns. A lot of Africans have raised concern with the uh, military bases of uh, so-called uh, foreign nations uh, uh, are being uh, are putting their military bases in, in Djibouti. Um, what's your take there, uh, Mo, since you're from that region as well? Brother, you have to understand the place, as I call it, I call it the, the military supermarket. And the reason why I call it that is because a lot of countries go there to put their military bases. And don't forget, it's not just a one-way side. It's actually a two-way street because the people that are putting their military there is also, as the Americans did, they're offering them money they're also offering them military equipment. As you can see, the, if you look at the... Uh, I'm going to send you guys a video. A video of the Djibouti National Army basically marching in the streets where a lot of their weapons have been upgraded. They have a lot of modern weapons. They have a lot of modern weapons and armory. So the country, in a way, is advancing from this so-called partnership, which I don't call partnership. Um, so in a way, it's progressing because it has a lot of uh, uh, modern weaponry. It has a lot of money. That is also influxing into the economy. And you can see from this because the GPD per capita for Djibouti is, what, 5,000, higher than most African countries. So in terms of standard of living, Afri uh, in, terms of in Africa, Djibouti is one of the highest because of the money that's going back into the economy and the business is booming. So you can see from that. Um, that's just some of the positives. And the other positives are also the fact that um, basically if one of the military superpowers, i.e. America, Russia or China, gets out of hand, we still have the other two to put them in check. So none of them really have the advantage in terms of the other. So in a way, the Djibouti also, the Djibouti uh, government also has a way of controlling them. Because this, because again, it's a very strategic position, right? So let's just say that the Americans decide to uh, uh, get out of hand. The Djibouti, uh, the Djibouti president um, basically can kick them out. They can kick them out. They have a, uh, basically, have a way of kicking them out. Because again, they're going to be so threatened by the Chinese and the, 
Russians being there, so they have to behave. They have to be in good behavior. They can't do what they usually do. So in that respect, I can see what's happening. But what I don't like is the fact that um, these military bases are also destabilizing the surrounding regions. They, don't, they are. Because again, there are certain things about the um, Al-Shabaab, um, certain things that are happening with Somalia and Al-Shabaab that I also feel, account, uh, I feel like that Djibouti is also accountable for. I also feel like Djibouti is also accountable with some things to do with the TPL. Because again, they have so many military bases. Of course, they're going to keep up an eye on that. They have like eight military bases in the country. So they all, and all, most of them are allies. So of course, it's in their interest to keep the, uh, the situation around uh, the surrounding countries destabilized. Also with Yemen as well. There are so many Yemeni refugees that are coming into Djibouti. It's out of hand right now. And again, for the safety of the people in Djibouti, how do you know they're not Houthi? How do you know that they're not part of the terrorist organization that's happening in Sana'a and the North Yemen? There's no, there's no basically uh, background checks happening to these people. They're just letting them in the country. God knows what they are. So you can already see as a citizen the, the situation that we're in. We don't know who's who. We don't know who's coming into the country. There's so many distrust right now that's happening. So that's just a broad overview. If you want me to go into detail, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Ask me. Uh, Mo, uh, thank you, thank you for for that. Uh, um, I just have a follow up question. Uh, I, I know what you're saying about um, the money that's being fed from all these um, nations that have placed their military base there as a as a strategic move. But uh, as citizens, are, are the citizens of Djibouti happy with this decision that is made by the executive, or is it just something that is imposed on them uh, to have those military bases? No, the people are not happy with it. Absolutely not. Ishmael Omar, the president of Djibouti, is the only person that's happy from this because it's, it's still in his pocket and the, the upper man, the Isis, the upper man, uh, um, uh, uh, tribesmen of his people, of the, the uh, basically the, his, the tribe that's in charge right now. He's basically filling their pocket. The higher pe the higher ranking uh, members are getting their wealth worth, they're getting their money, they're getting their pockets filled. But the people on the ground are not happy with it. They're not happy with it because, again, you have to be worried and concerned about the safety of your country. You don't know, as, as I said earlier, you don't know who's who. You're letting all of these migrants coming from Yemen. It's dangerous. Um, there's an area in uh, uh, the city where there's like a Yemeni market, right? And there has been some bad dealings there recently. There's been things that have been happening there that, you know, has left a distaste in the people's mouth. But that's a whole different topic. But if I'm going to speak on the uh, the people uh, within, the, within the country, they're not happy. They're not happy because... They're seeing it as an opportunity for him to make money and to him to uh, um, basically, as he's already an eternal dictator, so for him to basically establish his dynasty, because again, there's a few people that make him or standing up against him right now. A few people tried in the past, but a lot of them disappeared. A lot of these competi uh, competitors disappeared in the past. So there's a lot of shady stuff that's going on with him. That's what I can say to it. It's a very lot, um, and it's well protected. It's not just from the, the people in the country. He's also well protected from the, the far regions. He's well protected from the. He's also well protected by the Europeans and the Saudis as well. He's also well connected with the Saudis and the Egyptians. And also recently, he's uh, went to a meeting with the Egyptian um, president, where both uh, Djibouti and Egypt were discussing on how they're going to deal with the Ethiopian dam. So in a way that you can't trust him. I understand why the Horn of African Alliance never included him because it's distrusting. You cannot trust somebody that's going to all the way to Egypt. So they can discuss on how to destabilize Ethiopia so they so they can help the Egyptians get the control of the dam. So you can see there's a lot of shady stuff that's going on with this guy. And I'm definitely not someone to support him. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mo. Uh, I think Wassam wanted to, to, to do a follow-up question as well. Uh, Wassam, you can go ahead. Yeah, th thanks, uh, Isra. Uh, Mo, I wanted to ask you a question because you said, for example, um, all these different... Um, uh, military uh, that is based in Djibouti. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm misquoting. You said like if, if you know we can sort of he could kick them out kind of thing. But do you think Djibouti government or Ismail Omar Gale has particularly any power at all to kick any of these uh, foreign military bases out? In particular, the angle if I could take, you know, obviously the China, how much debt um, you know Djibouti is in right now. I think something along the lines of 70 percent of the country's G GDP. I think this data might be from 2019, but I could be wrong. Uh, so you know the, the that tells me he, he cannot kick China out. And then when you look at the Western alliance, if America US decides to stay or France, wherever, do, do they even have any say in it? So that's one aspect I want to say. And the last thing I want to say also is, you know, you mentioned about this Yemeni threat, which I wasn't aware of. So that's an interesting point. And I remember last year as well, um, I don't like to sort of, you know, 
quote their videos, but one of the leaders of so-called Al-Shabaab suddenly threatening um, Djibouti with terrorist attack. Uh, I'm just saying that, you know, again, is, is there something being done to make sure, obviously, look, refugees seeking refuge in other countries running away from war, that's good. You know, we should all be open for that. But there's also element of security aspect. So what is the government doing and what are the sort of the feelings of people like you, the average people, of how they view it? And are you sort of anticipating the security um, level to go down more? In terms of security, that's a very good question, brother. Um, in terms of security, uh, it's already starting to become a police state. You, you're seeing more and more police marching across the streets. So in a way, that's good. Because again, it kind of uh, counter effects, it kind of counterbalances what's, uh, what he's doing with the, the refugees that are coming in. Because it's not just um, Yemeni refugees that are coming in. There's a lot of Eritrean and Ethiopian uh, refugees that are coming into Djibouti, posing as a farce. There's, there's a lot of situations that's going on over there as well. Um, in terms of what's happening with um, well, basically what uh, what he's doing in terms of like with the Chinese situation, he has some. He has basically, I wouldn't say majority, but he has some control in basically what's said and what's done. I wouldn't say that he's a puppet state because um, recently, where America just, uh, told the Djibouti president to turn his uh, missiles towards Ethiopia, he flat out refused and made it public to the people. So that gave the uh, Americans a lot of flack because again, okay. the, the American incited. You you probably heard of that was something. Um, yeah, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they 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 told the Djibouti president to turn his uh, missiles and face it towards the capital, uh, basically face it towards the capital and threaten an attack on Ethiopia. It's just basically giving the Americans access to Ethiopia, giving the Americans what they want because they've always been after Ethiopia. They want to destabilize it because look, think about it this way, right? Um, Eritrea is North uh, North Korea of Africa, so they're gonna go for them next. Eritrea is already on the hit list. Ethiopia is already going to the turmoil that it's going to right now with the TPLF, uh, the Tigray region. You can already see what's happening. Um, this would also add fuel to the fire. So if the Americans landed, they were going to get what they want. They were going to take Abiy Ara commission and either a puppet, uh, puppet president in there, or they were going to destabilize the country. It was either going to go the two ways. And Abiy was a guy not to listen to them. Abiy was not listening to them anyway. Abiy flat out refused them. I said to them that you're not allowed to come into my country. So now the Americans had no choice but to go with the rhetoric of we're coming to save the people. Just like the Americans always do. And I've got a question to all of those American sympathizers. Tell me one country that America saved that's still standing today. Um, I digress. I was going to say also the, um, so he told the, uh, the Djibouti president to face his missiles and they, they refused and they made it public. And that also gave the Americans flat. So from there on, they kind of pulled back a bit. They kind of pulled back from testing him in a way because he, he showed them that he has some sort of control. He has some sort of power. So they can't really do what they want. So in a way, they kind of have to ask, they kind of have to ask him for permission in a way. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would have to say. Th thank you for that. Appreciate that. Go ahead, guys. Thank you very much, uh, Amo, for your respond. I don't know if Pai has uh, anything to, to add or any question um, that he wants to ask or any comment, uh, Pai? Oh, no, not yet. I wanted to go to big, go to big. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and guys, uh, family, uh, do not forget, um, there's also people who are commenting. If there's any uh, comments that you want to tackle on the comment section, please, or if there's any question that you, you, you think needs clarity or something that you uh, are informed of, please uh, um, feel free to, to respond to some of the comments uh, or questions. I was going to say also, um, there's a great point to try. There was also another point that Pai made, which is actually quite good. He said, um, basically, where is it? Uh, let me just find it. Yeah, he said uh, Djibouti has the highest percentage of trade within African countries, which is correct. And it has one of the highest urban uh, built uh, cities within Africa too, which is also another benefit that's coming from the money that's coming from the bases and the trades that Djibouti is doing. And also the Djibouti Air Force, not the Djibouti uh, Navy, uh, is also overseeing that the oil, the oil and the, um, the gas and the fuel and all the natural uh, resources that's coming through the, the Red Sea to the canals. It was the Djibouti, uh, the Djibouti military that's overseeing it, that is protected from, because again, there's a lot of uh, corruption from that region. You see the Yemeni protes and um, the Al-Shabaab, these Djibouti forces that are protecting their interests. So in a way that they can't really, you know, get out of hand because we can easily um, take that protection away in a way. So the Americans have no choice because they don't have too many military bases there and they don't have too much of a grip on that region yet. That's what they want. That's the reason why they're going to Somalia because they want some sort of grip. You can't just depend on Djibouti because if Djibouti says no, what are they going to do? Mm. You know, you know that that's actually why uh, China they want a military base in Djibouti because they've been planning it for a long time now, but they already had it. I think I think uh, Somali Gulf and Ethiopia they have over I think it's seven to eight 
Bullion, cubic, something. They have a lot of they have a lot of oil and gas in Somali Gulf Bend in the uh, Ogaden Basin. So they use the Djibouti route uh, with Ethiopia so that they can get the oil from that place. But yeah, yeah, go ahead, Biggie. Hmm. Yeah, Biggie. Uh, you're welcome. Yeah. And I think on the second part, when we, we go back to um, Somalia, uh, Djibouti, obviously Eritrea and still uh, Ethiopia, but more specifically on Somalia, I would love us to touch more base on, on, on the, the oil and the, the gas uh, explorations and the fishing industry there, uh, the sea of, uh, of Somalia, how it's been exploited, something that I, I want Wasami to also touch on. And uh, oh, the whole Horn of Africa, I mean, how it's been exploited, the, the sea around those places, how it's been exploited. And Somalia being the, the longest uh, coastal um, country in Africa, um, how it doesn't even have a, a, its own uh, navy and how we can make sure that the resources of Somalia uh, does uh, build Somalia and uh, Africa in, as a whole. Uh, that's another uh, the part two of it, um, but we'll come back to that. I just want to uh, allow Biggie to come in and family to those who've just joined us. Please subscribe, please like the stream, and uh, please share also the the links to family, friends, and um, yeah. And then uh, I will share again with the with everybody the the link. I know people have been crying about the link, um, but we'll do the link on the second uh, part on the part two. Still on this live stream, not like part two on another session. Just after Biggie, we'll share the screens. And family, I'll try to ask, I'll ask you that you log in, I mean, and then ask a question or, or bring a comment and log out for other people because we're only limited in terms of how many people we can put on the stream. So, but the panel will stay. Uh, I will just be allowing people to, to come in, ask questions, put comments, rectify us or teach us something and then uh, and then leave the stream and then just so that we can get more people uh, joining us. Not that I'm, I'm, I'm refusing the stream because I know people have been crying about the stream. We will share the stream very soon. But I would love to welcome uh, Biggie first to, to, to join us. Uh, he has a, a, a lot that he wants to touch base on. Uh, I think now we'll be going more on, on Eritrea and Ethiopia, but he will touch also on Somalia and, and Djibouti as well. Uh, welcome Biggie. Yeah, th uh, thank you for uh, having me, uh, Pastor Ezra. Uh, one of the issues that uh, that I look at now, the major movement is that, yeah, Somalia went uh, on, on the new president just a week ago. <laughs> the next day, yeah, but the emperor is, is, is acting around. And so the emperor is, is trying to control certain areas. But um, we have to understand within Somalia, new president getting to... I mean, he's not new per se, but he's new to lead this, the new uh, Somalia. But at the same time, at the same time, we're getting this other buzz that they, they're coming into control in that area. Have you guys never done to you that you got Somaliland, which is closer to Djibouti? So does anybody uh, look at it would be a potential for expansion of Djibouti? Okay, um, in terms of expansion, there's that there's a region within Somaliland and Djibouti that's just, which is for the older state or the older region. And technically, if you're going to look at it towards uh, history or historical point of view, it's always uh, belongs to the tribes of their uh, tribes of basically uh, Djibouti. They've always controlled that region, and um, you could tell this um, because of the Adal uh, Adal Empire or before that it was called the Ifat, and uh, they always controlled that state. And um, that would go through uh, basically major empires were both of the Djibouti tribes, uh, the Djibouti Somali tribes, which is again, partially correct. But so in terms of historical point of view, it belongs to e e Djibouti 100% in terms of historical point of view. But if we're talking about it from uh, today of, uh, like if we're talking about it from perspective of today, then it's disputed because there's also tribes from Somaliland and tribes from Djibouti that are living amongst that region. And I can speak for that because I've been there, but um, it's a very disputed area. That's what I can say. In terms of historically, in terms of like historical point of view, 100% belongs to Djibouti. But in terms of what's happening today and uh, the people that live there today, it's very mixed. So 
if, if you don't mind me asking a question, Mo. Um, so th that's an interesting question and uh, answer you've gave. Obviously, th this whole um, borders that have been drawn up, obviously, we've talked about it. You know, it, it's the colonial stuff got together back in 1884, whatever it was, to drop these figures without, you know, bearing in mind and considering all these different tribes, all these different ethnicities where they live. So as Djibouti, as you know, there's not only Somalis that live there, but also other people, other ethnicity, majority of them being the Afar, uh, Afar people. I want to ask a question up, uh, to the uh, Mo, which is, how do you think, from your perspective, the TPLF war that's happening, how does that affect the social cohesion within Djibouti, you know, predominantly that there are people um, from that region that also live in the north part of Ethiopia? Um, and, you know, how, how is that being impacted? Um, that's one of my questions. The other question I had is a follow-up about Eritrea as well. Um, what, what's the relationship like right now? Because I know, obviously, uh, Afwerki and Ismail Mbagela might not necessarily share similar sort of ideology point of view when it comes to, you know, politics, because obviously Marlon Mergel is more associated with the Western side of sort of, um, uh, and Afwerki has been pretty much uh, treated as a pariah by the international community. So yeah, that, that's the, those two questions main I have for you, if you don't mind exp expanding on that. Uh, yeah, no problem, Olaf. Um, so yeah, in terms of um, the first question about how that affects Djibouti with the, because again, uh, Djibouti is literally right next to the Ethiop Northern Ethiopia, with the um, with the Tigray region, that that can also affect it because there's a recently I'm not sure if this is correct, but recently there was a lot of people that are coming into Djibouti posing as a fast, and they were actually some of them were being called to be TPLF members, some of them were being identified being TPLF members, so it poses a security threat, and that's the reason why the Afar region has recently been um, uh, uh, basically, the military and the police have been uh, aware or have been uh, basically told about what's happening in that region. So they've upped their patrolling. So that's the reason why that area has been patrolled a lot more now. It's because of that threat. We don't know if the TPLF can make its way into their, into their far region. So that's the reason why they have um, upped their military and upped their uh, personnel and sent them to that, to that region because it can cause chaos if the TPLF made its way there. TPLF has all, uh, basically basically been doing uh, what he's been doing from the shadows. It's been causing it not have a chaos, in a way. So, in a way, there need to be, there need to be some sort of uh, security measurements that have taken place to keep them out. So, that's the reason why the patrol and the military have been sent up there. So, I can understand from that perspective what's happening. Um, in terms of what's happening with Isaiah and Ismail, they have a different ideology. Isaiah believes in um, basically no, uh, he doesn't want his uh, his country, be, yeah, his country to be controlled by the European uh, uh, colonial powers, and that's the reason why he's kept his country privatized. That's the reason why he owes no European country any debt. He's debt free in terms of like uh, European countries, and that's the reason why this label's been heavily stuck on him in North Korea and yes. Africa. That's the reason why, because he, he only relies on himself. He doesn't reply, he rely on the European countries. He doesn't depend on them for aid or whatever, just like these other African countries. And that's the reason why this label's been stuck on him. In terms of the relationship between Ismail and Azais, Ismail is a, a person who is friends with the, um, uh, the members of the Arab states and he's friends with also the European colonials. He, he works with both sides. And um, I think he's more, he's not, he's not exactly a puppet, but he also does it in a way to benefit himself. Um, and I think that's the reason why him, Saudi and uh, Egypt are closely working together to destabilize uh, Ethiopia and take the canals or take the, uh, the uh, river from them and give it to or give the control of the river to Egypt because again there is also being shown that the Djibouti president and the Egyptian president are good friends. Um, so they have and also the connection between Eritrea and uh, Djibouti there was high tension that happened in the past. There was a high tension that also almost caused a, a war between the two countries, and it's been uh, it's been cooled off ever since. But then there's there's a sudden sometimes there's a sudden rise of tensions happen sometimes but in terms of in the past that was in the past where it, 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 there was almost a war between Djibouti and Eritrea but now not so much yeah that's what uh, that's the yeah. it, it, there is a disputed uh, sort of area between Djibouti and Eritrea isn't it like a piece of yeah, I'm not sure what the name is sorry if I'm a bit, might be a bit ignorant about it but I know there was some sort of dispute of yeah go on Oh, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. I forgot the name of the region as well, but I know exactly what you're talking about. There was a okay. disputed region uh, amongst the Eritrea and Djibouti, and now Djibouti is also full of that region. So there's, there's also that tension between the Djibouti and the Eritreans, but um, 
Eritreans won't get to uh, or like they won't attack uh, Djibouti because of uh, in terms of like the, the reason why they won't attack is because also the um, the friends that the Djiboutians have. But if we describe the friends uh, compared to military wise, uh, Eritrea yeah. is strong. Don't move wrong, but it doesn't have the modern military that the Djiboutians have. And the fact that the US and all these other Western powers are there as well, <laughs> that helps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in terms of like equipment is what makes it the, the best as well. The Buti has one of the most modern uh, military in terms of Africa. Interesting. Wow. Interesting. I, I think... Uh, <clears throat> hello guys, how are you doing? Sorry, I, I came late to the show. I was there before. Welcome. I think, <laughs> Welcome, I think what was some... Uh, I think what Sam is talking about specifically is the region known as the Afar Triangle. I think that's where the, yes. where the violence... Uh, yeah, where the people, uh, what Sam is talking about. That's the trifecta border between Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Djibouti, and mainly populated by the yeah. Afar people, also known as the lowest land, uh, at the lowest point below sea level. I, I, if, I'm, if I'm not wrong, then, then, a, then a kill area, which is much yeah, of the correct. violence. And and at, it, I think it was the point of contention in 2008 when Eritrea and Djibouti nearly fight over the, uh, over the area. And that is the start of when things went south between Afurki and Djibouti and, 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 and Ismail Urgil. And as you know, both countries have had the same, uh, the, the same rulers for quite some time now. Yes. I call Ismail uh, Umar basically the eternal dictator because if there's any competition that arises, they disappear. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, and and the, 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 the distinction between the men is very contrasting. I mean, one is so pro-Western, the other is anti-Western. And they, they, say, they sort of correlate whenever, whenever there's some sort of uprising or, or, or uh, the people want to turn against them, they, they tend to share intelligence and uh, come together. And no one likes the other to go out of the uh, leadership, so-called leadership in quotes. But I think it's for Djiboutians to deal with Djibouti and for Eritreans to deal with Eritrea. You know, the, as 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 some said before, when these borders were drawn up and carved up between the Italians, the French, and the British, they they never cared about the people on the ground. So you find even in in in, in people who are uh, pastoral uh, pastoral nomads in the past, certain time of the year they do spend their time in ethiopia the other time they stand they spend their time in djibouti so it's hard yeah. to separate the kind of people who lives on which side of the border and I, i've been to i've been to djibouti i have not been to eritrea i can't speak of eritrea but i think uh, uh, the people of djibouti deserve better i mean the the country first of all they whenever you go to even the supermarkets or the, wherever you see affluent people where they, they shop I don't think those are meant for the Djiboutians themselves, but the foreign armies of, I think there is America there, there is China, there is the French. If imagine, imagine all those people, they, they, I don't think they have any other base as near uh, to, to to the others in 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 Djibouti. That's all I had to say for now. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point. Go on. Uh, one of the things uh, you said uh, you don't know about Eritrea. Uh, Eritrea, as everybody knows, uh, uh, as an independent country, and right after the independence, uh, has been blackballed, uh, blacklisted, uh, become the number 13 terrorist country. <laughs> and I don't see where the terrorism comes, but it's, it's believed during that training for Somalian armies uh, that went through the uh, Eritrean uh, training, and eventually uh, Al Shabaab showed up out of that camps. You know, out of that training, and they went separate ways, and Eritrea became a target for being uh, supporting a terrorist group, which uh, Eritrea never had the intention to uh, support a terrorist group, but to work with Somalians and trying to bring uh, a good relation between Eritrea and uh, Somalia. And you know, there's a good gap in between. You have Ethiopia, and Ethiopia at that time it was during the TPLF regime they make sure that Eritrea has been targeted for all the sanction terrorism act, all that, because they got their own personal agenda to push. Uh, the minute uh, it says, President it says, what he said is, any African country should be self-sustaining. Don't depend on the handouts. 
if they come to help you, make sure that you are in the project, you participate, you get trained, um, and you, you follow through, but never been bought out. You know, they had uh, this policy that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, Eritrea has the military service. So everybody's conscripted to uh, serve in the military. You got like six month hardcore training, then you got another 18, total about 18 months of civil service. So that means every Eritrean will go different part of Eritrea without uh, a sense of tribalism, but as Eritreans. And everybody welcomes them as Eritrean, regardless religion, regardless of your uh, your race, your descent, or ethnic group. Nothing that doesn't that doesn't work in Eritrea. So the first thing that he did is to change the narrative that instead of okay, I'm from Eritrea, and I'll say maybe I'm Bilin from Eritrea. No, you're Eritrean. Period. Eritrea is big. This big country is your country. So that narrative. Uh, really made a quick change and it, it can replicate the same model because Eritrea has nine, a nine different ethnic group, but they're all one. There's no such discussion about ethnic differences. So Eritrea can be a good example for all nation in Africa that if you are Tanzanian, don't come with your trouble thing, you're Tanzanian and you should embrace everybody in tanzania if you're kenyan you're kenyan there's no kukuyu there's no they exist it, all respect cultural everything but when it comes to the uh to be the uh eritrean you sworn to say you're eritrean that's it so now he's got that he's going to influence other other uh african countries the self-reliance self-sustaining country and proven with all the sanction with everything Eritrea is still debt free isn't that amazing so he knows something yes. how, how to run you know there's other controversial things that might come but overall you know having maintaining a country debt free that shows you so, so many uh things that works and it can get better, you know, but we just don't want to uh, take money where we cannot handle to pay back. So his idea is to bring that horn at peace from Eritrea all the way to Kenya and goes all around Sudan. And South Sudan is always there. Uh, and North Sudan also, they got a good relation. But right now, the problem. Problem. Yeah, what from, if I may ask? I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry to talk, but I was just gonna ask, what country are you from? I'm 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 born Ethiopian, but I'm from Eritrea. Oh, okay. So I got both, <laughs> and um, yeah. I've seen it uh, during the uh, the wars. I've seen it after the wars, and I have some question myself and the question was being answered for me and then it just took a, a few more years to come to this conclusion uh when it comes you know the major uh issue is about conscription in the military and he already saw it that this thing is going to come and bite because tplf already uh launched several attempts to uh get rid of the Eritrean government and if it was not for that force that he built to protect the country by now would have been a, in a different uh, story and you can see it now they they really uh, Eritrean in general uh, we're very peaceful people uh, we work we believe in work we, we believe in collaboration and a lot of the businesses in Ethiopia in fact was uh, Eritrean businesses when they got deported it showed a lot of a, a lot of holes when it comes to major uh, contracts and uh, import exports and um uh that that aspect itself uh coming out from the italian colony and becoming independent now it, going forward with this new life and he's got the red sea really a, a, a critical a critical location which is the asset and 
to as uh, from Asab to Masawa is the most strategical uh, space uh, for any uh, power that wants to take over to run the world, literally, because that would be the ideal place instead of Djibouti. And Eritrea said no. Eritrea is open for the rest of African countries, but not when it comes to to the empires, put it that way. He refused that. You can do business if they open up and lay low the weapon. Anytime they come in, they come in with a weapon. They come in with a, a different narration, even to to sanction people at an individual base. And then it's sad. But again, he's he's still uh, from uh, from Eritrea perspective. He wants that horn to be united. He wants to help put one military that can help one another. And that is a no-no, as you all know. So that's what I have to say about Eritrea. Eritrea is very peaceful. And uh, if you visit in Eritrea, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it's specific, like I can say, you know, when when you got uh, uh, thefts and stuff like that, uh, uh, gangster or, or, or having some kind of uh, a crime, and the crime rate is so low. A lady can walk around anywhere in in, in uh, major cities and still nothing bother her. Even the brothers are respectful of the sisters. Of course, they will escort them. They will walk them. Uh, very, uh, very friendly. It's, it's some place that even BBC wrote about a piece saying this is a weird country because he didn't get robbed. People didn't steal his... His car is open. He's got cameras. He's got uh, uh, travelers checks and everything else. And he was so scared that somebody robs him. But he went in there. The only thing that he's got is dust, because he kept the uh, the, uh, the window rolled down, and you can see everything. His uh, cameras, rigs, everything. Nobody touched it. So he said, "This is kind of weird." <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> "Yeah, because uh, yeah, you go in England." They'll rob you blind, but not in Eritrea. That's that's how much I know about Eritrea. Um, brother, can I ask a follow-up question, if you don't mind? Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask, um, obviously, we're all witnessing how Eritrea are unfairly being treated by the Western Alliance. Um, you know, how, you know, the, the negative image they're portraying. Um, again, my, my thoughts, our prayers are with the people of Eritrea, you know, very courageous people living through. But I want to ask, like, how is the country surviving with so much sort of um, blockage by the Western bloc in terms of economy? Do you, I know you talked about the debt being debt free, but what about the economy? Is it growing? Is there a lot of development happening in that country? And then my follow up question to that also is, um, how are Eritreans viewing um, the situation in Somalia, especially the, the last president, President Formaggio? How is he viewed and what sort of interest is there within Eritrea towards Somalia? Uh, yeah, the, uh, let, let's go back on certain uh, certain things that he did uh, when it comes uh, number one in, in Africa is food security. Okay, food security uh, came as a number one because uh, Eritrea suffered a drought two years and then we had the rains. So he ended up by building over seven, uh, 700 uh, small dams where they were able to irrigate and produce. So the year after year, they were able to uh, irrigate and control the food crop. So now, if you are really independent in the food crop, then the West cannot really uh, come and bribe you for, uh, you know, we can give you this and that. That's a self-sustaining, okay? Uh, he did a lot of changes. Uh, we found gold. And Eritrea is so funny. On top of the sanction, they found gold. From gold, we found potash, which he used now for the, I mean, the country got blessed after, after Biggie, one another. Biggie, Biggie, uh, the gold and the potash empires. Can you talk about even the way you structured the deal in such a way that 
you know, the external miners have to give much bigger share to the yes. country than any other country. So yeah. any country. Yes, yeah, so it's not it just that you found it, but you it. even made a yeah. deal that made allowed you to generate wealth internally. Right? Absolutely, absolutely, because he didn't he didn't take that uh, uh, the way they come in and oh you know this is what we give uh, somewhere else and he said this is Eritrea, this is what I want, you're in or you're out, and that's how he dealt with them. There was no if or but about it, and usually it's like uh, in the forty five. 45, 65, something, uh, 45, 55, something like that. And some of the deal that they have is probably about in the 40s. You don't get that uh, in different other uh, countries. So he's got the model, okay? He's got the model on how to mine and how to get these people in and out and how you can get the best out of it. So do you think they're going to want that guy to uh, go around the African nations and uh, show them how it gets, it gets done? I don't think so. So that's one of the things that they want to cripple Eritrea because uh, he uses his own human resource within the country. Everything that comes is produced within the country. His import is very limited. He doesn't talk about having luxury items. There are certain things that he changed. Some, sometimes people, you know, looking at it from a, a free country, whatever, people start uh, uh, blaming him, but he makes change. And his change make change really, and you can see it. Like anything that you import, luxury, all that, you know, it's it's, it's limited. And if you do, you're gonna pay a real high price for the luxury item, because now you, you're ripping the uh, uh, hard currencies and the business. It, it doesn't interfere. You, even for some rules where, hey, you know, this is not permanent. But at least to go ahead with the bear, with the growth, it limits certain uh, inputs that that are not essential for the country. So that's what he's dealing. He has he has a good model, and uh, that model, to the minimum, if it is applied across Africa, you see changes, and they don't want that. They don't want to see a president that's going to be going all other countries. In fact, he spoke to several uh, African leaders, and some of them are making some changes. They're making the changes, trying to stay away from these loans. Because these are the loans that's going to be talk. So if you limit our import on something that we can fabricate locally, she save a lot of money and you don't need to borrow. It's identification. The West is so influential through TV commercials and things like that. Oh, I want that. You know, you're a billionaire in Africa. Oh yeah, you know, I want, uh, I want this one. Hey, it's not bad uh, to one in one, but at the same time, if you, if uh, 10, 15 of you wants the same thing, there goes uh, your currencies, you know, and uh, now you bring that up. You got this Lamborghini parked in your car as a car, for example. You know, and that Lamborghini really hurt the country because you spend something that is just luxury while your country is trying to grow and trying to do better economically, wealth, all that. You see, Isaiah's built wealth within the country. A lot of other African countries, they're not building wealth. They're choosing to go after the money, but the money, in order to get it, you're losing a lot. Basically, they tell you to jump, you're going to have to ask how high. So Isaiah's never let that happen to his country, including NGOs that came in. Oh, okay, we're going to want to help on this. Okay, what's the project? He didn't say, I don't want no NGO. I don't want any help. But when you come in, you're going to have to show another Eritrean how it gets done. And then after you leave, 
when you leave, you don't get your laptop back. It stays. It stays in the country. What they do is they compensate you for the cost of the laptop, period. So there's no, uh, what you call, uh, as an NGO going in there and get some other secret stuff. You've got it stored in your laptop and all that. All that is, uh, is controlled. Because, uh, I, I mean, uh, absolutely. If any of you look at these uh, interviews, there's I don't think there's any African leader that speaks the same. I remember one time the, the World Bank decided to help Eritrea, and I say help in quote unquote. Uh, and he told them, yes, you are open, you are you are you are welcome to help, but we have the data ourselves. And they say, no, we're not going to go with your data. This is data we have on the country. And he said, you. how do you have data for Eritrea? And if you've never been to Eritrea, exactly. and, you know, they went on at how they have the ways and means. I mean, if you look at the history, Isaias himself used to carry a Somali passport in the 70s and the 80s. And I'm saying the history of Eritrea and, and, and Somalia is not one of sanctions that started in, in, in 2008 something. And when the sanctions were placed on Eritrea, you know, the, the long reigning uh, TPLF had a system in power. The right. system was that when they, when they went to Somalia, uh, the TPLF went to, invaded Somalia not went to Somalia, they didn't go on a holiday. When they invaded Somalia and the Somali resistance took up arms, the Somali, yep. uh, the, I, the Islamic Scott Union that ruled Mogadishu were for the most part moderate. And when the extreme faction uh, took up arms and rebranded to Al-Shabaab, the whole Somali opposition moved to Eritrea. So it doesn't yep. help that one wing was moderate, the other was extreme hardliners. So the sanctions they... placed on Eritrea were on behalf of the faction that was extreme. Mm -hmm. And and thankfully, the, the sanctions were, were I think, uh, taken off Eritrea in 2018, only to be put back in 2020. And now the sanctions Eritrea, are, uh, the sanctions are not on Eritrea itself, but the the party in, in power, the PFDG, whatever, whatever yeah. I don't think, they, I am not sure of the title. The They're initial, putting on Shabia. PDFJ. They call Shabia. Yeah. Yeah, so. exactly, Shabia. And even whenever you go back to Somali videos, you know, when Somali got independence, not most of us were not happy with how things were running down in Eritrea. You can also see many of the uh, Eritrea, uh, Ethiopian uh, groups, like the TPLF itself, Isaias and, and Melis lived in the same apartment building, complete, uh, the same villa in, in Mogadishu to be exact. And he did come back to the villa in 2018. And there were political refugees in Somalia. The, you yes, know, Somali yes. government gave them refugee like to come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah in Somalia. Yeah, and they both carried a Somali passport. Uh, there is a famous photo of a uh, uh, in Mogadishu and in 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 Paris. Well, most of these leaders himself used to live in Mogadishu. There's a, some time. There's some time Somalia used to be the the nexus of East Africa. And when I talk about the relations of Eritrea and Somalia, they go way back, even yeah. during colonial don't forget, times. Don't forget, had uh, as... don't forget, don't, don't forget, Somalia and Ethiopia had that massive war. And, massive and war in, in 64 and in yeah. 77 as well. Yeah, so that yeah. massive war yeah. had a part to play in it. And then you can imagine the devastation that happened to both sides uh, as a result of that. So. So there's, a, there's that element of the history. I mean, if you go to that history, but but Isaias is is a different person, and and you can tell he's uh, he they were once together. TPLF and Isaias, his party were once together because they figured, you know, what's standing in our way was the government of Ethiopia, the the character of Ethiopia. But Isaias is a different person right now. He wants to see a much stronger, a much more united Ethiopia. And TPLF mm -hmm. wants to continue a much divided, a much weaker Ethiopia. I think to me, like I want to step in a little bit into these discussions. I know uh, the details are very interesting, very fascinating. But uh, if Pastor uh, Ezra, His Excellency, would allow me uh, to step in and then really, uh, really like take this uh, this conversation to another direction, and uh, not another direction, but kind of like 
maybe yeah, add a little bit of dimension to the composition that we're having. And I want everybody else to take on this. But I think to me, the problem is not just that we don't know what's wrong with Africa, what's wrong with Somalia, what's wrong with, with our leaders, what's wrong with the way the external powers uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, negative role in, in our continent and our affairs. This is you know, I mean, are there enough of us out here who can detail that out? And you go to channel after channel, platform after platform, be it public, private. The conversation always circles around. They say like, you know, if they don't do this, if they did this, if they did this, we talk at length, and I call this death by analysis. We are dying because of we are too focused on the weeds of it. I mean, I know the details matter. I know the details of uh, earlier there was a debate about the nature and the form of what was uh, what was the division, what, where was the source of the division between Somaliland and the rest of Somalia and how that is. This, the, those details do matter. But the broader picture get lost because we focus so much on it, exclusively to it. We overanalyze, we overextend ourselves in trying to demonstrate, I know, I know, I know, I know. But we forget that it's not just knowledge that we're lacking. We are lacking the wisdom. Wisdom is about seeing a future, imagining a future out of the context and the condition that you already know about. We don't spend enough time trying to visualize and trying to see a future. And that is the thing that, that scared the bejesus out of them. This conversation, this platform that we are having, the thing that scares the power, Sabi, is that we will eventually, after this thing, we get tired of, of analyzing, analyzing, and detailing, and facts, and discussing, and dissecting. And we begin to fall in love with each other. We begin to respect each other. We begin to see each other as humanity. And then we we'll stop this, you know, tiny little fights and little fiefdoms, and we we'll begin to make connections and we we'll begin to make the uh, the reconstruct that we need, uh, or the blueprint that we need to construct uh, the future that we deserve to have. They they are afraid of that's the eventual destination of that. So you have to look at so instead of just like looking at you know, just uh, what the fact, what is the prevailing fact? What is the history? What, is, you know, was Somali right or wrong in the Ethiopia war? The Ethiopians will say, oh my God, Somalians invaded us. And the Somalians will say, no, oh my God, we were trying to return what was rightfully ours. And instead of dealing with that kind of these things, there's a better place where we can actually find a much better common ground. But the, the powers that be, want us to stay in the weeds of details like that. That's what they want us to do. So yes, so, that, so and if we are in that place, then we are stuck there. It's, got, it's, it's a muddy, sticky area where you get stuck because it's, it's, you're looking at the past. You're not looking at the present. You're not looking at the future. You're looking at the past, a past, and then you will be stuck like a, uh, like a, uh, like a statue looking at that past never really truly understanding because you never lived it. You never experienced it. You only see that what is written, what is told to you, what is propagated to you. So we get, so we die by analysis. So I suggest we start seeing the things inverse. We start inversing things a little bit. We have to answer, this. why is Djibouti so important? Why is Djibouti so important for China? that the only base, military base they have in the world is in Djibouti. Why is that? It must have been some value that we, you know, we even ourselves Djiboutians are not realizing that we possess. Then a Djiboutian will say, you know what? I would negotiate a much better deal. I will, inter I, I will step up my, my analysis, my understanding, and I will be much more insightful in my relationship with the world and my relationship with my neighbors. Then I was, and then I will make it count for much better than just a trinket, trinket of, or some kind of uh, breadcrumbs that comes your way, a stadium or some highway 
or some refurbishing of a port. No. If China believes the Djibouti is that important, it's so important, it changes their policy. Their, imagine China had to change their long held policy to actually do this. And then it must have been so critical. And then all these other countries, they see so much critical value in Djibouti. They see so much critical value in Eritrea, so much critical value in Yemen. They would bomb that, those countries to death or they would get them involved in civil war that could uh, uh, eliminate generation, whole generations. Or they could push countries in extreme amount of division to an extent that they can't even see their own brother and sisters together in the case of Somalia. So, they, so why are they doing that? Because, I mean, they, they, you have to see what are they seeing in us, in our region, in our people, in our possibility, in our potential, that gets them to come thousands of miles and do what they're doing. And if you ask that question and you get to the answer, you realize that the fact that there are Somalis in Ethiopia and the fact that there are Somalis in Kenya for Somalia is not a problem anymore. Somalia would not be bothered about trying to uh, co reconstitute the Grand Somalia, which would be would cause more conflict between the region. Rather, we we'll try to first say how can we like utilize our presence in all these regions to influence policy in Ethiopia, and influence policy in Kenya in a manner that benefit the people in that area. And the people in our, in our side, so it becomes much more intelligent, much more, much more thoughtful, much more wis w w wisdom filled, insightful filled. It's not just the knowledge that oh, well, my people are dispersed. It becomes the knowledge that we are in a world in a much more interconnected world. We can we can have trade ten times more than what we have right now, so that we can create ten times more jobs than we have right now. Then so we can create a much robust relationship and network of power within the region to, the, to an extent. So you look at Eritrea and Eritrea's, Eritrea's struggle right now, you know, Isaias, he's so preoccupied in this one. Isaias has already figured out what is internally, but he realized he hit the ceiling with Eritrea. He hit the ceiling because the region is so in disintegrated. The region is so embroiled in unnecessary conflict and tensions, and the region has been it has been sold and bought by oh, the you know the malign actors internal actors the corrupt actors internally that are that 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 fall for trinkets. TPLF is an organization that f that survives on on those breadcrumbs, and you know and then they are powerful. There are people that that benefit that profit from that. I mean, if 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 America is giving Ethiopia. One billion dollars a year, I guarantee you, is meaningless for Ethiopia. Ethiopia needs every year at least a hundred billion dollars to actually meaningfully transform itself. But Ethiopia gets, in the best time, five billion dollars a year of aid. But it needs in the range of hundred billion dollars. So what you realize is that the, the five billion dollars that comes from EU, all of these countries, is to buy powers to buy the powers that be, to buy the key to get, get openers, to, to influence politics. That's all it does. There's nothing more. They're not there to eradicate some hunger or poverty. No, they are there to buy power. The same thing in Somalia, the same thing in Djibouti. So we have to say to ourselves, right, we need to really, so uh, to conclude, I will conclude with this, and I want the people to think about it, and I want people to really, um, yeah, I, uh, I want people to really imagine the thing from a reverse point of view. From a reverse point of view. Why is, are we so important? Why are we so valuable? To a point where countries do go so far as sending military to our country, into our, in our region, and setting up bases. You know, when you set up bases, that means you're staying here for a long term. Why is that so important? And that tells you how much worth you are. We are worth more than what we ascribe ourselves to be. 
We are way worth much worth worth more, more than Djibouti's economy doesn't depend on the basis. It depends on the economy, its relationship with Ethiopia. Most of Djibouti's trade is Ethiopia. It depends on elect with electricity in Ethiopia. Ethiopia depends exclusively on Djibouti. But Ethiopia's economy is ten times less than it could be. If Ethiopia's economy is ten times less than it could sorry be sorry to check brother E. Yes. I was yes. gonna also yes. point out um with Djibouti is not just the Ethiopian thing, it also has the shipments, also it gets money from the protection that it provides no, the European the countries with the No 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 the but, numbers, the numbers, look at the numbers, look at the data. Yeah, yeah this I'll, I'll send you a, a new source. Um where it also um basically sends um you know protects the uh the European interest like the oil, the gas and the natural resources yeah, that is going yeah, up to the those they don't pay you enough for that. You'd be surprised. No, no, every, brother, everything's done behind the scenes. With the Americans, they don't do everything up front. Just like they wanted to attack Ethiopia, they never said up front. No, they tried to make Djibouti. Tell you that, that Djibouti as a nation benefits exactly the power they are playing, exercising. That's the point I'm making to you. Yeah, I understand what you're trying to say, but yeah. not everything's done up front. With, no, you no, know, no, no, I'm not talking about the upfront data, uh, the back data, the front data. It doesn't matter. What I'm trying to tell you is that, like, the powers that be that are using Djibouti to do those work, they are using them as cheap labor. They're not using them as, you know, you know, a relevant active participant of the region with interest, their own national interest. They're using you as you're just a, a means to an end. So, and a, but but that end, what is that end they're looking for? What is so seven hundred? Billion dollars of trade goes through that that region, that area. At least seven hundred billion. That's a, the least amount of number that we know. Through the that the the that triangle right there, the Yemen Djibouti Eritrea triangle. And and in that kind of trade going through, any other place will benefit much more than that. You go to Asia, that kind of trade impacts hugely. The region, Philippines to Vietnam to Bangladesh, India, all, all of these countries that benefit extremely from that kind of Indonesia. Why isn't Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Somalia benefiting from that kind of power? That's the question. The Who, problem with us Horners is is not just the concept of you know uh, benefiting uh, from the such things. Again, you have to understand they studied us. The Europeans have an advantage. They studied the Horn. No, they, they don't understand have an advantage. It's, we no, 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 I'll explain why. I'll explain why. No, in terms of in terms of like the they have an advantage because they understand the weakness of the Horners. They understand they can't break us by militarily going inside um, our countries because they've tried and they failed. The Italians failed with the the uh, the Ethiopian Habashas. The uh, the the Americans failed with the the Somalis. They understood they can't beat us. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of warfare. Yeah. Because we've got that history in terms of warfare. Yes. But they also found out that they can beat us another way, which is tribe. They can beat the the people of the horn by using tribe against tribe, and they, yeah, but, they, that's what I'm saying. They have an advantage what, because the they understand is, that. The question is, the question is, we understand that a lot of people understand that. The question is, why do they do that? Why, the, what is the, the benefit? Reformers? What is the benefit they're driving? That I want us to focus more on the benefit they're driving. That tells you how much we are valued. The, because they value that they derive from the region. And it's so much more than what we tell ourselves of the value that we have. And if we realize how much we are valued, then we don't get in the weeds of which tribe, what tribe, those things. Those things become almost non-existent. Then the Afari and the Somali are of the same family, descendant of the same family. They don't have to fight each other. But because they realize there's a much bigger prize to be won. And then, so so the very thing that they are going after is the very thing that we should be going after. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Ezra, they're, they're, trying, they're trying to control the, the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden and keep India out. They've been having this competition between India and China for um, investment and influence in the area. Yeah. So they're trying to control that region. Yeah, China, they're trying to control for China, what? China's the, the main focus. Hi, hi what are they Can trying to control? The trade. The economy, the benefit that, that goes through that, the, whatever power that res, resides there is so important, right? Isn't it important? It's so critical. It's not just important, it's strategic for these countries. For China, it's strategic. It must have been strategic for them to actually abandon their non interference 
non-involvement in the world militarily to open the only base in outside China, in Djibouti. It must be. So, so then the, what, what I'm trying to tell you that whatever China is valuing, it must be much greater. It, it, is, it is, is much greater than you what see, you brother, and I I was going to ask you a question. Yeah. You see, sorry to interrupt again, brother. Um, you have to understand why do you think all of these military bases are in Djibouti? Because they understand that's the most strategical country in the whole. Because it gives access to too many things. That's why they're not going to all these uh, these other countries or investing as have like or like in terms of investing heavily into putting a military base that they understand Djibouti is the closest to the Arabian Peninsula. Like, literally, they would you go to certain have Eritrea over Djibouti. I guarantee you that. No, no, they don't. They want to go for uh, uh, Djibouti because Djibouti literally controls the access. Access point of the Red Sea. It literally yeah, controls. Like, yeah, but, it controls so many different. Look, see, your Eritrea is the Red Sea, nothing more. While Djibouti controls the entrance of the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden. Yeah. It also, uh, no, but, even though it's not exactly the Red Sea, I mean, it's close enough to the Red Sea because you, you know um, you they understand Somali is not going to be in that equation. No, no, no. You, what you don't understand is that what you don't understand that, like, you want they, they, if if it was up to them, they will control everything. Given that they cannot control everything, which you pointed out earlier, due to all sort of prevailing conditions, they control the what's called the low-hanging fruit, the easiest one to control. You know, Djibouti was supposed to be back into Ethiopia's uh, because it was a lease, a 99-year lease. And I think it was 1988, it was supposed to be back joining into reunion with the, with the rest of Ethiopia. That had to, be, to be fair, to be fair, Djibouti throughout history was never exactly a part of Ethiopia. To make no, a fair no, point. No, no, no. Like there was like there was no so, hey, exist if you're looking at history, don't understand the word history from the from the perspective of nation state. Nation state didn't exist until the nineteenth century. There was no nation called a nation state. There no, I'm no, talking no, about like, historically influence. even before that, like the yeah, father had that was never exactly that, no, there was influence that expands and shrinks. So there was a time there was influence, there was a time there was no influence. But but I'm talking about the mechanics of it. When the uh, the lease was agreed with uh, Emperor Menelik in exchange for the railway building. It was supposed to be 99 years also lease to the French. And the French, when uh, that lease was about to end, they organized an, uh, an independence movement for Djibouti, which Egypt, uh, Djibouti had, and Ethiopia didn't have a problem with that. Because, like you said, Ethiopia didn't yeah, have Magusu, a problem with that. Literally, but, Magusu but, got money. But, see, that's the he point. Money but that's it. the point I'm making. We are, we are getting distracted with the details like this, right. and we're ignoring the real crack of why we are having a problem, which is we don't value ourselves as much as the rest of the world value us. That's it. Oh, can I just I say think, one thing? I think if, if we get lost in the details, none of us would have known the 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 the, the, the contract that you're telling us about i think it's strange to some of us even speaking now history is a signpost for the future if you don't know where you're coming from i don't think you know where you're heading to but there are too now, many stuff. we understand too many we understand we understand, we, understand yeah. we cannot we cannot go back and change the history or we cannot be revisionist in our thinking yes. or we cannot have a selective reading of history but something we have to all agree on is we've been dealt badly you you yes. spoke about many i don't think many of many somali people even to this day have a, have an, a favorable opinion of Menelik and all his policies. If you if you and if you remember if you've been to history class, you will know that part of the Somali land was signed away to Ethiopia. And when the nation state came to us about 120 years ago, none of us knew where the borders would be drawn. We had our own fiefdoms and tribal kingdoms that we try and revert back to every time there's a there's a problem. Look at look no further than the the, the, the TPLF. When they were in power, they wanted all oh, federal Ethiopia, 13 regions, or whatever, seven regions. Now they want an independent Tigray. You see, everyone that's comes not, from a village. No, but it's, it's everybody there's a lot of smoke, it. though. What let's I'm trying me, to tell you is that there's too much smoke. There's too much smoke and very little facts, very little truth in there and, and, and among ourselves. So there's a lot of smoke there. Let me give you one of the things about uh, Minilik. Uh, Biggie will back me up on this one. The population of, Min uh, the population of Ethiopia, when we're fighting... The, the Italian. Italians it was around four or five million people. Four million. Four million people. That's it. That's the context of history, which is completely different from a, a context of history that's a uh, uh, hundred and twenty million right now. So, so let, let me give you another context here. The notion of Ethiopia was instituted by Menelik to to say, you know, Abyssinia is too northern. 
the idea of Abyssinia was too northern. We need to be much more historic in our embrace of uh, broader ethnic groups, tribes, and religion. So the, they sat down and thought about and reconstituting the next uh, this thing. So the the constitution of Ethiopia, the way Ethiopia was constituted, the term Ethiopia was supposed to refer a much broader, a much more Afrocentric approach. And then, so the British and the Italians and the, and the French quickly came to uh, to bargain with uh, Menelik and say, you know what, we'll give you this if you don't stop, if you don't inspire the Somalis for their independence, if you don't inspire the Kenyans for their independence, if you don't inspire the Sudanese for their independence, that and then you know the Italian and the Eritrean for the independence, then we can give you much more territory. We give you this. So in exchange, so was the tit for that. So those things were, were dealt, but the time and the space, the conditions were different. So the, the reason I say it doesn't like like the details are important. You're right. They are they are facts that are useful for converting. They are that's right. But that's what is more important is why are we so deeply troubled by the external forces is because the external forces are trying to grab something from you they're trying to take something from you and what what i'm trying to tell us what is that something that that they're taking that we should be having and that's the conversation that's a much more powerful conversation that's the wisdom that's where the wisdom lies that's where the insight lies because it's not going to be revealed to you. Nobody's going to reveal to you. Nobody's Absolutely. going to tell you. This is what I, that's what I want. Americans are not going to tell you this is what we want. They're not going to give you the fact and the evidence. Not, you're not going to research this and find this. You have to have the wisdom to be able to say, you know, if they are here, there must be something that I haven't realized that I have. Then what is that? Thing? So then, then you start to you put in the necessary effort and initiative to put together the, so that's what Eritrea has done. But Eritrea has realized they see the healing. <coughs> so Eritrea has been working closely with Ethiopia in trying to create and change the, the landscape. They've got Ethiopia on their corner. Ethiopia is on the side with Eritrea on this one. Because now Eritrea realized, okay, I have re achieved that degree of independence for myself, but I'm hitting a ceiling in terms of expansion and growth and possibilities. So, so hence, by adding Ethiopia, this large juggernaut, by reorienting. The other day, the Ethiopian foreign minister gave a nine-month review to the, the foreign committee in the parliament. He said that our conflict started, well, no, I didn't, I'm not saying anything literally, but he outlined why Ethiopia is having a problem. The internal problem or the external problem is because we've started to reorient our foreign policy to serve our interests. He said that we talked to these Red Sea people and say, like, you are here implementing policy on Red Sea, but Ethiopia is not on the table on Red Sea. That's unacceptable. And that is the, the thing that caused the Europeans and Americans to begin to wonder, no, this is this is a this is a this is a government that doesn't serve our interests because TPA left kept quiet about what they were doing in Red Sea. In fact, not just kept quiet, it went out of the way to please them by going to places like Somalia and then killing and destroying and being the, what to call the mercenary on the ground for them and, 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 and politicizing the region in such a way that the region doesn't get into a, a point of, a, a, into an, a set of action. Somalia is so debilitated right now, it cannot even act in its, in its own interest. I'm literally at, at the inauguration of the presidency, the European Union flag sits there next to them like as if the Europeans are putting a stamp on the uh, on the presidency. What the heck is that? So new so, modern so, imperialism. Yeah, we're, so, we're, yeah, we're not so we're not very happy with the situation in Somalia, and and yeah. hopefully we go in the right direction of solving that. But I think the broader region, we all have problems within ourselves, and I think uh, Eritrea and, and Djibouti as matter in an aspect that they've taken care of what is inside. What's ailing them is uh, the outside uh, influence. If you, if you, if you allow me, you have made very good points. We we get lost so much on the analysis, but also, e, I, I, we have to remember that we don't we don't get along much each other. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a known fact. The whole world knows we 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 yeah, we're sort of painted as primitive people, backwards people, tribal people, feudal. I would even say, 
But yeah. most of these depictions, these people would not have these ideas if they didn't see us quarrel each and every time. You see an Ethiopian, a fellow Ethiopian cannot get along with another Ethiopian, let alone Ethiopian and Eritrean. And when I, what I commend and, and respect about President Esaias and Eritrea is that even Eritrea itself, I, I have several times I have watched Air TV, the national TV, and they speak every other language that there is. The, the president himself, I've had him speak Arabic, and I've had him speak, I, I had him speak, he's a Christian himself, but he, I, I've seen him wish Muslims, you know, on their festivities. Looking at the region, there might be variables, variables that are not same as the, the ones that existed, but they're constants. There's the religious, there's the religious aspect of it. There is the ideological aspect of it. Many of the Shabi and Eritreans were, were, were communist and, and were Marxist. Sorry, at the time of Eritrea's inception. But you see, sometimes we all look, we all look at the fact in European thing of how accounts about Menelik and the population of Ethiopia at the time. But one of the factors that we, we, we believe, and, and this is might be a selective reading of history again, is that when the Europeans came, and he was basically told not to inspire these quote-unquote other Africans to, to rise up and, and, and rebel against the white men, they also saw him as a, a Christian ruler in a sea of Mohammedans. You have to remember the region was Muslim before even Mecca itself and was Christian before the Vatican. So the imperialists will not have had their way had we not divided among had we not been divided along those lines so some of some i think some sometimes we give them too much credit they don't get uh, they don't get into us into affairs if you don't allow them we are very saddened about the european union flag in somalia you know a country like sweden or denmark sometimes i don't know where this happens they they send letters condemning the somali leadership as if, as if we are answerable to the king of Sweden. That's a culture we would like to end, and hopefully we'll see less of it, if not outright, total abolition of it. You see, you made a good point where you mentioned um, the, the Europeans also basically understand, oh, the, the, you talked about the region within itself and how the Horn of Africa, you know, were one of the earliest Muslims and also one of the earliest Christians too. Um, you understand the, the Europeans also understand that region has one of the um, the oldest people to walk on the face of the planet, and also that region within Africa has um, you know one of the oldest cultures and history. So the Europeans also have studied that region. They understand. They understand about that. They understand the region and how to divide it. And again, it's our fault for playing it to their hands, because again, as they mentioned. Um, uh, as the, the brother mentioned, uh, I forgot your name, the one that was speaking before me, brother. What was your name, if I may say so? I'm Zakir, dear brother. Zakir? Zakir. Uh, oh, Zakir. Okay, Zakir. Okay. As brother Zakir said, um, uh, some uh, Ethiopians can't get along, let alone Ethiopian and Eritreans. Somalis can't get along. Northern Southern Somalis can't even stand each other. I mean, you have to understand that basically they un they basically understand um, because again we rather side with the Europeans than see eye to eye. We'd basically side with the enemy and then actually sit down, have a talk and a conversation. And it always comes down to the same old route. What we always do, we when we have a dispute, we go back to our tribal areas and we start a fight. This applies for both. It doesn't matter if you're Habash or Somali. Like it always ends up the same play. Look at what's happening with the TPLF. They started a fight with the Ethiopian nations and now they're going back to the Tigray, Tigray region and their people are suffering because of their consequences, because of their actions. I mean, look at look at what's happening. You have to see that the action that they're playing. You have to see that. See, this is the problem with the Horn of Africa. We will fight and we will fight, but we not see the bigger picture. We're not, we, don't, we don't understand. We don't understand. We're basically, we, we refuse to see the bigger picture unless uh, basically things go our way. We're not, we're not ready to compromise. And that is the problem. That is one of the key problems, compromisation. Unless the people yeah. within the yeah. horn learn to compromise. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Abi. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think yeah. that also well, to... can, can I just, just, just uh, uh, interrupt you there? Um, we'll come back to this uh, conversation, uh, but I just want to give, we've got uh, three people that already joined us, and I want to give them a chance to comment or ask a question. 
Um, I'm going to give uh, Leach a chance uh, and then uh, go to two Niger. Then after two Niger, we'll go to Nias. And then I'll give Pai and Wasami. Then we can uh, circulate between um, uh, Prof. Ezra, Biggie, and Zakir. And even yourself, uh, Mo. Uh, uh, Leach, welcome. Uh, yo, what's up, what's up? Uh, how's everyone doing? Uh, all good, all yeah, good, bro. Yeah, I just want to put something on what Mo said. I think as the, as people who live in the Horn, we also have to admit that we have to stop propagating divisions from an early age on the youth. Like, let's be honest, all of our parents, whatever tribe you come from, whatever country you're from, <clears throat> they all teach you about like historical facts. This person did you wrong, this tribe did you wrong, blah, blah, blah. And you find that some of them, most of the things they even tell you is probably not even historically accurate or they've added their own twist to it and so on and so forth. And I feel like this has added a lot to the continuous tribal divisions and divisions amongst the countries and so on and so forth. And I think we also have to start stop that type of practice and start from the home <clears throat> and also all the way to the schools and so on. And yeah, what I came on here for was, uh, I just wanted to talk about uh, the why, why you know, like the Alpha Triangle that we're talking about. We have to understand that that place is one of the most potash rich places in the world apart from Morocco. Morocco pretty much owns 70% of the world's potash reserves. But after that, it's the Afar Triangle. Ethiopia has around 5 billion, if I'm not mistaken, between 5 to 6 billion tons in reserves. Eritrea has around 1.2. Djibouti also has a, a reserves in there. And if anyone knows about potash, it's pretty much the most key uh, <coughs> mineral for industrial farming, fertilizer, so on and so forth. And also helps with the uh, irrigation and soil maintenance and everything and i was saying you know if we could come together as the horn you know let's be honest with ourselves our region is pretty much the famine capital of the world it is pretty much every every year there's at least one region that is in deep famine and people are starving and dying when we have this resource there's no reason why we cannot all come together and create a potash factory where we can turn that into fertilizer where we can use that for our farms and we can no longer need anyone but and we can be self-sufficient in our own food wow great points uh leech uh must say um great points that you've raised there and um while on that i just want to give uh, uh to niger i just want to keep the the conversation flowing um um and then you guys can um uh, respond afterwards after everyone has commented or asked questions uh, 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 Pastor uh, just a uh, point of fact, uh, Moroccan company signed a deal, a $6 billion deal on, for potash mining and fertilized making in between Ethiopia, I think. Uh, and it's a re just a recent news. Just wanted to add to what Lich just said. This is an incredible uh, point that he raised. I, I appreciate that. Really appreciate that, uh, uh, Professor and Lich. For highlighting that and and i think some of the things when we we're going to do the closing we can we can do the uh, uh, uh the good things that are happening in, in the horn of africa and other parts of the continent so i know that there's always sometimes the negative the challenges that we're experiencing but we must also uh, emphasize the good things that are also happening uh, happening there people who are doing great things in those part of our, our continent so in closing we're going to close with good news things that might be happening that a lot of Africans are not aware of, like uh, something that you just mentioned now, uh, Professor. But uh, I'll go to Two Niger now. Uh, welcome, Two Niger. Always a pleasure seeing you. Uh, 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 welcome, uh, Two Niger. It's been a while yeah. since I've been in the same stream as you. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah, and thanks for uh, this thing having me. Um, I think the conversation, everybody seems to have been, you know, they, are, they have the basis mostly covered. Um, if I, I just wanted to add that, you know, if the horn needs to move on from where they are, um, you can see that the patterns uh, that were established before was about, you know, one of the one tribe wants to get one over the other tribe uh, constantly. And um, that that need means that they have to come together one way or the other. They have to have a, a kind of... Um, meeting where they really discuss these things honestly and because um 
in terms of the entire uh, region, they are all poorer for it whenever they try to compete among themselves. And um, so if they understand that, they come to a meeting and discuss this in, uh, this in honestly, you know, somebody, I think it was Mo that said something about compromise. Um, I, I Personally, I'm not even going to see that compromise. <laughs> yeah, I'll just see that common sense. For your, It's your interest. You're not even compromising because in the end, you're going to be richer for it. Um, all the so-called promises that people have been promised that they are going to give them advantage over the other tribes. You're just getting an advantage of poverty. You know, one, one slave uh, having one advantage over another slave. Your people are still not free. So, and I think when we start understanding that, that when we come together and de decide on our fates, we all gain from it. You are not getting, there's no need for one person to get an advantage over the other because you are all going to be richer for it. If you used to have uh, farming today, tomorrow you're not going to have it. If you used to have a GDP of um, 100 billion today, tomorrow it's going to be 500 billion. Because when people work together, their influence and their power is magnified. And if you all understand that in the region, and I think this is not only in that region, obviously it's in Africa as a whole, um, you will start seeing the benefits. And I actually believe that if there is a strategy that the um, uh, horn section, if you see uh, coming in, report it. And uh, mm. we report it within the channel. And, and if but it's him, right? and if it's him, he's going to make a mistake because one way or another, before he triggers his VPN or whatever, there must be footprint. Before he started doing it, there must be footprint. So if you, if somebody reported someone like that to me, I'll track him from when he started um, signing on to the channel. I use, you will get a pattern that meant that it was him. And if it's him, they will knock him off. And even if, I guess, if he goes, if they, even if they knock him off, he could still come online again. So it's not necessarily a solution. And um, if he decides to carry on doing this, there will be consequences either way, because sooner or later, he's going to cross the wrong person. Maybe not me. He's going to cross the right. wrong person and he's going to find himself in the round box. Right. Because it's not nice so, because now some people will have to, like, if you recorded three hours, four hours of um, this in videos, then he will just come wreck it. You may have to delete the entire video. Otherwise, your channel could be that's canceled by YouTube and you can't appeal. Right. So that's how and dangerous that's that said, is. At least, yeah, at least reporting it, I think we're going to use the basic tools that we have available. Report it, report it. And whatever that they try to do, then we have at least justification that we'll be reporting. Yeah, I, I just uh, reported the channel that I just talked about. Right. But uh, still, uh, something that we see that is not with what uh, we're trying to uh, put out there, we still have the right. <laughs> Wait, it. isn't Lila Hersey uh, the same person doing this? <laughs> Yeah, if, if, if it's him that is doing this and he's selling <laughs> Alas to stop Lila it. Lila trying to play yeah. off the victim. Uh, we know it's you. I think, I think it's Lila Hersey, actually. That's the same person. But anyway, shout out to you, uh, Lila. Thank you for not bombing my channel. I respect that. And thank you for donating to it. So shout out to you. It's only your channel that it doesn't bomb. It bombs every other person's channel. And that guy, it <laughs> messes with other people's channel. So it could okay. be damaging other people's channel to promote your channel. And that's not nice. What he's doing out there? <laughs> then uh, Donaja, the defense minister, said, you know, you got to act upon that one. We just put it on you. <laughs> yeah, he, he needs yeah. to stop it. He needs to stop it. I don't know what you I said it before. Before, before, before I was send Nigeria hackers on him, he needs to stop right. it. Can you get back to the topic? Right. Can you get back to the topic? Which Please. is exactly what we don't, we're not supposed to be doing after this. Right. Yeah, so. And Donaja, I'm interested. You are having a nice uh, flow in terms of ideas. And uh, well, I'm, I'm interested in and how we are, you're are going to land this? Yeah, um, as I was saying, every um, um, weapon that they used against us, which was our division, um, can be turned on them, whereby you use your unity against them. Um, because if you are united, they will underestimate you because they've, they've been doing it for 100, uh, over 100 years now. They will underestimate you and they will think that you're going to make a mistake and you're going to buy into whatever they are selling. And um, if they try that they will fail and they will see once a house is together forget it no outside force is going to get through especially you, you see unity is a weapon on its own 
It's a weapon. You don't even need a whole army to do that. If you have agreement between your leaders and you understand, they don't, they, there's no hidden secret about this. It's obvious. Like you said, there has been, uh, someone said there has been a famine in that region. Your people have suffered enough. You've had wars enough. Distrust all over the place. And this will have been, clearly have inflicted it on you. If you just check Wikipedia, you will see all the information there. They will say, oh, I will use the Isas to kick out the um, this tribe. I will use this one to kick this one out. They use our people against each other. And they compromised us. So there, there, it's time for honest conversation and so that we don't try to get one over the other. The only people we need to get one over is the pan-Europeans because they are practicing pan-Europeanism. Don't blame them. They are doing what they have to do to protect their own interests. When are you going to practice your own pan-Africanism or pan-Hornism where you can protect your own area for yourselves? Because your children are suffering because of it. Your, your, your lives are not better off because of uh, the, uh, the advantage they are taking of that region. The same thing applies to all African regions. I think it's time for honest conversation. If we start having honest conversations, that will allow us to start knowing where the, um, the other tribes, where we stand with the other tribes. And once you know where you stand with the other tribes, you're all in strong agreement on what you need to do. I don't think anybody is going to get in between you then. They won't be able to, especially not recently where they always underestimate um, our people because they feel that we are always divided all the time so I, I will start from serious conversation because the history has suggested that there's a lot of distrust in that region a lot of distrust between clans and if you don't talk about it if you don't fight about it if if the leaders refuse the people should demand it enough is enough you have suffered enough you have all the resources there. Even without the portage, you have a lot of resources there already. You shouldn't be poor. There is no reason why the people can come together, have a clear discussion, because it's because of this suspicion. Just understand this. This suspicion is the reason why you're having issues. You all suspect each other. You all don't trust each other. And that's why they take advantage. Like now, they can, they can kick one military base out of uh, Djibouti. They will just move to Somaliland. This is what they do. Because Somaliland will be thinking, you know what? Ah, at last I'll get uh, all the perks that Djibouti was getting. Now I'll get the $1 billion that they are giving me. You forget that the $1 billion you are selling your people off. This is the same thing that they do. Um, in Mali, they kick the French out of Mali. Even a UN mission, they kick a UN mission out of Mali. And that UN mission went to Niger. I was like, what is that? Why would you move from Mali to Niger? You're supposed to leave the continent when they kick you out of where you went for a mission. It tells you that these people are invading us without us even knowing it. They, and they say it all the time. This is the way they come into our countries. This is how they invaded us. This The, the British uh, Defense Minister said it a couple of years ago when the information came out. By the time the information came out, he's already sent troops into Africa. We keep just letting them in. And that's another aspect that we also need to resolve. Before any troops move into our countries, there needs to be a referendum. Re leaders should not have the power just to sign their country away. You can't come, you can't just sign your country away. You just go behind the closed doors and uh, somebody blackmails you and blackmails your people and you sign your country away. And the people just accept that. That needs to stop. If, if it needs to start from the African Union where they pass a law to say before any nation accept foreign troops in, they have to have a referendum in that country. Because African Union is being compromised left and right. Because, because African Union, if you look at the African Union policy, it's actually against military bases. But all the people need to do is go to the countries, talk to the leaders, and the leaders just sign their country away without even consulting. Like over 60% over of the peace and security budget is funded by the EU and the US, not the African Union, though. I don't think they have the power to do that right now. The African Union um, um, operational budget is actually funded by the African continent. The no, no, I'm not talking about the operational budget. I'm talking about the peace and security budget. You talk about yes, the because the security budget that they are funding is the one that favors them. If they feel that they, they want to fund a, 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 this is the forces to come into Somalia, to keep Somalia strong enough not to collapse, but weak enough not to be anything, they will fund that for those forces. 
But because we too want to help Somalia, we have a shared interest. We don't want the country to entirely go crazy. You see what I mean? But it still doesn't mean a good state of existence. You can't exist in a state of, oh, I'm just strong enough not to die, but not healthy enough to actually live. That is not the way to exist. Hence why I'm saying, if we have to understand this and understand that it's in our interest to not hide the, the, this thing, the funny biases and we talk with our side eye all the time. People are dishonest. This is why it's, happening. it's getting to this point. People are just dishonest with each other. Leaders are dishonest. They are not having clear meetings and discussions and telling themselves the truth, knowing that they, are, they have a shared interest in this mess that they are all in. If they were telling themselves the truth, a, a Yoruba man will know that the Hausa man is in the same mess. And a Muslim will know that uh, the Christian is just as brainwashed. And the Christian will know that the Muslim is just as brainwashed. And we will know that we are the ones truly suffering here. The others are just running circles around us. If we decide to discuss honestly and say, you know what? Yeah, I know you like your Islamic stuff. I like my Christian stuff. I like you like your tribe. I like my tribe. But what are we going to do here so that both of us will be able to protect our interests? Because right now, because I want to get one over you, we are all failing. Because you now will be the first person to go and sell us out first. I see that in Nigeria all the time. Can I just support your point? I think we all collectively have to kill the idea of uh, the greater nation. So in Ethiopia, there is the greater Ethiopia where they want to annex uh, Eritrea. And some people still, I mean, they're a minority, but they still believe in that. In Somalia, there's the idea of uh, greater Somalia where they take like the Ogaden region back and I think it goes all the way down to Kenya. We also have to kill that within, like those Somali people have to kill that within their own hearts. We have to kill this idea of the expansion against the, our, our neighbors and to try and mm. subjugate our neighbors. Like that, that has to go from mm. us. Like I know our parents, yes. the older generation might still hold that, but as the newer generation, if we cannot uh, come to an agreement that, that 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 idea should be collectively banned from all, all sides, we can never mm. move forward. And we have to legislate that as well. Yeah, I agree, that, that, Abby, that is true gonna, because they will, sorry, say, sorry, Mo. Because they was because what you just said just now is part of the reason why the other side will not trust the other side that they will not trust Ethiopia and vice versa. Yeah. This is the problem. We have to understand. You all have to understand that the the old ways are pa have passed. <laughs> there is a greater threat that is sitting on top of all of your heads and causing problems amongst of, of you. And thinking about those greater nations is basically saying, you know what? I want to get an interest over this guy because I want to rule them tomorrow. You will never rule. You will never rule anything because people that are going to be ruling are people that are conquering you over and over again. That needs to go, and you are very, very correct. It needs to start from an early age. I don't even care about whether it starts from an early age. The older people need to start understanding that right now. We don't have time. We are out of time. These people, what is happening in the world right now, if it settles, Africa is in serious, serious problems. In an age where they have robotics, they don't even have to bother leaving their country to come and deal with us. If if the world settles with the Chinese, the, the this in the Asians and the the Europeans, they have a common ground. What hope has Africa got? To Niger, I've got to interject. I one hundred percent agree with what Avi said about um, the the great some uh, the greater. Ethiopia and the greater Somali Wayne has to disappear. Yeah, the idea and the concept has to mm -hmm. go. Because again, if you look at the emphasis, again, I'll, I'll talk about Somali Wayne and I'll, I'll, afterwards I'll point out Ethiopia. With the Somali Wayne idea, it has to go. That concept is going to poison the people because again, it's going to make the Somali people look at its surroundings and every, see everyone as an enemy. Think mm -hmm. about it this way, right? There, I've, met, I've met a lot of Somali nationalists. These people bleed blue, 100%. Um, but then their ideals and their belief system is very, it's very um, unrealistic. And I'll explain why it's unrealistic, because they believe Somali Wayne, again, is a concept uh, to, again, uh, bring all of the Somali people under one central government, starting from all the way to Djibouti, all the way to the northern Kenya. And they believe, the Somali people believe that that territory, including the Ogaden region, is all of theirs. And, you know, some people even to this, even to this day believe that that region or that Somali way dream will come true one day. That is poisonous. The Ethiopian um, dream of the great Ethiopia, the great Habasha nation is poisonous too. 
because you're just going to incite the whole bloody war that happened 30 years ago. You're mm. literally going to reincreate it again. And it's going to be again, we're going to have to see Ethiopia and Eritrea go out again. Unless that concept of that <clears throat> bullshit greater nation disappears, it will never change. People yeah, now, we're talking, if we're talking about today, the people of today, they're used to what they're used to right now. And if you want to, again, let's just say, uh, bring the greater, uh, uh, like, see, if you want to bring up those greater nations and, you know, forcefully bring it back to one, you're going to create more chaos than there's ever been. Can you imagine all of those Ethiopian tribes and all of those Somali tribes under one central mm -hmm. government? I can promise you if one government stays mm -hmm. one hour longer than it's supposed to, there's going to be eruption. So that's why I got to say it has to go. Uh, look, look, yeah. can I also just add, you know, when you go to in Ethiopia, you'll sometimes see memorabilia of like greater Ethiopia where they add in the Eritrea and so on. And you'll also see, uh, I've known this, uh, memorabilia among Somalis of greater Somalia. I feel like those memorabilia and even aspects of those uh, on any form should be banned. Like the same way the Germans uh, banned uh, swastika symbolism, we should ban that stuff. But Abby, did you? Did, I, heard I, a report, I heard a rumor like yesterday that they were going to reopen the Asab Air Trail ports to Ethiopia. Did you hear about that, Abby? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard about it. Can I make a statement just following um, Mo and I think uh, the other brother, I don't know his name, uh, about the greater Ethiopia, greater Somali one? Um, Mo, I completely agree with you in the sense of. You know, I think a lot of Somalis we actually speak to right now, I think the, the talk of greater Somalia doesn't really exist. Let's be honest. We can't even save Somalia itself right now. So what's the point talking about greater Somalia? So I think a lot of Somalis are realistic in the sense of let's just keep, keep what we have right now rather than just worrying about a situation that existed a, a long time ago about a vision about, you know, reunify against all Somalis. I don't know about Ethiopia, but I know from Somali perspective, Greater Somalia is not really in any political discussion right now. Our primary focus has always been Somalia. Restore to what it was before and keep it that way. Uh, but I do want to ask a question, though, to the panel as well, because obviously we have people from Djibouti, Eritrea, and Ethiopia as well, I, I believe. Um, my question is more in the sense of, like, what role do the diaspora people have to actually play from these sort of uh, regions? So I'm talking about people from these countries that live in the diaspora, especially in sort of Western countries, uh, in terms of the sort of the political discourse or developmental aspects of it as well, um, how would you say how active are they? Because when I look at other communities, for example, when I look at the Som my own Somali community, um, I do see a lot of people from diaspora that actually do, um, you know, have some sort of involvement in it. For example, even the current Somali uh, political landscape, there are a lot of Somalis that have gone back from the Western country, the host nation, back to Somalia to participate in the political sphere. Is similar thing happening or is there any aspiration of it? And also, those, if anyone knows, those communities, be it Djibouti, Eritrea, or Ethiopia, do they have some sort of a stronghold in some of these countries? And what do they do? That's just my question, basically. Okay, I'm going to answer your question. Um, again, uh, with the Djibouti slash... Djibouti, the Somalis in Djibouti usually tend to, you know... Um, just like the, the Somalis in Djibouti tend to know about the Somali business, likewise with the Somalis in Somalia tend to know about the Djibouti business. Uh, you know, both being Somalis, we understand uh, what's going on in each other's countries because we talk. Um, in the UK, because I live in the UK, there's a massive uh, uh, Somali diaspora. And um, it, it's, it's all from, from all regions, all regions. Um, there's ones, uh, there's, there's you know, there's from uh, Djibouti, there's, there's, um, there's the Somaliland people, there's the Somali people. And all of them, just recently, in the, um, it was the 18th of uh, May, there were celebrations in, um, you know, the city I'm from in the UK, massive celebrations with the people of Somaliland celebrating their independence. Um, what I can say about the, the Somalis in the UK is they all, in terms of what I can say, in terms of like uh, playing a factor back in their countries, they all have a, ma they play a massive role. A lot of them play a massive role as in like they send back a lot of money. Um, a lot of the, the younger people, when they finish their studies here, they go back into their countries and they try to help as much as they can. A lot of the younger people in the in the UK are patriotic in a way. Um, they don't they don't disregard their basically they don't disregard their beginnings uh, humbly. Basically, um, just a friend of mine recently uh, went back to Somalia and he was a he just finished an engineering degree and he went back to Somalia to try to start something or try to you know sort out the country in a way to start a business or, you know, try to help in a way as he could by, you know, maybe building a new, 
because uh, he was an architecture architecture so he he's trying to help in a way by building you know whether it be buildings whether it be reconstructing some of the damaged uh places he's trying to help in any way he can so that's the reason why he went back uh likewise i have an eritrean friend um who uh, basically has the same patriotic ideas a lot of the horners are patriotic in a way but the problem is <clears throat> we don't have the the stepping stones like these other countries a lot of these other countries have the stepping stone. If you want to go back to Morocco, you have a stepping stone. But if you want to go back to any of the Horners country, barring maybe, maybe, if we're talking about, maybe out of the Horners, Djibouti is probably the, um, the, the, the most stable. But even though it has its problems and it's the most stable and probably the best in terms of like living standards, um, the Horners still face their problems. That's what I have to say. I mean, I'm going going back to the idea of greater can, Somalia. Can I, uh, and greater uh, interrupt you there, Zakir? We also we also need to know. Uh, sorry about that, Zakir. I just wanted to do a follow up question. Can you, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, I just want to ask a question quickly, Zakir. I'll, I'll I'll come to you just now. Um, a question, a follow up question. Uh, a, a follow up question. Uh, 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 to to Asami and. Um, uh, 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 and uh, more. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt again. The brother, the the Mo Solomon guy that just commented right now. It's not me. It's not me. Mo Solomon that just said Macrobia. See, I told you so. Somebody's been doing this shit since yesterday. Like someone is trying. This person's pretending to be me. So I'd like this person to be blocked because I've seen this person <laughs> commenting on panels yeah. that I've not been on. So now this person's creating problems for me because they're going on other panels and saying some stuff that I've not said. <laughs> hmm. Okay, Pai, you... can can you handle that person uh, for me, please? Yeah, I got it. I, I just want to raise raise a question before I lose my thought. Yeah, uh, that I wanted to ask. Sorry about that, Mo. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Sorry about that, Mo. Um, yeah. Um, for 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 Mo and pa and uh, Wasame and even tonight, you can also answer this. Um, for the guys that are in the diaspora, especially um. Who are living outside the continent because currently i think it's only me and dr k who are in the continent and um i wanted to find out especially now with the somalia uh, the somalians and uh, even ethiopians and Eritreans. i don't know if, if it's just me but when i see a lot of people outside um the continent they are more united than when they are back home is are we divided because of the politicians or the tribe leaders that are dividing us back home what is it that we we seem to unite when we're outside our home countries, but when we come home, we now get divided into tribes and pointing fingers at tribe this, or this leader this, or you support this political party, I don't support this political party. What is it that really divides us back can home? I, can I interject and just outside? say one quick thing? Um, I recently went on holiday. Um, I was in a city called Hargeisa. I was in what's now called Somaliland. Um, I went there. Um, basically, um, this is uh, again. I, I have some family there, so I went there to visit. And while I was visiting them, I've I've came across some interesting uh, facts as well because I've not just travelled to Hargeisa. I went all over the Somaliland region. And I I was looking at because um, again, when I live in the UK, we don't really talk about uh, tribe. We don't usually associate with tribe. It's just if you yo, if you're Somali then you're Somali, like, you're not going to be associated with the tribe. And we don't have that mentality in the UK where the person, when you meet, you don't say to them, what tribe are you? While I, uh, while I was over there in Somaliland, I, I found out a few things that were interesting because um, I, I never went to, went to Somaliland, I also went to Somalia too. But I'll tell you what was interesting because when I went to Somaliland and Somalia, I spoke to somebody. When I spoke to somebody and they introduced themselves to me, they straight away asked, him, asked me for my tribe. I mean, why would you ask me my tribe? I'm, I'm introducing myself to you with my name. You don't need to know my tribe. So in a sense, over in like any of the Somali regions, they're very tribalistic in a way. Um, they basically associate you with your tribe. So I, I, probably the same for the Ethiopians too. But um, I mean, like it was, it was an interesting experience for me because um, let's just say when you go over there, they need to know your tribe. Before, while they know you, they need to also know your tribe. I don't know if the brother Wasami has got the same experience, but yeah, it's just it was uh, in um, interesting, interesting for me. No, that is interesting, but um, I do also want to point out as well. Um, 
you know, obviously, when you go to the north, especially Hargeisa, there is a greater emphasis on people trying to sort of, you know, find out your plan affiliation. It's, it's literally right in your face. You know, I've all, all I've experienced as well. I have family there that have all experienced it. There is actually uh, uh, less of that more, uh, the, the more south you go, especially if you go to the capital, Mogadishu, you can find almost every single tribe, be it from the north or any part of, you know. So so that's one thing What's I do want to point out. Sorry to yeah. brother. Sorry to deject. It was the same for me, Mogadishu. I met a few people and they kept on asking me for my clan or uh, for my tribe association. So it was interesting because I said for both because when I went there too, they never, they never laid off of it as well. They always want to know my tribe. Can I ask you a question, though? Um, would you agree with this statement I'm about to say that there is a greater emphasis or usage of the tribal system more in Hargeisa than it is, let's say, in Mukdisho? Would you agree with that statement? I know, obviously, you had your personal experience there, but maybe you've also talked to other people because I'm sure Zakir will also jump in at some point. The, the, there is more of that in Hargeisa than is in Mukdisho. No, I, I want to say that because when I went to Hargeisa as well, um, other because it was basically the same to me in terms of like tribe, but what I can say about Hargeisa is there's a lot of people as well, there's a lot of mixture, it's not just one tribe, as many people think it's not. You're gonna find a lot of um different other tribes too, I could promise you that. Um, even there, if there you go to, that, yeah, go on. Yeah, if you go to some of the, the lower cities, if you heard of the the Soko Jose and Hargeisa, you're gonna find a lot of different other tribes, people from Somalia that actually live there. Uh, that went there to to maybe do businesses to escape what's happening in Somalia. It's, it's, it's still uh, Somalia, though, isn't it? Huh? I mean, it's just, it's still the same country. You know, you say like people from Somalia and Hargeisa. No, no, like, yeah, it's still it's the same country. But you, you know what I mean. You know what it's, I mean. It's, I, I know, but we have to we have yeah. to understand we're, we're amongst audience that are not Somali. So if we are also loose with our terms and terminologies, there is going to create that tension that there's two different countries when there is not actually. You know, I I just want to point out, brother. I, I really don't want to chop your flow, but I, it's important to point that out. Te yeah, I understand what you mean, but technically it's a semi-autonomous region. But yeah, um, I understand I mean, what you mean, I, though, hundred percent. I, I even even when I went to Djibouti, the the case was the same. You you see, the point is, oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. That might might not acknowledge this, but we all look alike. I mean, have you ever translated at the Saba? You might get stray some stray people to, speaking to you in Amharic. It happens all the time. I've seen it happen in Addis Ababa. Whenever I walk into a restaurant, somebody comes to me, chats up to me in Amharic. You know, we, we, we I think most of us have something, uh, if you look at psychology, it's called the narcissism of small differences. We, we poke, we try and poke people to see if we are different in any kind of way. I mean, if you, if you met a brother from Senegal or South Africa, you, you might ask yourself, which country are you from? Or you might guess at their passport. I know, yes, this is real a South African, but when you met a fellow Hona, the case is different. You try and poke, you tell them, yo, what's up, where you from? And they tell you Ethiopia, and you try and know which tribes of Ethiopia they are from. Same happens in Somalia, but in the case of Somalia, we try and go deep. Even if I were to speak with you or someone now, and let's say we, we came from the same clan, I mean, I will poke further and ask you the sub-clan, and I ask you where you're from, it goes deeper and deeper than that. I think it's part of the nomadic culture that we never let go of. When people used to meet, Somali people used to meet, they they used to do aptirsi to kind of gauge these people, where they, this person that I'm meeting, where they're from and, and who do they really identify with. Basically, I, 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 I tend to explain it, although not uh, quite uh, well, the affiliation looks like somebody asks you for a party or a place you stay, you you kind of have to give it to them before they before you take the conversation forward. I don't see it normally as a bad thing, but outside Somalia we we have to let loose. We have to let that thing go. And the other point I was trying to make the other time, uh, my connection was bad. I think about the Somali Wayne idea, the the idea of greater Somalia, the idea of the greater Habesha nation. I don't think the idea is going to die off very soon because in Somalia. It started in 1941. I think the the term Greater Somalia was coined in 1941. And as Somali people, I am sure, or some, and, and you can attest to this, whenever there is a sense of injustice happening to our Somali brethren who are outside within the borders that were superimposed on us, I am sure some a part of you feels as though we should be they, that shouldn't be happening to them. I think with time, we have to, time is the greatest heal of everything. We have to give it time before we let go of such ideas. And it will take 
so many generations before we had assimilated into the, our respective countries. Nobody in this world likes to be dominated or to be a, 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 a kind of told to stay in your place. But we are we're Somalis and we are minority in 193 countries. We only have Somalia that we are, we are the majority in. We, we have to accept the reality and however long it takes, we will accept that reality. As for people living outside historical Somalia, I mean, they had they have a lot of issues. A Somali, I, I was recently seen uh, the Somali people celebrating the only uh, G- Somali general in the Ethiopian army. And I, I don't have to tell you that how large the Ethiopian army is. We are not trusted to, to hold any higher position in, in Ethiopia. You know very well, up until recently, we didn't have even a choice in the system of uh, Ethiopia. Same with Kenya. I've been to Kenya many times. I know the system. I speak the language. In Somalia, there is what we in Kenya there is the apex, the 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 apex phenomenon, like a Somali might be holding a, a position, a high key position in in the government, but that does not translate to the average Somali on the streets having the same right as another Kenyan, as long as our people feel disenfranchised and they are salient in the affairs of the countries, quote unquote, that we adopted. I don't think the idea of the idea of longing for a greater Somali way is here to stay in the for for a, for a period th- th- thank you Zachary. ezra can i go back to your question if you don't mind sorry um <laughs> about about the diaspora community um i mean i i, I do see it um but it can be both positive and also negative form especially from somali perspective um hopefully uh, mo and others can also speak how it's like um i've seen the diaspora community when they sort of move into area for example I've, I've lived i've moved to a city i remember and the somali community was very uh, small so there was a sense of like you know let's all get together we're all the same we're all somali let's work to set up an organization you know that kind of stuff it was all good once more somalis start coming in unfortunately i've started seeing a bit of a division sort of building up and unfortunately it was along tribal lines right there's parts in london you know it, there is a distinction you know there's some cities in the uk you could see that actually the community division like you would see you know, some people that would say we're from this region, this is my country, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, even the celebration that happened, you know, the 18th of May, a few days ago, um, uh, it's, it's, it's only visible in certain uh, areas or cities that only one tribe is majority in. And that is quite visible. And same thing when you talk about this election that's been happening recently in, 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 in Somalia, you also see people sort of dividing themselves. And, you know, I'm not saying it's for everyone, but unfortunately, it does affect it. So it looks like the, the more Somalis become majority or start growing their numbers, the divisions start happening. But once they are a minority, they're really together. I traveled to California a few years ago, and there's a small uh, community of Somalis over there. And it was really be- amazing to see that. I mean, how they were together. You know, there wasn't a sense of like, you know, where you're from, what area, what region, what tribe. It was it was really together. And it was a well, you know, um, functioning Somali community who were addressing a lot of the societal issues that they were facing at that time. But then I guess when you go to play other places that have majority Somalis, be it Minnesota, other places, I don't, I have, I've only been there for a few days, I'm sure you would see the division on there. So it, 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 I've seen both sides, the ugly side that unfortunately just, you know, the problems have been exported from Somalia, the tribal, into those sort of host nations. But I've also seen signs of like a lot of youth people, you know, young people sort of intermarrying each other you know, from different tribes and sort of, you know, coming together and, you know, trying to participate or get involved with the political discourse in Somalia. And that, that's that's the one I want to focus on. Unfortunately, the other side does exist, but that's what I want to focus on. But I'm, I'm really eager to know uh, from others, including uh, Brother Mo, the, the people from those communities, because Mo lives in the UK, I live in the UK. So uh, the, 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 the people from the Djibouti community, what were like, how... What sort of involvement do they have back to Djibouti? And same thing with Eritrea and 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 and, and Ethiopia as well. And maybe Brother Tunaji can talk about Nigeria as well. Like how how much involvement do they have? Not only just from political aspects, I'm re- I'm interested in, but also from developmental side of things. You know, because these people have certain knowledge, uh, resources, even like wealth. Are they going back there doing something with it, or are those governments or the, the administration there sort of stopping these people from doing something like that? Thank you. Yeah, brother. You made a good point. Um, yeah, so I was going to say about the Djibouti one is there's a lot of people that don't like this current president. Um, they think that this guy is running the, gra- uh, the country to the ground by inviting people that are not to be trusted. 
um, he they seeing that the action that he's taken among the the people within the country. Um, you can see that it's not just the, the Somalis. There's the other ones as well, like because there's other minorities with <clears throat> with uh, some level of power. Um, again, I wouldn't consider the Afars a minority as they're almost closing like the Somalis and they are far very close in numbers in terms of like the inhabitants within the country. But in terms of like the smaller minorities with power are like the the Yemenis, which uh, again, a lot of them are in the country themselves. They, they're known as merchants. They have a lot of shops where they sell um, some of their um, like their food, their perfume from their own country. But there's a lot of people that are, you know, in a way that they're unhappy with um, the current, uh, the current um, prime minister or president, as they call him, in terms of like, um, in terms of status. Um, so there's a lot of groups that have been started, a lot of small groups, and there's too many to name, but there's a lot of small groups that have been started to annex this guy out. Um, there's a lot of spokesmen, um, not within the country, because you'll definitely disappear if you're within the country, but outside of the country, um, stating their objection. Because, again, he has total power within the country because he has the backing of almost everybody. He has the backing of the the, the ACES, he has the backing of the Afars, he has the backing of basically everyone. He's basically untouchable in a way. So you have to state your opinions within safe borders or within basically somewhere where he can't get to you. And a lot of people are displeased with him. A lot of people are displeased with him. And um, what basically pushed me to, you know, no, not push me, but in a way what, what basically confirmed his treachery was the fact that if you know about the, uh, um, uh, as brother uh, uh, Warsame and uh, the other Somali brother as well, um, as those two brothers also know about the, the dispute between the Kenyans and the Somalis over the waters, and both of you probably know about what side he took. You've probably done your research and know on what, what basically what side he took as a Somali, which is embarrassing. Um, but yeah, it's just, you can clearly see what this guy's actions are all about and how many Somalis and many other people within the country are displeased with him. And they started to make their voices clear. Um, I think maybe with, Maybe in a couple of maybe a couple of months or a year, a lot of people are going to be in a position where they're not going to be pleased with him, and they might even, you know, start some sort of process to take him out of power. Um, but then he's too well protected. That's the problem. <clears throat> yeah, that's just my stance on the clown that we have as a president. Hmm. I don't call him a president; I just call him the clown. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Thank you, Mark. But I'm going to come back, guys. For, for, there's a question that uh, I think most of you answered part part of the question that I'm asking about what uh, the the division part. Who's dividing? Who? Why are they more divided? Uh, is it the politicians? Is it the tribal leaders who are doing this? But hold that thought. Uh, I'll, uh, you'll answer that afterwards. But I just want to hear um, to Niger from his side. Uh, um, also living in the diaspora. I think we've got a lot of uh, guys who are living in the UK today. Uh, to Niger? Yeah. I, I, I think the division is coming mostly from leaders and um, in the countries. And part of it is because many of these countries don't have any sense of uh, like hate speech law. A law that basically hate speech is basically saying, you know what, don't try to divide us based on tribal lines. And yet African countries haven't taken on any of these type of rules. And this is kind of, this is what I mean by when we have a discussion, that's what brings out this type of things because it will naturally make you arrive to uh, at a point where you all decide that, okay, this is how we need to live together. When your daughter or your brother or your chief says this about our people, you should condemn them. You should hold them accountable and the right, vice versa. So, there has to be a common rule that says, this is the way we have to talk to ourselves so that we don't rip each other uh, apart. And I think in terms of uh, who is doing it, we all know now, the leaders are the tip of the spear because if the leaders are not using it, the people will not um, uh, notice it as much. Um, so this is why I say that if you want to solve this problem, part of it is you encourage the leaders not to do that but most importantly, you have to be rules put in place. And this is why many of our countries, for want of a better word, needs a form of uh, hate speech law. I, I guess at the time, hate speech law doesn't sound positive. I, I, I guess you can call it, um, I don't know, somebody should call, call it a better word for that, really. Mm -hmm. I, because it's a very, very valuable instrument to keeping um, countries um, 
uh, stable um, in terms of societally. So that's my take on it. Thank you, uh, Tinaija. Uh, our Leech, uh, do you also uh, have something to, to, to say here? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to the Somali brother who said, uh, who was talking about the idea of uh, break, uh, banning the ideas of Greater Ethiopia or Greater Somalia. Look, I'm going to be honest with you. You're right. These ideas are too entrenched in our societies right now. But as long as these ideas remain, these countries will never trust each other and we can never work together especially from the elite, because let's be honest, if if these ideas still exist within each of each of these countries, that means that the moment one country starts rising, or the moment the power balance starts shifting towards one country, the other country is going to invite foreign power to try and help them out. True. That, that, 100% that will, agree. That, that will mean what? A proxy war again. Hmm. So if, these, if, if, you, if this is going to take generations to solve, then we will never be united for generations. These are just honest facts. This, 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 is, why, this point, is why we have to listen to each other. This is why you have to listen to the fears of the opposite. Can I just say one thing? Even yeah. a rat knows, even a rat doesn't fall for the same trap twice. If you set a, <laughs> a, a, a mouse trap in the same place twice, a rat will never fall for twice. There's no reason as a human being that we should keep making the same mistakes generation upon generation upon generation. We should all give up on these ideas. They, they won't, you see. They, they won't because to, maybe today you um, one tribe got one over the other. Tomorrow, the other tribe will want to get one over the other tribe. So the, the circle repeats itself until both sides realize that, okay, you know what? Um, you want this. I want that. Let's figure out a way that we can meet and work together to make it better for both sides. Because right now, while we are busy trying to get one over the other, it's not getting us anywhere. And I really believe, I've seen it happen, I've had the experience myself. When you discuss with people honestly, both of you will come up with solutions that you never even saw coming. That would be like a genius move. And that's why I think <clears throat> when you have can, discussions, can I, can you I, come up with solutions. Thing? Can I also say one thing? This uh, propaganda that each tribe has, that they are the most oppressed, needs to stop. Because I heard the brother say, oh, Ethiopia just celebrated their first ever Somali general. Well, he has to understand that for the last 30 years, there has never been such thing as an Ethiopian army. It has pretty much been a Tigrayan army disguised as an Ethiopian army. 90% of our generals used to come from the same army, from the same tribe. So forget about the Somali person ever being a general. No one else was being a general, if we're being honest. And these are the misconceptions that I keep talking about. You see, every tribe is fighting to be the most oppressed. They go tell their kids, oh, they're doing this to us. They're only oppressing us. They're doing this. That has to stop. We have to look at reality. Yes, we're all being oppressed. And yeah, maybe at one point, one tribe will be oppressing the other. But guess what? If you keep saying that you're the most oppressed and you end up being in power, what are you going to end up doing? Because you've inculcated your children with this mentality that everyone's against them then they're going to get in power and start oppressing everyone. And then the cycle continues. Mm. In Nigeria, the, let me add the Nigerian experience on this one. Uh, in Nigeria, the experience is you have a tribe like the Igbos in that, which they live in Biafra. They believe that they are being marginalized from power specifically. But they won't say that. They will say they are just being oppressed and the country is punishing them and all the rest of it. While in reality, they are talking about uh, administration of the country. That's where their power is not as strong. Uh, but in terms of development, they are more developed than the area that they are uh, accusing. And uh, in terms of education, they are more educated than the people that they are accusing. So on so many other metrics, they control the country more than uh, the other groups. But yet, they claim they are, they are the most marginalized. And when you tell them that, in reality, what you are saying is that you want to control these other aspects of society, at the same time, be able to control um, uh, the ultimate power in the country in terms of the military and uh, this in, and uh, politics. They will say, no, 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 that's not what we are talking about. You see, there, there is perceived um, uh, injustice and marginalization, and there is objective one. Because... And I think you touched on it when you said, you know, sometimes, you know, children will be growing up, they will be telling them that we, our people have been marginalized and this, this people did this to us, this people did this. And there's a lot of misinformation going on. It's not often 
objective. And this is why it's important when you discuss with people openly, then you flesh it out and the areas that you are, they are actually feel aggrieved, you address it. And you'll be surprised sometimes some of these things are just not as real as people make it sound because in reality, everybody is suffering. Like you said, in Nigeria, the whole country is suffering. We, we are all not getting this. It's not like one region is getting 24 hours power supply, uh, you know, 24 7. No, no, no. Every area is suffering the same thing, including the federal capital territory. So, this, this idea that one side is getting more over the other is a fallacy. But if you to resolve it, you need to be face to face discussing these things honestly. If we keep telling our children behind closed doors, and politicians coming out openly to cause division, we are not going to get to the end of it. And that's Abby, how we Abby. lose it. Trust, Trust, me, Trust, me, Abby. Trust me, yeah. Tunaita, I, I, I remember reading uh, Half of a Yellow Sun by Chimamanda. I, I, although it was a novel, a fiction, a book of fiction, she was trying and depict the Igbo story. I, I, I have had a fair share of literature from Nigeria. Uh, coming back to the brother, uh, now I've lost my train of thought. I I, rem I remember talking to the Djibouti and brother. You know why? You know why so many people? They, 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 well, first of all, we need to understand the history of the region. The region had uh, warfare for about I don't know for the last bit of the millennia. I would I would even say, and it's also entrenched in as much as it's political, it's historical, it's even religious. Sometimes it takes the form of religion, uh, religious violence. As recent as Ramadan, I think the, a couple of weeks ago, we've had some Muslims suffer in, 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 in some horrific violence, which is inexcusable by any standards. Coming coming back, like Tunisia said, you know, I, I, I see most of these politicians are, are jokers. If there, if there are no people listening to their jokes, then I don't think they would thrive in this society. We like to, we like to tell each other we are so united, power to the people with the normal movement and everything but deep down we know we are we are divided more than ever i have not seen an african who has no problem with another african even if they claim to be friends one is just out waiting the other and and in this game of one tribe having one over the other if it were to help we would have seen its results in somalia in somalia for the last 30 years we've had 30 or 40 warlords changing sides each after the other there is no there is no winner if they had a winner he would have imposed a a, a, a winner's peace on us we have not seen it the same five years we see one one tribe becomes the presidency the other holds the prime ministership then the opposition switches one night whenever they're defeated in in in, in election the whole opposition now becomes government and the government becomes opposition you see brother after that's a great years, statement you see, made you made a great Even statement. In there. Somalia, right now, uh, the president uh, who was elected, I, and I say elected loosely because he, he was the, the fate of the Somali people was were decided by three hundred and, and some thirty MPs. Now corrupt the politicians. Again, a corrupt See what politicians. I look. This, this is the statement I was going to make. And, and, and we, when we're waiting for change, I don't think change is coming anytime soon. If we were to wait, these failed, regurgitated politicians, where you see every day. Well, I was going to make a statement as well. Uh, well, I was going to point something out as well. This is the problem with the question, uh, the shift 4.5 system. Like, it denies the people the right to vote. It keeps it in the political side of things so the people can pay each other off, the people can bribe each other, the people can talk to each other to give each other favors and vote for each other. And that's the reason why the, the, the uh, Hassan, uh, Hassan uh, Sheikh Wan, that's the reason why he's the, um, the president of Somalia currently. And this is the problem. And see, right now, um, even the situation with Denny, where he's not happy about Mwah not becoming the president, and he's gone back to Poland, and basically he's talking about, uh, you know, uh, Mwah moving away from uh, Mokdesho and becoming his own state. Ah. Yeah, ah. so you have, you have problems. The nuclear, the nuclear uh, solution. Yeah, so now he's trying to threaten uh, his way to the seat. You have people like uh, Ahmed Madawi. You have people like those guys. Who trying to basically force their way into the political power and become uh, actual president by forcing their way there? This is the problem. You have all of these uh, freaking little warlords in the what you have in, in the country with all of them in their little sections, forcing trying to play their uh, political game with their clan and their tribe backing them to force their way into the seat. And that's the problem. Their tribes are falling for this. 
their tribe is not going to be the head of the uh, the country that they're living in. Why not vote for somebody that's actually going to make the country better instead of following your tribe member who's only in there for himself and to benefit his tribal elders and give them uh, give them the money that comes to the country. This is the problem. This is the problem with Somalia. You need to stop blindly following your tribal elder or your tribal leader and follow the person that's actually going to do good and benefit the country for you. I, I even try and find it very amusing that Whenever you, you, you have to learn of somebody's clan is when they're, when they're talking about perceived grievances. Some of these politicians will never know their tribe until they, they're, they're removed from a post or they're not selected for another post. They, they come out and, and the thing is, everybody has a clan. Whenever they fail in the national government at the capital, they move back with some few militiamen and start causing ruckus in the countryside. Coming back to the the, 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 the position of Ismail Umargel. Ismail Umargel, I find him to be the worst Somali there is. I agree. In, in, on, the, on the leaders of the Somali peninsula, Ismail Umargel happens to be the worst. Even this system that we have, the 4.5 system, this guy, when, when the Somalis went to Arta, who, you know who was the principal architect? Ismail Umargel. Who divided the Somali among the four big clans? Imagine telling someone you are half, your vote is uh, worth half of another. Look, look how that turns out. When you, whenever you find this uh, captured Al-Shabaab uh, will be suicide bombers. They happen to be from the minority clans because Al-Shabaab taps into their grievances. They are told, look, you're not somebody in this world. Look for your riches in, in the afterworld. Go to heaven, take this vest. And they come and they come down massacring another Somali people. The thing is, if you ever stop a Somali person on the road, you can't tell their clan from how they look. They, they'd have to tell you. And anybody can tell you any clan. That's why you, when when the civil war happened and the, the, the checkpoints were erected all over the country, it was not easy to know who is from where and who is from which clan. You had to you go see, on this, this, this your is, gut. This is the and, problem. And, and the the whole world is looking upon us. We look like some backward savages. And and we don't seem to see it anytime soon. You, you know, it pains me when I see a young Somali talking about clan X, clan Y, and they happen to be from the diaspora. What was Sami said is very true. You know, some years back, I remember I went to the UAE, and and I found Somali people. None of them asked for me. None of them asks for my clan. And I and I also saw among them, the in the in the cafe that they used to have coffee around. They used to have pun there. I, I I could see the writing. The writing was in guys. I don't know if it was in Amharic or Tigrinya, and I never knew. That this the place was owned by Somali and it had the right in the, the resemblance of Harik. So when we when we get bigger and our populations get bigger in the diaspora, we revert back to our stupidity from from the villages. It's it really somebody should do a study on this. I'm willing. I'm willing to finance my part. Yeah, I agree. And um, again, it stands. It's, it's basically no, the whole of the horn. This is the whole of the horn. The problem with the horn. The problem is again. I've seen with my own eyes. Like there's there's marches in in the UK, uh, Eritreans specifically the Tigrayans that are marching in the in the UK, saying they don't want basically the because their country they don't like their country label. And I've even seen Ethiopian marches. Uh, there was a lot of uh, Amharas uh, marching and uh, some Quraj as well, where they're marching in the um, uh, what's it called London Town Square, where they're marching and saying that they don't want any uh, American interference within Ethiopian politics. There was a spokeswoman. I forgot what her name was when I was speaking to her, and she uh, she's from Ethiopia, one of the major clans, one of the major tribes, and she was saying, "I don't want any American interference." And she was standing in front of the Buckingham Palace, and what was happening was, um, again, uh, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of in inner clash basically. There was happening because the Tigrayans uh, or the Tigrays, the Tigrays came and came in front of them. They countered, they countered basically, they countered their movement. They counted their movement and said that they, they want the Americans to go in there because the, Tigra the Tigrays are getting very oppressed by the Amharas and their other uh, major tribes uh, in uh, uh, Ethiopia. And they almost resulted them two tribes having a fistfight outside of the, um, basically, uh, um, the protest. It, get, it, got, it got so toxic, uh, toxic that they were willing to fight each other in that spot. The Tigrays wanted the, the Americans to go inside and the Amharas and the other ones didn't want them to enter. It got that crazy. I mean, like this is the problem with the horn. We're too tribal. We are too tribal, and that's the basically the the downfall of the horn. Mo, that is I the downfall of the horn. Mo, can I ask you a question? Up. What is making those people almost come to fist fights? 
is a true genuine history of grievances or is it fairy tales on i'm not saying any no tribe has been offended but you know what happens let's say one person dies they will say 20 people died or they will add spices to the story to make it even worse than it actually is and this story will keep getting worse by generation by generation and so on like the brother here said uh, i think he said um, a mosque was burnt like a few mosques were burnt yeah, but on the same day, there were churches that were burned too. This wasn't just uh, Christians attacking Muslims. It was both sides fighting one another. You see what I mean? It's the way you frame these incidents. It creates more hate. And the problem is we have medias now that exclusively target each tribe. Like if you've noticed on YouTube, there's like X tribe with its own YouTube channel that just says, oh, every day we're being attacked, we're being attacked, and the other tribe is saying the same thing, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and this is creating even another cycle of hate now. And the only way to show this is for, for me, I feel like everyone's grievances has to be shown at the same time. If you say your tribe is being oppressed, for the same thing you say you're, you're being oppressed, you also have to mention what you did. Or you also have to mention, okay, they did this to me and this has to change, but I also need to change X, if that makes any sense. Yeah, 100% agree. Um, I mean, they were, they were willing to get arrested by having a fight in the public over basically um, the country situation. And that's the problem. The, the Tigrayan or the TPLF um, main instigators and the Ethiopian government and Abi's side were not willing to sit down and have a conversation. Because again, the problem is, 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 is always they're going to be the civilians that are going to get harmed the most. Even though we all know the, the, the TPLF, the group, the TPLF, not the Tigray. So people need to understand to differentiate the difference. The TPLF are using their own uh, uh, tribe as basically a shield against the Ethiopian National Army for them not to be protected and not to be basically gotten at. They're using the anger of their people against the Ethiopians. That's what the Tigrayans are not seeing. The TPLF are the biggest instigators in the horn. Them and the bloody Al-Shabaab. This is, this is what I'm saying. And these two... Uh, uh, what's Can I give there? you an example? Can I give you an example? You know yeah, go ahead, the brother. average Tigrayan is so heated in this situation. Oh yeah, go ahead, brother. Um, have to learn about the history they teach them from a young age. Like, I know the history that they teach them because I can kind of speak to Grinia and I have some Tigrinya family members or extended family. But well, these people go in from the moment they tell them, look, the Amharans have been oppressing you for the last 150 years. Think about that. How historically inaccurate can that message ever be? 150 years, bro. They, they say pretty much since the formation of, like, modern day Abyssinia, it's only been Amaris dominating them. That has not never ever been true. But this is what they get told from a young age that the Amaris did X, Y, and Z to you. And then when the Oromo Mangistu came, he did X, Y, Z to you, so on and so forth. And you know when they came to power? Yeah. There was a phrase that they had. They said, We have been ruled for 150 years. We will rule now for another 150 years. Think about how divisive of a statement that is. Damn. Well, think about that statement in itself. You see, this, when you, this is what I mean. When, I, when you keep teaching your kid from a young age that his tribe is the most oppressed, when, even when you historically change facts, I don't even call these facts. I tell them, I, I call them Buna stories. In Ethiopia, I, I call them Buna stories because you know people like to sit down and drink coffee. Yeah. Yeah, so I call them Buna stories because, yeah. yeah, when they're drinking coffee, this is the bullshit that they like to tell their kids and so on. These are not even real history, man. But they will teach their kids this. And what, what, do you, what does that happen when? What happens when that kid grows up? He grows up hating Hatred. the tribes. Yeah. I think that's the this reason why, why the TPLF is embedded in hate. Yeah, bro. This is why like, they can rule. Even when they're starving, their own people right now. This is why they, no one will still rise up against them. Because in their mind, they have, they are fighting for survival. They have made it. They have told the people that if we ever lose this war, they're going to come and wipe you all out. They're going to clean there's going to be no to grade left. That's the mentality that they instilled in the people. And you have to realize the average to doesn't have internet. But the average to is a peasant living in a bush somewhere, living on subsistence farm. So this guy is not getting the information. And that's, that's, that's the reason why I have to say, I mean, this is the problem with the t uh, the, um, the hornets in general. This is the problem with us. Um, I'll take care. Oh, okay. I, I think the biggest problem that came to the Hornets is the oh. Swiss Canal. Um, the Swiss Canal is one of the biggest problems that happened to the Hornets. If it hadn't been there, 
um, horn, the horn will be a lot more benign uh, now. Sometimes no, it's not that. necessarily your people's fault. So now that... I, have to, I have to counter that. It's not that. I can promise you it's not that. The <laughs> horners have been, the horners have been in fighting for thousands of years. Thousands of recorded years. Yeah. Of recorded, they have been fighting between people, tribe. You did this. You did that. I'm going to retaliate. Abyssinia versus Adal. Uh, 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 basically, the infighting within uh, 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 Abyssinia and the people fighting each other. The Somalis infighting. But, there have but, been uh, so many no, fights no, between but, the Horners. So Is this this been happening for thousands so. of years? So we are the Europeans fighting each other. I think the, what is making it now um, relevant and um, affecting the lives of the Honors today is because of the Swiss Canal. If you look at the 18th century with the deals that were being signed by the leaders in that region, it's all linked to the Swiss Canal being built because it was strategically changing the focus of the Europeans. So that is what is affecting what is going on on the ground. And if you look at it, the nations even, it's almost perfectly designed to keep the horn in check. In the, the, the map, if you look at it, because it, it, Eritrea is right there blocking Ethiopia from the sea because Ethiopia would be a lot stronger if they, were, they had access to the sea. Somalia that, had, that has access to the sea with a reasonable population, they put them into a civil war. And the one that seems to be a little bit freer, um, which is um, Djibouti, is basically a supermarket for military bases. You see, that the region, uh, there's no chance. They didn't give it. It's a perfectly designed system to keep that region the way it is. It's like Afghanistan. If any area is that very strategic, they make it a nightmare in that region. And but this is well, the, well, can I ask you a question? The Suez Canal is blocking trade to, to the U.S., right? Correct? Is that what you're saying? Um, no, it's what allowing it's trade to trade go to flow into the uh, to into Europe. From the east, oh, okay. So, but we yeah, shouldn't be using the European markets anyway, though. <laughs> no, no because the Russian resources you, it's for them, it's not for you, it's yeah. for them, it's for the Europeans. 80 percent of the Europeans, basically, 80 percent of the Europeans, oil, gas, or whatever, comes through that canal. And if that canal was blocked off, they would starve within weeks, exactly. Within weeks, Europe would collapse. Within weeks, yeah, that's how much they need it for them. So, this is why just to, has to, get, to, get just to help you out. The biggest tra trade volume in the world is across the Eurasian plain, and most specifically it's between Far East Asia and Western Europe. And you can't you can't just use land to go from Far East Asia to Western Europe. It's more expensive. So that's the reason. Why, and to, and plus, and plus is yeah. much more difficult. So that's yeah, the reason why they need to, the canal. Yeah, all of it goes through the Suez Canal. So pretty much, Europe, Western Europe, and China, Japan, and so on, they all trade through the Suez Canal. So if that goes or if that is destabilized for any moment, their trade goes... They will collapse. I mean, look at Japan. I mean, you guys are focused on China having its first military base there. Even Japan has a military base in Djibouti, bro. Oh, that, that is... You can't make that up, can you? I'm telling <laughs> you, man. Af African countries need to start opening military bases there, like South Africa, Nigeria. Let's, let's all start having military <laughs> bases there because it's ridiculous now. Even Japan that was nuked has a military base. You know, Japan is not supposed to be allowed to go to war, and they have a military base there. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with us, man. See, um, I was going to also point out, no, think about you, it this way, right? Check, uh, even Germany is now thinking about opening a military base. Oh, somewhere. my and God. On, on the, on the short list is your country as well. He's, I'm telling you, man, Abdullah Omar, he's actually pushing the, he's, he's, he's taking the mick if he allows Germany to, like, because I was already fuming when they added Japan, and, I mean, what more could be said? Like, think about it this way, right? Um, If, like, see, this is the problem, right? If Djibouti kicked out all of the military bases, right? Which is, again, a false stretch, but let's just say it did happen. I mean, and he started take, taking control of the, um, Basically, the, the the Red Sea. I mean, again, it would be again one of the most powerful countries in our. It would be one of the most powerful countries in Africa because it has a a very good GPD, uh, GD, uh, GDP. It has a modern army, no military bases on it, and it is in one of the most strategic positions in the world. Again, yeah. that's the reason why they cannot have Djibouti without military bases. They need some sort of check on it, if you know what I mean. But then Djibouti also made a check on America because America, when it had its base there, guess what? 
the Djibouti, the, the, he didn't he, he didn't want just America there because America would be too much of a problem. So what he did is he invited Russia and China. So you see now there's also, there's some sort of counterbalance. Yeah, I, I see that actually because that's interesting that the the leader of Djibouti was able to get the Chinese there for whatever reason. Yo, Jim, uh, do that. I have to leave. So go, goodbye to all of you. Yes, you know, I just yes, to you. Can I say something? Can I say something? Yeah. Sorry. I think um, you have been on point um, on all the discussions so far. Some of the things you are saying, I really think that um, people in your region, they should listen to it. Because I believe that voice, if it's not listened to sooner or later, will consume whatever culture that is left. They will, def they will destroy the tribes. They will destroy um, religion. And they will do some of the things that you see in China or Somalia, uh, this in um, uh, Russia. Because when systems keeps failing and failing and failing and failing, People will be like to hell with all of them. Some of the things you are saying is 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 a harbinger of things to come because you are saying get rid of all these things. Stop telling your children not to do this. Stop. The, that is how these these things change. Before you know it, you like to you know plague on both of your houses. I don't care who is who. You people have wrecked us long enough. Anybody that stand, stands in my way, they will be killed. And this is how it happens. And millions will be killed, but they will create a single uh, this in uh, nationhood in that region. So let's hope it doesn't get there. The only way you can and forestall that is to have a dialogue. And I don't understand why it's so hard for our African countries to do that. I guess we have been disrupted all the time, and that could explain it. But we really need to push for it now. You see, the, I think the there's a window. Shiraja, I've got to say the Europeans understood uh, that the... Is, can I just say one thing? You to Niger, you're right. And can I just say, look, uh, if you guys have to teach your kids, that someone is oppressing them. At least tell them who is on top of everything. It's the uh -huh. Europeans. It's it's America, the Europeans, the outsiders. Every tribe in Africa right now is fighting over one another to try and be the right hand of the European and oppress the others. Instead of focusing on the tribe that's acting as the right hand, focus on the people that are looking, that are controlling the tribe from behind, which is mm -hmm. the Europeans and the Americans. So if you really want to teach your kid who's really oppressing them, Focus on uh, on the people that are not even from your continent. Your own brother is not your oppressor. The ones outside are your oppressor. So if you really have to teach them, teach them real history, not this bullshit back and forth. So thank you. No worries, Abby. Thank you for um, saying some good stuff as well. Um, I, I mean, I was going to also point out, this is the problem, right? As Abby pointed out, the Tigray is teaching basically poison to, um, to, the, to the younger generation, which is again going to also be bred into the generation that comes after them. I mean, 150 years we will rule. That's bollocks. And then they said that we we're going to rule for 150 years. I mean, the Tigray had a massive grip, or again, not the Tigray, because not the tribe, but the, the, the TPLF have had a massive grip within Ethiopia. I mean, they were controlling the government for decades, decades. And um, when the TPLF was removed because of Abby's actions and they were kicked out, they restarted a whole uh, uh, revolution to get back the um, to get back the Ethiopian government. They even uh, was it called went as far as to call the Ethiopian um, government uh, was it called uh, uh, basically raise a holy war against them because they lost power. I mean these guys have been stacking up weapons and military are uh, basically weapons. They've been stacking up uh, uh, military uh, um, uh, was it called military vehicles. They've been standing uh, stacking up wherever they needed just in case things like this happen. And that's the reason why they're able to fight back so heavy because of all the stored weaponry and everything they've been doing now through the decades. I mean, the TPLF have to be one of the biggest poisons in the home alongside Al Shabab, those crooked guys in the, in, in Somalia. These people, the Al Shabab. The funny thing is, Al Shabab it has very few minor uh, major tribes. It has very few members of the major tribes. That's the funny thing about Al Shabaab. It has the minority tribes, but never the very few of the majority tribes. So that's that's one thing that everybody in Somalis or the Somalis have cropped on with the, the Al Shabaab. Um and how can they call themselves how could they call them, how can they call themselves Al Shabaab, meaning the lions or the tigers? They're not lions or tigers, they're cowards. They kill themselves, they bomb them, they they, they suicide bomb themselves. At least the TPLF are coming at you face four. These guys are cowards. That's what I have to say about them. But in terms of in terms of the horn, we need to fix this situation. We need to fix this situation because it's not it's not beneficial for any of us. It's not beneficial for Africa at all. Like it's not beneficial for any African. We cannot have anybody overseeing our actions because we're in the most strategical position in the world uh, in in terms of like in Africa. 
we have people destabilizing destabilizing our country in the name of their prosper in the name uh, in the name of their country prospering and it's crazy to see man but the, the horn needs to uh, fix the situation i mean this is the problem because again this this is this is what my observation are like again what i what i need from somalis is again this guy to be this guy's got a four year term and he's got a major backing in Somalia, and that's the problem. When he steps down after four years, there needs to be a change. They need that four point. They, Somalis have four years to get rid of that four point five system and give the people the voting rights. So hopefully, the Somalis can fix that situation, and hopefully, the Habashas can get the Habashas can get rid of the the TPLF before America goes on their holy crusade of entering their country and destabilizing their government. Because that's what America does. Every time they say that they're gonna go in there with their democracy, the country doesn't survive. But but for my for me anyway, I think that the Habasha should have a discussion with TPLF and um, this leader that you have in Somalia now. They see, I mean, remember I this mean, like, uh, Niger, to Niger. Yeah. The the Habashas, the TPLF are narcissists. I mean these guys were congratulating the, the coward that took control of the Somalis. See, see, let's see, let's let's see. We have to talk to each other. We, if we keep calling each other names, we're not gonna get anywhere. Everybody wants something. Tunaja, literally, literally a few days ago, they said no, they not, no, 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 TPLF is the coward. <laughs> go ahead, Mo, sorry. No, no worries, Pi, no worries. Go ahead. This I just is what I'm talking out. about. Any area that feels aggrieved in your system is a security problem. If um, the um, one the TPLF feels aggrieved, it's a security problem. If the uh, far people feel aggrieved, it's a, it's a security problem. In if the Bantus in Somalia feel aggrieved, it's a security problem, and it's clearly shown with the Al Shabab uh, this thing. So the evidence is there. We should understand that if we don't talk to our own people, they are our people. Other people yeah, are going to move on. That one? It was literally within the same day. Was it the uh, within the same day span that um like it was like a rumor going around that Ethiopia was discussing like reopening the port of Eritrea, and TPLF said they, they might attack Eritrea. Could could you imagine that? Yeah. They would. They, they say all this is because in the end, everybody's suspecting each other. They are afraid that the other groups may take revenge for all the things they did when they were in power. Bro. I think we need to see if we just talked about how we need to do this, and the next second you're calling this one cowards and all the rest. I went overboard with that, but yeah, I went on a semi rant. <laughs> you see what I mean? This is how it happens. Then everybody puts their back up. Then the the Europeans will come in and decide the fate of everyone. We have to approach each other and understand where, what they need, and you let them know what you need, and you guys find a common ground. You'll be surprised how the co common ground you guys can find. I think that's where you need to start from because then your 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 unity will become your strength. Because now, would you, you agree with me, Tunaja, when I say this? The Horn of Africa needs to unite. And then the first thing they need to do two things, right? The first thing they need to do is absolutely eradicate um, the TPLF and Al-Shabaab, leave no traces of them. Absolutely wipe them with the existence of the face of the earth. That's task number one. See, see, that kind of talk is not going to get you anywhere. You can't. No, no, because you can't ask for something that you can't get. The only way you can get that is if you destroy everything. You have to talk to them. <laughs> Find I'm kind of going on a semi rant. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I was gonna say to, to, to the guys on the panel, uh, you're gonna have to excuse me, man. I'm going on a semi rant because the more I talk about what's happening in the situation, the more I get fed up because of um, the, the actions that these guys are taking up, uh, up against us and how they're destabilizing the horn and how this how this can affect the Africans within the continent because we're inviting this bullshit into the continent. Um, so you could, uh, if you'd excuse me on my. Uh, my little rants today, but yeah. <laughs> the, the uh, 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 okay, go uh, ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Mo, um, the, uh, and everyone, um, I, I'm just gonna pause you guys. Uh, Senitis, is, uh, she's here, and uh, I know she she brings fire as well, and uh, I know she 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 has a lot to say about the horn. Uh, Seniti, welcome. Hi, hi everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Appreciate you, all of you. I was listening in. Um, where do we start? <laughs> when it comes to East Africa, right? Um, uh, it's just overall, like, uh, 
I, it, it's frustrating because I see, you know, if I was going to start, because we're focusing on like the East Africa, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Ethiopia, right? I mean, uh, Somalia. So I, I like what's going on between, um, I guess, Somaliland. I shouldn't say Somalia because it's all one, but they, they are considering putting themselves as Somaliland. I think they're going somewhere, right? Those guys, even though they're really Somalia, right? So why can't, uh, my thing is, why can't the other side of Somalia, right, that's not, that Al-Shabaab is basically controlling, why can't not controlling. they learn from that side? I want to say controlling. Well, what the, well yeah, I know, it's not, not really controlling, but really they are controlling the citizen, right? They are the one that's, and they're being funded. We know who they're being funded, right? You know, they're hiding, I'll, I'll explain why. They're hiding uh, among the, the civilians, though basically they're, um, they're pretending to be part of the civilians, so they're basically hiding among the civilians. They're cowards. Um, mm -hmm. They're not. They're not, they're not fighting in a uh, in a position where they're showing their faces. They're hiding behind the shadows, and that's what they're doing. But but the thing is, okay, they're, yeah, they're hiding behind the shadow of the citizens. But who who are these people, right? They're uh, they're Somalians. So one thing is, it, it's not our culture to bomb people. Like it's you know this is like you know like. This is what I don't get. Like, how are they going to bomb their own people? Oh, and I know they're getting paid. You know, a lot of the Arab countries, um, Kuwait and all. And, 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 Sister, you know, sorry to interrupt. Where are you from, if yes. I may ask? Me, er Eritrea. Oh, Eritrea. Okay. Um, yeah. So you have to understand the situation in the with this uh, with Somalia. It's not it's not the Somalis. It's the it's few Somalis. Yes, but it's the very minority tribes. It's the uh, again. There's a lot of mixture within the Al Shabab. So it's the Yibir clan, which is a very minority clan. The Somali Bantus. There's, there's like, there's a lot of small minorities that are trying to take power. I, I basically, I understand, but who's funding them? You see, that's it doesn't even matter. All these tiny little clans that's happening, right? The thing is, they're being funded from outside. You got to look at the bigger picture, right? So the thing is, do do the Somalians know this is happening? Or who's who's the ones? Who is funding these small clans? Americans. That's, that's also. And Arabs, right? Yeah. The Arabs are the one which um, also you you know Somalia are doing business with at the same time. No, no, it's, it's not so the Arabs. It's the hand, Saudis. Saudis so, are the ones that um, they don't want any competition. Um, so the Saudis are trying to eliminate the horn because the horn can match the them in me, oil right? and resources. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Somalia, whether it's Saudi Arabia, whether whether it's Kuwait, whether it's U UAE, they're all the same. It doesn't matter, right? They're all Arabs. They're all they all they have the same uh, goals to keep us down as a whole in Africa. So we gotta separate ourselves from those people because they don't they're they're not there to help you. And you see what's going on in the last. They're not there to help the people of Somalia, right? If they were, then they would eliminate or help to eliminate Al Shabaab. Al Shabaab is funded by them. If America is also part of um, destroying Somalia, why are these governments, why do they keep supporting these governments or uh, that are like, you know, saying, okay, like I, I think that the, the, the president or prime minister, or, I don't know the proper term, but who just came into power said, let's bring back the Americans, right? Did you not say yeah. that? Wow, did yes. you say that? Yeah, so, so, oh like, hours, yeah. like, like, like wow. you know, like, where's the Al Shabaab to bomb this guy? Seriously. You know what I mean? Like, what? What? I don't. I just don't understand. How are they supporting this? What amount of money is 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 brainwashing you to do this? They're There's the nobody supporting you, sister. Sister, you know about sister, the four point five system, right? I understand. Escalate, it's, you know, yeah, it's, not even, it's, not, it's not even. It's not even the people like voting for this. It's a bunch of men sitting at a table making the decision. <laughs> yeah. Well said, yeah, sister. Fact. Fact. <laughs> Right. So yeah. and then so these uh, men, old men with their half suit. I'm sorry to say this, but they're a bunch of idiots because the thing is, they're not they're not doing anything good for the people. So at what point do, do does this have? To, how can we change this? Right. When do the people get involved? Like the young people, you know, again, like how 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 much more can Somalia take? How much more? death how much more because the thing is the americas uh, or the arabs they're not there just again we know the reason why they're there we know why they're dividing you know it's, it's creating chaos so 
Somalia gets never will never get peace as long as those people their hands are in it. Sister, it's the right? same with the situation that's happening right now with the dam uh, in Ethiopia and how Ethiopia the and how the the, freeway, um, the uh, Egyptians the are. Egyptian. Yeah, my queen, by the way. Oh, yeah, how the Egyptians and basically want the, the dam. They did, they, they're willing to do anything at any cost to get Ethiopia to be in such a low state that they have control of that. I mean, they even talking to countries like Djibouti, which again I call uh, the treacherous state, and uh, they're talking to Djibouti on how they can work together and basically get Ethiopia out of, Ethiopia the, situation out of the situation where they have full control of the dam. Yeah, but Crazy. that's not gonna happen because already Ethiopia has taken control. Like, it, we, you know, that they tried, they tried to d dismantle, they tried to use the TPLF to never, you know what I mean, to to so we can continue being, you know, um, ongoing, uh, like just not no development, right? So, so, so we know that's already changing. That's that, you know, they tried to do that. The truth came out. A lot of things happened, but so you can't really com compare Somalia with Ethiopia. Even though there's a lot of unrest in Ethiopia, um, things are happening there. You know what I mean? Also, we have different cultures. They have different uh, various of religion, mostly Christian, Muslim. But at least um, things Sister, are progressing. Wow. Things are progressing. Say, whether we like sister, it or not, right? They're progressing. Say, sister, they, they, they're both yes. in bad states. They're both in very bad, very, very bad situations. I could say Somalia is a bit worse. Yes, agreed. But Ethiopia is not far behind. Ethiopia is not far behind, and the reason why I say that is the TPLF are doing heavy damage. The Ethiopian government is split. You have people like the Oromos that want Oromia. You have now the the Afars that want their regions. That we have the Hararis that almost the, the region is almost gone. You have basically so many split tribes in Ethiopia that want their own sections. Sister, they're not far yeah. behind. Ethiopia far behind. Mess. Ethiopia is in a mess. It is in a mess. The reason why it's not as it's definitely not close as Somalia is definitely not, but. With, with with Ethiopia, remember, the TPLF has been in power for the last 30 plus years, right? So in those 30 years, the damage they've done is divide the country, you know, uh, divided by tribe, you know, you know, also give take land from one tribe to and add, give it to another one, uh, take from the Oromo, and, and then they would take the green land, the, the, the Tigrays, right? So they've been doing this. They have on their, on their IDs what tribe... It is you're supposed to be or whatnot like how much division can you can you create so they, they've been doing this for the last 30 years right you they see even the tigray have their own they want their own country they, they're pushing for a a country of basically tigray and they're trying to talk up with the ethiopian government to again because that's 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 going to be their bargaining tool they want, they're going to want to talk to abi ahmed well but the thing is tigray if they want to be on their own country they have nothing it's a dry land it benefits them in no shape or form they were trying to do that when, when before, you know, like last year, that was the goal. So that way, and then they would enter from, from Tigray to Eritrea, take control of Eritrea as well because of that Red Sea, right? They tried to do that, but Isaias knows, the, knows these people, Isaias meaning the, the president of Eritrea. Yeah, I know, I know he's, who Isaias is. Yeah. He's, 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 on, he's on top of it. He's, he knows these people. So he knows that's, that's when it comes to the military comes really handy, even though we have other, other issues, but at least... In that portion, he knows how to deal with people and blocks. But you understand, them. though, that, uh, the Tigray were also one of the main reasons or the reason for, you know, the the slaughter of the Tigrayans, uh, the Tigrinyas in Eritrea. They were one of the main reasons because they were in control at that time. So they um, they basically, in a way, um, the ISIS wanted some payback against the TPLF for what they did to him 30 years ago or what they did to the Eritreans 30 years ago. So it's understandable in a way. But now the Tigrayans, the Tigrayans won basically um their own sovereign nation but that could cause problems as well because in the north of it's ethiopia now, even, it, it's just a bunch of talks because even if they go i wish they would i wish they would be separated because they would have nothing they have nothing they have their little mountain uh, uh, land oh of rocks, rocks. They, they, would have, they would they would go nowhere with it right so if they wanted to be separated so, so i think at one point i'm reading uh it feels like we are not even relevant like man this is disturbing if somalia is um, welcoming u.s troops that can't see you're not going to own your country for exactly they, 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 this, this is, is crazy 
this is what we have to look at. You know, instead, yeah, instead then, of uh, I'm not, I don't take it personal. Can I just can I just put a comment? Mm. Sorry, I just want to say something. Let's not take it personal. What I'm, you know, even if you say something about well, my country, your country, we're just trying to, you know, find solutions mm. and help open up the the dialogue and see what it is for. We're not trying to say, well, you know, Somalia, okay, Ethiopia is worse because of this. We know what the problem is, but we're trying to, you know what I mean, uh, open it up. The good thing is we know what TPL, TPLF is about, and 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 there are only three million out of a hundred million uh, in in um, Ethiopia. So they will, even though they had thirty years of advance of advancement to, to be uh, in different places, be, to be part of the. Um, uh, yeah, they have basically the hands in like, every pocket, sister. They have yeah, their hands exactly. in every single pocket. Yeah, exactly, so in a way, it's going right? to be hard to kill an enemy. It's going to be hard to that's destroy an enemy right that now. has... Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's hard to kill somebody got, or kill an enemy that has their hands in every pocket. But guess so what, though? But guess what? They've been trying that, but you know what? The, uh, the Ethiopian government, the current government, they're also doing their best to, to reverse this. And of course, it's not going to happen overnight, but overall, the people of Ethiopia, they support the government. Of course they do. They know what's going it. on, right? But then also, exactly. you see what the Oromos so, are doing. You see what the Oromos are doing and how the Oromos also are siding with the Tigray, in a way. They're not really siding with them because they were killing them. <laughs> they were, yes, they yes, were, but... They were, they were killing them before, right? So that's besides the point anyway, right? That's inside that this is the Toma that as a people, we have to speak up and say, you know what, we're one people. Let's not be, be tribalism. The bigger picture is you've got these powerful Western countries coming in and coming in the middle, you know, uh, of our business, right? So... <laughs> See, so when you have really, a president, really fun, when you have a president to say, okay, you know what, we're welcoming the U.S. to come, uh, bring your military over, that is like reversing. Yeah, but the guy, the guy's you know, in charge of Somalia. Years. The guy that's in charge of Somalia is a Saudi and an American puppet. Like there's, there's nothing that, that can be done about that. He's literally a so Saudi. How the puppet. Hell is so is he a Somalian though? Yeah, he's a Somali. He's one of the major. Okay, then. You see, the problem is, the problem is, Somalians, Somalians have, in my opinion, they have an identity crisis because are they African? Are they? You're saying that, fine. But overall, I have a lot of colleagues here, Somalians that I know, they want to associate themselves with the Arabs. You know, they want to. You understand Eritrea is half Muslim too, like the Jabratis. But yeah, yes, but we don't claim. Arabic, nothing. We do not claim them. Oh, come on, sister. No, 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 no. no. Uh, look at I've, the country. I've, I've seen, I've seen the Eritreans. Country, no. Again, sister, I've again, seen I'm not Tigray trying to... Jabratis. I've seen Tigray and Jabratis, sister, claim they're from uh, uh, the Sabians in Yemen. I've literally seen them say that on national television it's, and say to my face. You know what? It is possible. Just like the way you have, you know what? You have the Tigray, some of the Tigray that live in, um, not Tigray, some of the yeah, to, uh, some of the Tigrinias. Ethiopians that live in, yeah. sorry, no, some of the Somal, sorry, um, Ethiopians that live in Israel, when we know the fir the the real Jewish people are Africans, they're saying they have they because they they don't know the history, they don't know the background, they're there with the uh, with the um, Israelis European Jewish, saying that oh yeah. The, the real land is here. We don't side with the African Americans that are coming here to you know that claim that to be their Jewish or Israelites. So they're siding with these with these European so called Jewish and these are Ethiopians. Yes, they don't know their like history. The if they knew if, but this is, but this is, I'm just saying to you, lack of history. When you don't know your history, you, you just mm. go along with the wind. That's what I'm saying. Just like something about this. Can I just say something? Because Go ahead, what you said about Somalia rang a bell in my head. And it's not very good because what I see what is happening in Europe right now and uh, with um, this in Finland looking to join NATO and all the rest. And uh, this could even trigger a world war situation. The reason why is because the bordering issues where enemies, potential enemies come next to your border is a very serious issue. Now, before Djibouti was the country, and Eritrea is not occupied by Americans. Djibouti is the country where uh, this is Somalia can easily be compromised, or Ethiopia can be compromised from. Now they have a whole Somalia to work with them. Now they have they was almost they are surrounding uh, now almost looking to encircle um, uh, this in Ethiopia at least a quarter of Ethiopia's border. They have access to it now through uh, Somalia. That is so. Ethiopia is, and that dam that is being built, 
you guys don't see what is happening here. These are the kind of moves they make. They are going to tarnish, the, they are going to destroy that region again. And they are making, they are using one stone to kill two birds. While they are occupying grounds, they are taking ground away from the Chinese. That, that is the country that is building inside Ethiopia. All those uh, re recent uh, developments that you see in Ethiopia was by the Chinese. They are yeah, the Chinese also here. won the dam. The Chinese also want to please the Egyptians because they control the canals. So it's only mutual beneficial. Yeah. Every country is against Ethiopia. Every country. Because they won the canal. And e Egypt controls the canal. So now Egypt's going to tell them, okay, then secure my waters. And then who's, 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 uh, um, who's going to go after Ethiopia? Basically every country in the world. Mm. Because Sudan is on the other side. They are almost encircling Ethiopia right now. I actually read somewhere, I don't, Sinatra, I don't know if you heard, but just recently I read that uh, South Sudan was actually going to get electricity from Ethiopia, and that's what we want to see happening. You see, you see? They, already, they, they had a talks to, to get electricity from Ethiopia to South Sudan, and that's what we want to see happening, right? So, you know, Egypt does not own the canal. They don't own, it's not theirs, right? So they don't. They can say all they want because the U.S. backs them up. But at the end of the day, uh, Ethiopia stands stood very strong. If I was Ethiopia, I would be recruiting like crazy. Right if I was Ethiopia, yeah. I would be strengthening my. Uh, that's it's going to be more than a million standing army. Army. Right this is what they are strengthening Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia right now. Can I? Can I? Can I speak? Look, on? look. I was going to point out as well. You have to understand the the Arab League. Also, Egypt is a big player in the Arab League. And um, you see some of the Arab League countries also are surrounding um, basically Ethiopia. You have Sudan surrounding it from the north. You have e e e Djibouti blocking the access to water in Somalia. Now, Somalia was, again, he wasn't, Somalia was having issues with the Arab League. He was not listening to it. It was, it was becoming a menace. And now, all of a sudden, a pro-Saudi clown has been elected. Um, basically, you have Egypt on the north. And Somalia was acting up, you know. Somalia was... Literally, uh, Saudi was uh, even stating that the Somali was not taking Saudi's side. And Somali was literally saying, nope, we're not taking your side. Somali was starting to make noise and uh, saying that they wanted to also push back on their own rhetoric. And then out of nowhere, a, I, you see this? A pro-Saudi guy got elected. You see what's happening there? And um, a pro-Saudi pro guy got elected who's, who's good friends with the royal family over there. And it's, it's just, it makes, to, to every, to, it doesn't matter if you have half a brain, it should make sense to you. Um, Ethiopia is the next target. It should make sense to you that uh, Ethiopia is the next target. It really angers me. This stuff really angers me. Somebody saying I'm angry. Why shouldn't I be angry? I, I'm watching history repeat itself. They are trying to encircle some uh, Ethiopia uh, and strangle it. They have somebody they have that somebody they like that in, they place, like in place in Ethiopia. They like the, the way they had the Tigrayans uh, in, uh, in office before. And, man, I, I can't believe I'm living through this. It's just unbelievable. Hey, our leaders welcoming foreign people into our territories. It's unbelievable. Just and, and I got a question though. Somalia, Where's the Somalia African Union? Where's the exactly. African Union? It's just, it's just, <laughs> this whole thing is kind of stuff that we should be alarmed by. This, this is why Russia is at war right now. They have not Where's invaded the Russia. Union? Where is the African Union? I want to know. Where is the African Union? You're supposed Nobody to be a union, right? You're supposed to be a, a, a continent united. So where are you? Where is the leaders of the African they Union? Listen. They don't fight? listen to African Union because African Union is against, has a policy against this military basis. But it just America just comes into the countries and just make the leaders give them the land. They, they come, let bring. At least, at least the African Union is supposed to be standing up to the Arabs and the the rest of the Arab League. So where are they? Why are they letting their African continent? Union their is continent made up of countries like Egypt, Nigeria, South Africa. Where are they? They are not going to say anything, especially the North African. They don't. They won't say anything. You see, this is a problem. They won't say anything because they think that it's in their interest that Ethiopia is curtailed. You see what is going on here? Everybody they can won't... see that the 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 the, the, um, that the river and the canal is next. Everybody with two eyes can see the canal is next. Everybody can see that the canal is becoming a problem for Egypt. Literally, I... you block the canal in two weeks, Egypt's economy can collapse. It, they see, fear no, no. it. They're... It, it, it's not what it is. You, you have to understand the bigger picture. 
the, the canal being blocked for Egypt, that's not the that's not the, the concern here. The he concern is, he is, is I'll explain the, afterwards. No, no, hold on. It, it, they don't want the rise of black people. They don't want the development of black people. Once we rise, once we develop and we know what we're worth and we know, you know, they, they can't come in and abuse and use us. So they don't want Ethiopia to have that power to, you know, to continue uh, expanding and giving electricity to Sudan, Eritrea. They don't want that. They want to. That's why you see how, how is Egypt part of the Arab League and they're also part of the African Union. Why can't we? How, how does that Africa, all the black nations, they don't have their own league. But yet you've got uh, Egypt, um, I think. I don't know the north side of some of, some of those countries. They're part of the Arab League, but they, but yet they want to be part of Africa. You know, you your country Eritrea is also uh, 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 basically not exactly a member of the Arab uh, League, but also basically somewhere in between. It's what was the word for it? We have a um, relationship with with no, with, yeah, say, Eritrea know, has with, a Eritrea is we also have, we have a relationship with um, the Arab countries, point. but we're not compromised. We're not. We don't base our decisions uh the government doesn't base decisions because of religion he always put uh up front interest the Eritrean people's interest in the country your observer your observer your observer your observer of the league anyway so i was going to yeah, also point out uh, the reason why it's and then you know we, Eritrea was also part of um just so you know when they had that East African, like Uganda, uh, Kenya, they, they used to have a league of all of those East African countries. The East African and my Federation. country withdrew itself from there. Yes, they withdrew themselves from that, the, the, the like my president, Eritrea, because he said it's, it's, not, it's not the interests of the East Africans. This is, has been compromised by the Western. So... They just want you to cut. They, they, they took. They hijacked it basically because that that federation that was when it was created, it was, it was supposed to be helping all the East African countries to develop: Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, uh, Rwanda, all those countries. So they withdrew themselves. They're like, because he saw what, what it was for, and he wasn't for it. The president. You see, of I was gonna. I was, I was gonna say something. See, I was right? gonna. I was, I was um, gonna say um, the reason why I say what I was gonna say is uh, again. Um, it's not about basically Africa unity or anything like that. The reason why um, the, the canal is so important to Egyptians is because, again, you have to understand the power they hold. Egypt's whole economy can collapse alongside with Sudan. They hold the power to destroy two countries because those two countries heavily depend on the, on the, on the canal. And Egypt does not like being on, basically, does not like having such a weakness, especially controlled by a country which it considers the enemy. And that's the reason why Egypt's making all this noise in the Arab League. That's the reason why Egypt's inviting Djibouti to basically somehow plot a way to take out uh, the, the canal. You, you have to understand and see the bigger picture. The canal can e the canal is a massive problem for Egypt. And let's just say the two countries went to war. Ethiopia, all it has to do is send half of his reserve armies to protect the canal, suffocate the waters, and, uh, and Egypt would be on his knees in a matter of weeks. Because the people will starve, the people will revolt, the people will give up. What's going to happen now when they are being encircled by the American forces that are going to act on their behalf? See, the, the, this, the, they are moving chess pieces here. And I feel like we are just watching history looking to repeat itself. And I, this Somali one, this lady just brought up, as uh, uh, Sinuti just mentioned, really alarms me because this is exactly why they are fighting Europe. You can't keep having you know, potential enemies next to your countries. If you keep having... You know, Jen, you the previous president country. of Somalia, the previous president of Somalia was anti-Arab League. He was a guy that wanted to, uh, in a way, to bring the, the, the country of Somalia back to where he was. He was kind of buying military weapons. He was building up the military. He was doing a lot of low-key stuff under the radar. He, even though I didn't agree with some of the things he was doing, I can also see some of the good things that he was doing. And um, he was also rejecting some of the proposals from the Arab League that, you know, to make heavy... I mean, they, they offered the, the Somalis, um, the Arab League uh, or the Saudis offered Somalis a lot of money and they offered them to build a lot of buildings and they even offered them the island of Sokrata, which is disputed between the Somalis and the Yemenis, but they offered them the island to send their military to send their military into Yemen and to fight, but then he refused. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. And then that, that, listen, you know, listen to this. And that, sent, that, that statement where he said no, literally proved that the, um, the, the that president was going to be a problem for the Saudis. But then out of nowhere, a pro-Saudi clown was elected. 
Yeah, because you are still suspecting each other. You pull, see, you have all you need to do whatever you need. You know, we don't even need the Saudis. We don't need any of them. If you, your people there in your country, you know, we forget. We are the ones creating the problem because we keep fighting each other. You don't see Saudis coming to Somalia and telling them, you know what, you know, the Saudi, this prince is uh, oppressing me. Can you help me so that I can bring them down? You don't see them coming to do that because they are all collected and they keep their people in check. But Somalis, one guy from one tribe can just go and sell the other one out. No, no, we don't sell each other. We don't sell each other. That's what you don't. Is it not somebody that signed up with the Americans now to come into the country? Are you telling me? No, 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 I'm talking about now. No. No, no. Look, in, in, on, I'm talking talk about like one uh, Somali uh, guy. No, it's a tribal dispute to Niger. It's not about me selling. No, it's not. It's not like that. You're not gonna see Somalis physically. No, you're gonna see. No, no, uh, I'm not saying selling. I'm saying, dispute. but it doesn't matter. Is the end. You want to get an advantage over the other Somali. That's where the problem is. But, but to Niger, what's the solution? You guys been been talking about the, the problems like four hours now. Yeah, the <laughs> solution. That's not, I've I've talked about the solution. I said you have to have a conversation within the country, honestly about what all the groups that have that feel marginalized and what all the groups that feel like the other group is not being fair to them resolve the issues among yourself and decide that okay our faith is linked within mm. uh, our country and make decision based on the country don't rely on anybody don't even rely on african union don't rely on next door neighbor rely on mm. yourselves but why is because, the african okay, union okay, not I, I, I have a question you go ahead brother Okay, did, did you know that in Somaliland they're they're currently sending a lot of like like uh students where I am like to learn about like agriculture, like health, like nuclear technology engineering. What if they sent them in mass and brought them to a place like for example, I don't know if you know, but in Ethiopia and Kenya right now, they have a lot of nuclear energy and geothermal energy projects. In fact, th there's this kind of like arms race between Russia and China of like who can share like the uh, nuclear like energy and geothermal energy technology. What if there was like a place in uh, Somaligape, like uh, Ogaden, like in Ethiopia, where there's a diaspora community? Because I, I was talking about, we're talking about this. Um, in Somaligape, in Ethiopia, they have the most diverse amount of plants. So if they if they were to like band together, like fund a community project along with the, like a state government, uh, the community and the diaspora to like get a nuclear project into Somali Galbed, like nuclear energy, and then sell it to different regions. They could use that to like build like a security force along with like Eritreans and Ethiopians that are not necessarily secessionists that are unionists to be able to stabilize regions, like to be able to make their own first aid, to be able to like make their own security drones, to be able to bring the technology that's in Taiwan. Because a lot of Somali landers, they come to Taiwan to study like technology, like health, those kind of stuff. What if there was a community like that? Do you think that would be beneficial? Because I think a lot of us, we complain from it from uh, like outside because we're in diaspora. But if we had a place where we could be able to get together to talk about these kind of issues, we could be able to move on it instead of just talking about it. Like, so my, my, my uh, question like basically was like, what if there was a, what if there was a place where these people are they going for these like these highly technical jobs that don't exist. What if that existed in Ethiopia? Do you think that would be a good thing? Would that be some place where you want to live if it exists? Um, yes, and I'll explain it into uh, into a term. Uh, basically, with the nuclear, are you, are you mainly focusing on the the question about the nuclear? Um, basically, having nuclear arms within. Uh, no, not um, nuclear arms. Nuclear arms. The the easiest way to get nuclear arms would be from North Korea or Pakistan. What I'm, what I'm saying is. Basically, in North Africa and East Africa, China and Russia, they're competing against each other to supply nuclear materials to develop nuclear energy, like nuclear energy projects. Yeah. Nuclear energy is one, like, it's one of the most, like, cleanest about energies. And it could, if we send these type of students to, because um, I don't know if you know this, but I feel like a lot of the projects that we do with China, uh, because we're not sharing this kind of information with people on the ground, we hold it to ourselves, pretty, why, pretty much why I talk here. Um, basically... There, we don't have like there's no bulletproof cars. China, they could easily supply bulletproof cars. Uh, yeah. China, they have they have a lot of um, they're the number one, they have number one, number two, and number three university in mining technology and engineering. So, if you send your students to study instead of sending them because they send some Somalis there to like uh, sell, yeah, like, yeah I know, food. I know. Like, but it's Somali yeah. food. <laughs> like, send your students instead of sending them to sell some food, send your students there for the mining and. Mining and learn about that, yeah. 
so that they can start their own mining engineering technology in the horn so that when yeah. they when they get these type of uh, gold diamond bauxite stuff like that they can be able to know how to refine it start their own type of uh refinement so that they bring can bring in income into the horn yeah yeah making real income not just like the the oil because like the oil they only make a few billion off the oil in the, uh, uh in ethiopia and it's not giving to the people that's in, another uh, thing like there's massive there. oil there's massive oil reserves in the horn and the saudis right. are keeping a close eye because they're going to run out soon so they're going to try to use the horn as their new oil uh um because again why do you think the saudi prince is pushing this 2030 um city of dreams that he's trying to make because he knows the oil has a limit on it. It's going to run out soon. And I don't, I don't know if you know this, but Somalia, they're also one of the highest uh, ranked in wind energy potential. So if, yeah, Somalia, yeah, yeah, yeah. if Somalia was stable, boy, you guys could just build a bunch of windmills, power like 20 to 30% of your uh, country just based on wind energy alone. Because I feel like the oil and gas is pretty much a waste of time. Like we're trying to re replicate what's already happened in, in like the 1950s, 1960s. So what I'm saying, if they're going to just... And uranium. Things, one yeah, third of uranium. the world's uh, uranium is in Somalia. Yeah, and Nab Namibia, they're the fifth ranked in uh, uranium as well. But they've been been—they've done a great job of keeping the American, Chinese, and Russians away from it. Like, they have a lot of highly uh, skilled individual, individuals there. So my, my point was basically... Wherever saying, there's natural resources, you can expect an American there. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So my point was actually <laughs> saying is that we should okay. be sending them for the right things instead of... Because a, a lot of the type of like jobs that they and like uh studies that they get sent for is has nothing to do with what they could be used what could be useful to them in the continent but at least what i've seen from the smile landers is they're sending their kids for stuff that's important and that'll actually like for example like water con conservation soil conservation there's droughts going on in ethiopia if someone they started a company there like i'm looking at the scholarship list if someone started a company there they could buy some UAE, like UAE uh, cloud seeding technology to help with the droughts that is going to affect the horn in the next few years. So we need to be focusing on stuff like that. Because I felt like I've tried to stay silent, but I felt like the whole four hours had been just like a pity party, in my opinion. So I tried to stay out of it. But go ahead. No, no. Um, it was it was actually a decent discussion. Um, Let me with... add something to this. I think you go ahead. I've been saying that we that region needs to be looking more like Eritrea. Because look at look at let me read a transcript from, from Africom what they said. They said fifth, as the guy was making a point about Africa. He said in Africa, a few troops, a few bucks still goes a long way. Modest and <laughs> yeah, modest and predictable investment yield outside outsized returns for US and African security interests. So these people they understand that we are so easy to manipulate that they, they a few troops a few that is how terrible our people have let ourselves become and that's why i say that region should be looking like if you want to stand a chance that region should be looking like eritrea everybody should be on a lot and like no more funding troops in this area. You need to start considering leaving. If you want to be here, you be here on our terms, and we are going to be strong. Not when you bring military that are way stronger than you, outsize you completely into your country. That power differential is too massive. You, they are basically colonizing you right before our eyes. But tonight, that's that's what that's what I'm saying is that they should send the students for the right things, like because the three the three top reasons they come for Africa is for the security. Uh, for the mining and for the energy resource, not only just energy resource, but in terms of the human resources, they want to make sure that our country is so destabilized so that people like me and you and Mo, we're not in our countries, we're outside of our countries. So my point was, is that basically, if we send our students to the right things, they bring those type of like nuclear uh, energy technology, the mining technology to Africa, which is basically the, the like probably over $100 trillion business, you can use the money that you make from that to build the kind of the kind of military that you always talk about in Somali got bed. So you can use the Ethiopians, the Eritreans, and the Somalis in that region. You can build a diaspora community because one, giga, one gigawatt en of energy can power over 750,000 homes, right? Yeah. So if you had like a university, you had a diaspora community that could build these type of things that they're experiencing mining technology, you know, agriculture, soil con conservation, uh, technology, semiconductor, stuff like that in China and Taiwan where the students are going anyway, and they send their students for the right stuff, they can bring them back to Africa and be able to build the type of military you want because you cannot build a military without money. You see what I mean? You see, this is the problem I was going to point out. 
there is abundance of resources. Let's like let's talk about the horn in general. There's an abundance of resources in the horn, and the problem with the horn is they're too they're too busy focused on each other. <laughs> whether it be whether it be it's, it's like it's, it's crazy. Whether it be Somali versus Somali, Habasha versus Habasha, or vice versa, Somali versus Habasha, oh. or like it's just it's just it's it's crazy, man. Like it's the concept of like the concept of reality is in a way for me is dwarfed. Their concept of reality is more of focusing on each other, but not focusing on the bigger problem. Mm. I mean, I'm not suggest. I'm suggesting more of an understanding and a unity of you know personal gain than anything else. Because if you have a unity of personal gain, that means you both have something to gain from it. Mm. So why not unite in a unity where again this ideals of pan uh, Ethiopia or no, no, not like like not pan Ethiopia, but greater Ethiopia, greater Somalia. This vision has to die. Because again, mm. to uh, for Greater Ethiopia to be uh, realized, you're going to have to disturb your neighbors and try to take back parts of the the so-called land of Abyssinia. For Greater mm. Somalia, or as the Somalis call Somali Wayne, right? like you have to take part again, part of your surrounding neighbors, which can cause massive problems and distrust. So that ideal has to be killed because that will cause a future problem unless it's disputed, uh, or unless unless it's solved thoroughly and accurately by the people and the government itself, and they're both happy mm. with doing the trade. Other than you, that, you know what you are saying. What you are basically saying is that the people are being distracted by shiny objects of Greater Somalia. And brother, I've seen you know, I've seen a necklace of a brother wearing a Greater Ethiopia necklace, where it basically oh. suggested he's annexing each Eritrean part of Djibouti, which will cause massive problems. Is Wait, exactly but isn't, isn't the Horn trying to confederalize kind of though? Because mm. they, keep, they keep making all these projects. Well, at least before Famarjo was kicked out. But they keep making all these projects between uh, Eritrea and Somalia. Like I said earlier, they, they were just talking about reopening the ports between Eritrea and Ethiopia. So my 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 theory is, I'm, I think Isaiah is just waiting for, because he's, he's not going to be able to rule there forever. Like He's like 76 years old. He's waiting for uh, Abby to actually get a hold of his regions and with these ethnic conflicts and solve it somehow. For him to no, no. Isaiah, is, Isaiah is probably going to have somebody like his son or maybe a close relative take charge because Eritrea yeah. has done both. Well, they went through many, 30 years of bloody civil war to to get where, where they want to. They, they went through blood. It's basically uh, the ancestors paid in blood to get where they are. May, yeah. Many, many years of fighting. I mean, I remember uh, my close family used to tell me how, like, how crazy that war was, but Eritreans, I don't think that they would be too pleased with going back to under the rule of Ethiopia. But if we're talking, if we're talking on a on a scale of you know um, like trade and uh, you know maybe because uh, again okay, I understand because if as long as Eritrea exists there will never be waters for Ethiopia because again as long as like uh, Djibouti is like its own sovereign nation it has protection from outside people but even if it never had protection from outside people it can still protect its own its own interests and it still has the military capabilities to protect itself Eritrea. As long as they exist, there will never be waters for Ethiopia. And Somalia is already facing its own problems. So if you're looking at it from a perspective of, you know, maybe Ethiopia is the hope, it's not because it's landlocked. And if, okay, I understand, uh, well, uh, even if it's, even if it's, even if it's like, you know, even if it sorts itself out, it's still always going to lack the, the, the waters. And water is a massive plague. If you control some sort of water, you have a massive role. Especially if, uh, if you have control of the horn and the water. But yeah, it's just why, why is Ethiopia it? not acting as if they are. See, my concern is that the president of Ethiopia is moving too sluggishly, and the, the way they behave, I don't know what they our leaders. I don't know what they are dreaming, what they see. How is it that there is no sense of urgency? Why is it that our people are Imagine, like this? There's fires everywhere in Ethiopia, right? There is way too many problems on this place, brother. Do you you're not understanding the concept of how bad Ethiopia is right now? There is problems in every region if you look at the then, south of ethiopia the oromos one day conference call a sovereign conference let everybody come together see, every they single come, one of i'll explain why to niger the south Orom, oromos want their oromia their own land they've always been dreaming about this oromia for centuries and then up to the north or onto the north north uh, east you have the hararis and the hararis are basically to me a dying species because everybody is stealing their land you have the Hararis that are basically going to every region in Ethiopia because their land is being taken by the expanding Afars and the Oromos. 
you have the Afars that expanded out from e, uh, e, uh, what's it called northern Djibouti to southern Eritrea to western Ethiopia. That little triangle is this. They have basically a piece of every nation. And they're it's expanding it's heavily it's too. It's you have the Amharas. Our is that. See, yeah, you have the Amharas. You have the Amharas. No, brother, no, you have the Amharas where every no. single tribe in Ethiopia hates for some reason. I you have the Gorak. Is is it's it's brother, you have the Gorak. You have the Gorak where Abi is from. I've Abi... seen all the wolves. I've seen that in Nigeria too. The problem with our leaders is that they are not talking to their people like their people. They are not talking to their people like the people that they've lived next door to for thousands of years. They keep talking and like, oh, I'm your leader, or you, 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 your, your belief. I don't believe in your nation. You let them. If you talk to them like people you are believing next door to for thousands of years, yeah, you let them understand. If you want your nation, technically you do have your nation. What is your grievances for being part of Ethiopia? Because if you are so keen on breaking up from Ethiopia and then so many you tribes, so many problems. African Union, why are you so keen on signing up with African Union, but you don't want to sign up with somebody that is right next door to you? Well, that's you the problem. To... So many tribes, so many problems. See, I don't care Ethiopia. about the, the problems. Don't matter if you talk to the people and let them remember whom they truly are and let them look at themselves. What is happening to their country while they are doing these things? Show them some of all these documents that the people are laughing at us about, telling them that look at how easy people can ma be manipulated. They, are, they paint a dream for you that you will never have. You see the Kurd Kurdish people in Iraq. That's what they used to think that they're going to have their own nation. They literally fought side by side with U.S. soldiers in the end. After U.S. soldiers got what they want, they left them and to their fate. You, they keep lying to our people with Biafra. They did that with Biafra. They did that with um, uh, this in uh, Odudua. They are doing that with uh, these um, uh, Oromo people that you're going to get. You're not going to get anything. The only thing that is going to happen is that both of the country will start fighting each other. And then who, who runs the show? We repeat the same mistakes of our forefathers. This will never end if we don't cut it out. Sooner or later, our leaders need to start talking properly. That Ethiopian president, I just feel like he's not doing a good enough job. He's doing his best, but maybe he too has his own biases. That's why he's not coming across well to the other tribes. Because it's one thing to have other tribes, have leaders that are, you know, very tribalistic and want, you know, they hate the, the central government and all the rest of it. It's another thing for the people to listen to this um, uh, um, Ethiopian president and feel like, you know what? He's saying the kind of things I want to hear. I don't care what my leaders are telling me. He's telling me, look at our lives. This fight we are fighting, we're not getting anywhere. And we are going to get what we want. If you're going to get a level of autonomy, only security and foreign policy and all those areas that are controlled from the center, then what is the problem? I just feel like if he starts talking to the people like his people, not seeing them like, oh, you want to break up Brother, the what's the African Union doing to help cool the situation off? Because again, African the whole... Union is too weak to do anything. The biggest strength you can have is from your own home. I believe that is where the, he needs to focus. Because if you start telling them that and telling them, you know what? Every region, send your people into the military. Send them to come and protect your land. But because one like, of the things they do want is to that... fight for so long, they, they think there is... is upper, like. They've been very much to think it's an occupying force. Why would they fight for the military? Exactly. Okay, you see my point. When you that, when... that's, that's how the TPLF that's how the TPLF uh, gained so much ground in the first place because over ninety percent of TPLF were the generals, the NCO, the high rank officials. But, but that's my problem. That's why I'm saying you want to avoid because if you bring you say every single region bring a proportionate amount of uh, military um, officials to be rec uh, re recruited into the military, what will happen is that they will rise up the rank. Like every other group, you have a proper representation into the military. You have a proper representation into the um, uh, this in the, the political system. If you have that, if you make that kind of uh, overture to the other groups, they will feel like they are part of a family. This thing whereby mm -hmm. one person gets into power and they feel like, oh, you know what, my Oromo people are going to back me up. That's going to be the base of my power. You, you mean like not, you mean like force them together like what happened with Eritrea? Oh, sorry for cutting. You mean like forcing them together like what happened with Eritrea? Like with the conscription? Well, you see, Eritrea, you... and I'm not even talking about the Eritrea one because if you try to do that with the Eritrea one, you're going to fail because the other groups are already got their guns point and suspicious of you. You can't do that. And if you try to do that, the, the are foreign forces all around the country that will sabotage it. If you, if any African country goes to war today, you saw what happened with Ethiopia. They tried to manipulate it already. If, and Ethiopians were, uh, this thing, clocked onto it very quickly and reacted very quickly. Otherwise, maybe uh, uh, this president would have been out of office by now. So 
you have to use a different tactics. You have to use a more conciliatory tactics and say, you know what? You want um, um, share in the military, you come in. You want share in the political system, you come in. All your grievances, if you resolve them without any fear, when your only focus is making Ethiopia a strong country, you, I believe they will support you. Every other group will start. Even though you are stupid leaders that are telling them not to listen, they will not listen to them. Because the, the leaders, what have they given to them? The leaders have not done anything for their people. Their people are still suffering. If mm. you paint a picture that they feel is better than what their leaders are offering to them, even the leaders will, will bend. If they don't bend, they will remove them. Because that is what people, that's how people react when they see an opportunity that is going to make their lives better. And I believe that this Ethiopian president is not doing a very good job of it. He, I think he tries, but I don't think, I think he's, he also has that uh, poison of tribalism in his system or that poison of feeling like, oh, my own group is the one that's going to back me up or some kind of click in the country is going to, no, focus on the people. I believe that if he focuses on the people, he can call for a million man army and you will see the, you will see them, they all march out to defend the country. Your country is in your hand. You have the power to change the history of that country if the people, if the leader just do, does the right thing. And I don't know how he, how you can change your mind. I don't know, but I just feel like he should be doing more because when he, when the war started, that's when he started calling people to come and join the military. Who does that? You waited until you know, the war started. Yeah. What stopped with them me? What you said last time. To come and fight for the country. What you what you said last time to Niger actually, you know, it kind of got me thinking when you said again. Uh, where, where you said in the previous statement, we said the Horn is one of the oldest regions, but yet it's always uh, 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 basically uh, it's it's, in the, it's one of the oldest regions. But look at the situation it is in now. I don't yeah. remember saying something along the lines uh, a while back ago. Yeah, uh, I may have said it. I may have said they, it. Uh, they should have a lot more. They should understand themselves more than any group. When you think about it, they've been at that, that region for a very long time. They should know themselves more. And how can you? subsidize uh, substitute that for foreign interests coming to divide you and uh, the, man i just is this is where leadership comes in if you ask me and i don't understand what is happening to our african leadership i really don't understand Niger, the problem is uh, this, this is why uh, like, this one gentlemen as was ready to sleep <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, I, i'm not gonna be doing the records and uh uh, doing the 10 hour or 12 hours tonight. So I, 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 I will be doing the, the, the long stream tonight. I think this this one um, needs another show. We are going to have another one. Hope we might do it even next week, uh, Friday again for part two, where we, uh, Pai has already uh, mentioned that we need to now bring the part two on solutions and other questions. There's a lot of questions that I wanted to ask about uh, the horn, most of the countries around there. Uh, but obviously we had a lot of people, a lot of insight being shared um, and we could not get to them. But uh, I want us next time to focus more on the potentials of uh, the horn of Africa, the mineral uh, potential that is uh, untapped minerals that is in the, in the ground, in the sea, uh, and uh, around that region as a whole, and ways that we can, uh, what I mean, solutions come up with solutions uh, to develop the horn and make sure that uh, it reaches its uh, full potential. And um, yeah, and I think that's the main focus now. Um, and I think today we, we, we were all venting so much about uh, this leadership not being good for this, and this one being this, labeling, and all that stuff. But I think now we need to come up with ways that we think will work for our society and uh, as uh, on Africa and most basically on the horn. And um, that's where we should be putting more our energy on. You know, we, there's time to to highlight problems and also time to, to uh, come up with ways because we cannot always be complaining about how things are bad without us having some sort of a, an idea of what we can do as Africans, you know. So I want us in the the, the coming um, part two of this conversation that we, we focus more on solutions um, and way and things that maybe they are happening the good things that are happening in those places as well not just solutions but the good things that are happening in those places because it, despite all the challenges despite all the problems that we are having we still have people who who are out there who are working hard who are making a lot of difference in those societies. So it's not all uh, bad. It's not all 
uh, I mean, <laughs> how do I put this? It's not like we we, we can't, uh, nothing is going on. There are people who are doing certain things there, regardless of the challenges that are out there. So I want us to focus on that as well. All the, all the good things they are doing is about to be, is about to come to naught. Given the, <laughs> the, the yeah, uh, all the good they've done is about to be wiped out. Given what I just heard from uh, CNT about uh, Americans mm. coming into Somalia again now, it's just, mm. Mm. it's that's, that's, that's why I have to come south and become general of Nigeria. Become the senior. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, I, if I was a general, I would be I'm so paranoid like crazy, man. Like, two what? Niger should run for the African Union president. Why are we not paranoid? What is wrong with us? What does it take yeah. for us to be paranoid? Tiny Finland. Jesus Christ. The problem is, is uh, our uh, countries are being run by people that don't give a damn. Right. We, we're down to two leaders that are, that are independent. Three, if you consider Barbados. And even if the younger that ones... That yeah, you're right, Pai. Well. Even if the younger ones want to take control of the country and actually move, move it pro, like move it forward like look, look something along the sides of the the chinese revolution where they move past 100 years of shame they even called it the century of shame of because they want people to remember how china was when the european colonialists and all of the other countries were exploiting the hell out of it when the people were addicted to opium and now look at it i, think, I mean I you're think, telling I mean, you, need to, you, need to, you need to have that kind of name for this era this era that came before now i think people because if you have a name for it you are now you have not grouped it and say you know what this is we our call it the, the yeah, 300 years shame so. of africa exactly something like that so that people will understand what is you are contextualizing the problem that we have been facing and you are giving them a way out i think that might be something that you know language matters you know all these things I, I it's just for me i'm just a little bit alarmed and when i look at the documents that they write about us it's just so shameful it's really shameful it's really, I, we really need to really hold our head and wonder how is this keep how, how does this keep happening over and over and we are not here i'm i'm in the uk here mounting off all over the place and these people are on the ground doing the business all the only people that have consciousness of all these things most of the people that have the consciousness are not on the ground that is a problem if we are on the ground most of us were in in our countries we'll be able to be changing minds every single day even if you went to nigeria to nigeria and you wanted to change the system that's going on into uh, in nigeria and try to make it as fair as possible there's going to be people that are going to stand against you the thieves that are benefiting from the the division in nigeria will come in front of you because you're going to be interrupting their cash flow oh no you see what i'm discussing here doesn't have any to take money from them they are going to make more money even it's like just have you seen i'll just remind them you see um, uh, jeff bezos or elon musk yeah you are not taking money from them this is an easy argument you are you go to the military you tell them oh you want more guns we will give you more guns but everybody will get more in order for nigeria to be independent yeah they would have to stop trading with europe because over 20 percent of the trade with europe so if anything happened, yeah. they could just cut off the money flow. That's the problem. And plus, Nigeria is part of the um, the Commonwealth, so you technically answer to the UK. Oh no, no, no! That don't that one is not. I, I think we don't even need the Commonwealth to be, to answer to the UK. We answer to the UK without the Commonwealth. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't need the Commonwealth to assert to the UK. You think, you think the French need any kind of Commonwealth to assert to the French? They are, look at Somalia. Somalia is a Muslim country calling for a hidden uh, military to come into their country. This is madness. Oh, it's depressing, man. It's depressing. It really is. Oh, my God. We have God. a clown in the seat. We have an absolute clown. In the first 24 hours, it does that. Good Lord, I hate to imagine the next four years. Oh, yeah, the, one, one of the one of the things uh, we have to focus on, you know, yesterday we just brushed off, and I did a quite a, a different research, and I'm going to bring it to uh, Diaspora Talk tomorrow. Is the uh, mm. the change the change that we want? What is the old change that we need to change, and what is the neutral zone because people don't want to have change? After the neutral zone, now you begin to accept a process. So we are talking all our problems, which is good. We got the, the past, understand, and what is the new strategy? What is the old way and what's going to be the new way? 
So we're going to have to decipher it phase by phase. What is the first thing we want for this change? The change on the ground. Easy, easy change. These are the key, key topics that I'm going to bring in tomorrow. And these changes, if they're not focused, laser focused, and the panelists, the commentators are not in the same zone, you don't expect everybody to 100% to, to be in the same thing. So it's the beginning of change of the old, and then we'll have people that's going to be in the neutral zone. Basically, they're revolting, they, they, they kind of not accepting, uh, maybe there's a lot of uh, of that that's going on. And then the beginning, once we said, okay, this is what we focused on. Do we agree? Do we have, you know, the panel in our in our uh, panel? We don't need to to have a, a gazillion people to make a, a the difference. So we need to identify things that are very important for the change. What do we need? There's a lot of things that we we can change, but we need to prioritize from the bottom up, what is the change we want? We have to be focused. Right now, for me, there was an opportunity for Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, Djibouti to form a military, mm -hmm. okay? And that got cut short. It's, I mean, it's still there, okay? But now that they know, there won't be no empire that's gonna be in there. There won't be a, a chance for the eagle to land, you understand? So already they're planning, now they got the opportunity within 24 hours. That, that shows you where the money came from because there's no government that can react in 24 hours and show it in action. Mm. These Saudis are the things that we have to, these are the things that we have to be very careful because now it's just a week. And once they come in, there'll be another issue. Because on the ground, I'm pretty sure they, they're kind of shocked. Because when you come in and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, that means they are overriding your <clears throat> constitution, mm. your right of living. Because who dies? Somalian. Not American. It's going to be Somalian. So why should I have that kind of mentality? Why is it the key? What is the change right there? The first change. No foreign legion. It should be all African. By African. These are the change. Acceptance of another legion that comes on, on the, his, his own interest and literally occupy a space, a land, where an, another Somalian can live. But it's occupation. If you got a whole army of 500 coming in, it's occupation. So we have to identify why this occupation happens in 24 hours. It was just, uh, it was shocking for me. And now you understand the Ethiopian struggling to get rid of the TPLF. Now they're closer than ever. So that is a threat for the horn. These are the things that we have to really look and being ready to really say no. These are the things that we have to really understand the policy because U.S. policy never change. The president change. Give it 10 years. All these people right there on top, the one that always have something against it before they pass it in. I'll oh, sorry to check it on. I got to go. Uh, but yeah, thank you uh, guys for inviting me in the panel. Um, it's been a good talk. Um, we discussed... Um, the, the craziness of the horn um, and how tribal it can get. And uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, because there's only hope right now at this moment of time because, you know, we've got basically crazy people as leaders. Um, we can eventually move forward from this process. Um, I mean, 
you guys need to keep the horn in your prayers, man. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, um, next, next time we should talk about solutions, you're welcome to come back. Yeah, hundred percent. I'll be back. Um, you just yeah. you guys need to uh just tell me the date. Uh, on um, I already got the the Swahili Nation brother on WhatsApp, so you mm. can notify me on the date. But yeah, it was an interesting talk. That's what I gotta say. Um, hey, yeah, join me tomorrow Thank- if you can. It's gonna be diaspora talk. So uh, diaspora talks the- on YouTube. Uh, yes. Okay, no problem. Uh, um, we'll, we'll notify it on the uh, WhatsApp itself. So. Okay. I'll be sending uh, some of the links. Thank you. Because, uh, we'll we're going to be there, talking right? about, you know, the relation between the diaspora and whatever that we have on land and what the changes that we want. That's my uh, highlight tomorrow. No problem. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. One of the things I want you to know more, when you said hope, I think uh, we have to understand that the stuff is in our hands. We shouldn't necessarily hope. We have control over it. And I believe that when we start believing that we have control over it, we will not need to hope anymore. Yep. It's within Hopefully. your head. Hopefully. <laughs> mm. It's ours, yeah. it's ours to, to control, not hope that they we, we succeed against them. We can succeed if we just do what we need to do. No it's worries. not even that hard when you think about it, really. It's weird. It's not even that hard because other people did it, and now you begin to respect how other people were able to pull something relatively it's not simple. Hard. Off. When we think about it, it's not hard. But the problem is, there's snakes, there's, there's snakes in the grass, there's people that are benefiting from the chaos of our countries that are actually our countrymen. There are people like that, there are people like that with hidden and protected by the outsiders and given lots of cash and influence, influence to basically ruin the country. And those people are going to be the hardest to get out because they have the backing of the whole tribe saying that we're doing this for the country. We're doing this for my tribe. And nobody can go up against them because you're fighting a whole tribe. You see, this can be a problem. <laughs> if I may yeah. say so. No, no, it's, good. It's, good. it's language. I think it's language and your belief. If you, like you now, you believe, If to be fair, you were calling some people cowards today, so I don't know. But if you believe that, <laughs> yeah, if you believe, truly believe you need to bring your people together you don't even have to guess. Once you talk, they will hear you. Because everybody will be listening. They will be gauging. Oh, what is he saying? Does he sound like one of those crazies that want to take advantage of? They will hear you. And if they know that you are pointing the fingers at some other threat that is greater, they will, people will listen. That is what I know. Because everybody knows how to listen to people. They are not stupid. They will hear you and know that you are trying to do the right thing. And then they will listen. They will follow you. This is not rocket science. Everybody, all the other nations that did it, this is how they did it. They just say, enough is enough. Come together, our people. Let's fight this bigger threat. And that was it. Even if there are divisions, there will be some people that will be divided. It's not going to matter. Because the, ma- the majority of the population, they will be so psyched that they will be willing to kill millions just to get it done. Absolutely. If you look at the history of Soviet Union and uh, uh, this in, uh, what they call it, China, that should, yeah. what is, that should tell you. This world will be so psyched that they don't care what they destroy to get what they want. 100%. Thank you guys anyway for having me. Thank you, family. Uh, thank you guys thank you. For, for joining us tonight. And uh, it was really uh, a pleasure seeing uh, two Niger, Leech, uh, Dr. K, Biggie, Prof. Ezra, uh, Pai, um, Mo, uh, Wasami, um, Zakir, thank you very much, family, for all those who've joined us tonight. His Excellency Mika, he was here as well earlier. Thank you, thank you for joining us, and thank you for, for, for being the guardian of Africa and uh, the guardian of uh, people of color all over the world. And uh, I must say that, um, this is we are growing and we are. Uh, uh, reaching to so many people, uh, continue being uh, part of this family, continue supporting us, continue subscribing, continue uh, joining the, the live streams and uh, some of the videos that we upload. Uh, I mean, be active and let's make sure that uh, uh, we grow as a family and we grow as, as a people and, we, and let's make sure that our voices are heard out there. And uh, regardless of whatever happened tonight, um what i've heard that has been happening to other uh channels uh to you as well uh to niger that you had uh, an attack um we pray that all this will stop 
And uh, those who are doing this, uh, I don't know what is their gain, what is their strategy, but it will fail. It has already failed. It will not. It will never. You can never rise uh, 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 by disrupting a movement. It's like you standing in a train station a, uh, and trying to stop a moving train. You will get crushed. So use your energy for productive uh, things. For those who've been trying to do funny things, use that energy to build your life, build your community, build society, bring positive things in society and not interrupt other people. You don't grow by interrupting other people. You grow by building something for yourself, for your family and the world because the world needs solutions. We don't need uh, people that are, 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 are really negative and trying to destroy others. Yeah. No one has ever built anything by destroying others. They always go down. So for those who've been doing that, I, I, I just encourage you, if brothers and sisters, let's build, let's build, let's build. Let us be an inspiration to others. And some of the things that we do today, it's not for us only. It's for the generations to come. Generations that will come after us, they'll ask us what have we done in our lifetime? What have we done as society in this day and age? You've got the tools Let's utilize them to make an impact. Let's utilize them to uh, make sure that our so societies get better, our societies grow, our societies uh, uh, are impacted and are really active in those uh, platforms. All these platforms that we have here is for us to uplift ourselves. Let us not waste time in negative energies and trying to destroy others, but let's get inspired. Which means if somebody, if those people are watching to Niger on this show, which means they do love what he's doing, but they don't know how to get his attention. Just come and, and say, you know what, brothers, I love how, how you do things. I'd love to be part of the movement. Oh, I'm, I don't really like what you're doing, but I'd love to do something different. Just guide me on how I can do uh, this thing, uh, this YouTube thing or whatever. People are, are out there, they can even teach you. You can even watch other videos of other people who can even show you how to do it. You don't have to have the same content, but do something really constructive in these platforms. And just, let's make just, sure that I just wanted to highlight this statement by mm. uh, pro woman J. He says, Let's take power by choice, not chance and hope. Mm. And uh, I think that is a very poignant statement uh, that we need to understand and absorb uh, because that is how you make change. You, you, you don't hope for it, you make it happen because you mm. choose. Thank you very much, uh, you. pro woman. <laughs> Had a nice statement. Uh, also agree with that statement. So thank you very much. And do not forget tomorrow, uh, 9 p.m. East African time, Biggie will be here uh, with the Diaspora Talk. So join us again. We are live again tomorrow. We are live again. In fact, today, uh, for some of us who are already in Africa or Central Africa, it's already uh, uh, a Saturday morning. I know, Biggie, it's still an afternoon for you there in the U.S., uh, but we are already on a Saturday uh, morning. <laughs> so tomorrow, uh, for those who are still in America, that will be your tomorrow. But for us this evening, we'll be having a live stream with our host, Biggie, the Diaspora Talk. Uh, Biggie, what are you discussing again? Uh, you kind of mentioned it, but uh, can you just repeat that again? The conversation uh, for, for, for your show? Yeah, tomorrow we're going to be discussing about the uh, changes and the effect uh, and the uh, relation uh, why the engagement is slow through the diaspora versus in the African ground level, what's been worked, what's, it's about change, you know, how we can, we can accept this change and for that change, what needs to be changed, that's going to be the uh, main, main topic. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, uh, just give me a, a, a second. I'll give you a little bit of flavor of it. Um, give me a second. I just got home myself, so I'm on a cell phone. I, I hope it's not going to cut off. Uh, there was a thing that I prepared, uh, probably work it uh, with uh, Mika tomorrow. Uh, uh, th this is how it goes. Africa wants change. Okay. Life is a series of natural, spontaneous change. Don't resist them. That only creates sorrow. Let reality be reality. Let things flow naturally forward in whatever way they like. That was Lao Tzu that said that. 
And for me, a state United States strong don't falter. That's the thing. We falter a lot. So this is just a little bit of a highlight of what I'm going to bring in tomorrow. And uh, hopefully everybody that is on the, on the panel and everybody that's going to be on the comment section, join me tomorrow. It's going to be a very interesting uh, topic. And it, it, it took me a while to put it together, but uh, hopefully uh, uh, this will clear up our direction for the change. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Biggie. Uh, join Biggie tomorrow or to, no, this evening, depending on where you are, for the diaspora talk. Um, and uh, another thing, just to thank everybody who joined us tonight, uh, all the comments, all the, uh, I mean, the, the likes, uh, the, all the interaction. We really appreciate each and every one of you, and we love you. And uh, continue supporting us, continue supporting the movement. And continue subscribing since we have another channel called One Africa. Okay, that's our sister channel to Swahili Nation. So please uh, uh, subscribe to that channel. Uh, as His Excellency has already said that in the coming uh, months, we'll be doing more of the live streams there on the One Africa channel. But currently we're running both on, on Swahili Nation and uh, One Africa channel. So subscribe. If you're a subscriber of Swahili Nation, be a subscriber of One Africa um and let's grow let's make sure that these two channels uh uh really push the good numbers in terms of uh the looking at okay so alienation has already has a lot of subscribers already but let's push on africa as well to be on par with with, with swahili nation and um again um join us every night um tomorrow is the diaspora talk uh sunday 9 p.m east african time is the hidden hand with Munda Tezi. Monday, it's His Excellency Mika. He'll be here with the conversations with different uh, stakeholders, different uh, influential people in society. And Tuesdays, uh, we've got our sister Tenzen with African traditions. Um, I know uh, Tenzen also broke a record this week. Uh, this week. And uh, the following day, it was uh, on Wednesday, it's uh, uh, Professor Ezra. He has the, the longest record now on, on Swahili Nation in terms of the live stream over 12 hours. Uh, we broke two records uh, this uh, week, uh, Biggie. <laughs> Tenzin on Tuesday was 11 hours, almost 12 hours. The following day, we thought we were going to relax on, a, on, on, on Tenzin holding it down. And then <laughs> Prof. Ezra just broke the record with over 12 hours. And um, then on Wednesday, uh, on Wednesday, it's Professor Ezra with the Education in the 21st Century. 9 p.m. as well, East African time. Thursday, we've got two shows. One in uh, um, the Swahili sessions, uh, 5 p.m. East African time with our host, Paul Justin. If you want to learn Swahili, you want to interact in Swahili, please join that conversation. And I will really love to, to invite a lot of people to join that conversation, to ask questions in Swahili or ask questions in English. And then... Uh, our host, Paul, can translate and even answer you guys. So it's time to learn Swahili every Wednesday, 5, every Thursday, 5 p.m. Uh, East African time. And uh, later on, around 9 p.m., it's Dr. Ebenezer. The opportunities in Africa, different conversations there around Africa and the potential of Africa, man. Not the opportunities, but the potential of Africa. And then on Friday, it's myself. Uh, we're going to have different things. Uh, you know, normally on a Friday, it's the, the relaxed uh, weekly recap, where we recap of everything, announcements, all those things. But uh, as I've asked the family that come up with the name, I, I'd love to give you a chance to, 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 to give us a name. We're going to have a show. We're going to have different shows on Fridays. It will be the, the, the weekly recap, obviously, announcement, things that happen in the week. And then we'll have like our night, our a stream a full stream where we can discuss anything and everything and then yeah that's it uh, for us for tonight and thank you for all the participants uh, thank you for the people of uh, of the uh, the people who live in the horn of africa or people who who are, who are coming from that region it was really 
nice and really great to to uh, learn so much about the region and so many insights that different people share tonight and i'm sure there's a lot of questions that we need to cover we will have another part two session uh regarding this topic and the horn of africa and i'm sure we'll most of the things will be covered then and solutions for us because we don't just believe in talking about the issues only but also highlighting solutions as society that we need or that we think we can implement to make sure that our society moves forward. So with that being said, uh, for myself and Biggie and the whole team, um, it's going to be shalom. But before I do my shalom, uh, I would love to invite everyone in prayer. I'll close in prayer. Thank you, Abba Father, for this night. Thank you for us as brothers and sisters that we've met, we've discussed different issues. We thank you for this time that you've given us, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name, as we go in different places, protect us until we meet again. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I mean, I just want to add Marie Antoinette. Uh, Kaku. Mm -hmm. Kuku, Dr. Zadeka, and also Mika. Uh, we pray for all of you. Uh, may Xavier bless you, protect you, and um, be who you are in health and everything that you lack. And I also pass the blessing to the rest of my African brothers and sisters. May peace be upon you. May Xavier bless you all. Amen. I mean, Amen. there we go. It's Amen. a wrap. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. <laughs> and, and just to answer kind soul, we were not hurt today, and no one can hack us. <laughs> so, no. but uh, it's a wrap for tonight. Let's meet again tomorrow, 9 p.m. Diaspora Talk. Thank you. Appreciate it, uh, Pastor Ezra. Great show. Everybody that came in also again, and thank you very much for making it a great show. Thank you. Oh, Biggie, oh. by the way, before we say shalom, I know we, we can start something here. Uh, our friend, uh, Sam, uh -huh. uh, we, we need to see uh, that interaction. Uh, Sam, uh, we love you, and we need to see more of you. <laughs> 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 no, I want Sam. You know, I don't want to push Sam too much because I guess I pushed uh, Red Sea, and I don't know where he's at. So I didn't see Red Sea uh, for a while. So that was a guy that I was hunting, but uh, I don't want to do that to Sam. Sam said he's gonna show up, and hopefully he's gonna show up on my show. I always yeah. the door is open. The door is open, my brother. Hmm. Sam, you've got the invite is open. The big invite, the door is open. Big is inviting you tomorrow. Join absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you, uh, Sam. Uh, uh, kind of saw. I really. Uh, he said uh, tonight we got hacked. Yep, and um, it's good that we are aware about these things and also. Family, uh, those that are in comment, if you see things that are coming in that is it's not appropriate, feel free to block it. You know, you know, like Tinder and all that that we're going through today. So uh, everybody's uh, collaboration still we won. We're going to protect this channel uh, to the best of our ability. And I thank you for those of you that really had control on it. And uh, really, we're going to have to protect it. It is our channel, our responsibility. Together, we can make things happen. And I'll figure out a way also on the back end on how things can get done like that. Definitely. But it's a wrap. Let's uh, chat again later on uh, Biggie. You Thank got you, it. Family. Good night. Good evening. And good morning. <laughs> yep. Good morning stays on you now. <laughs> 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 Good morning. <laughs> like that. All right. All right. Shalom. Take care. Bye. Shalom.